morning, I'm Winnie Stackelberg, and I serve as the Executive Vice President of External Affairs at the Center for American Progress. And while I hope you've enjoyed your breakfast, it's time to start making your way to your seats. The 2019 Ideas Conference will kick off in just a couple of minutes. I want to remind everyone that on the back of your conference badges, you can find today's Wi-Fi information along with information and instructions for joining the conversation on social media. In just a few moments, we'll hear from leaders standing at the forefront of today's progressive movement. This is a movement that has swept the nation, electing more women to Congress than ever before. This is a movement that is resisting and this is a movement that is making progress. This is a movement that will reclaim our country on behalf of the values we hold so dear. And so whether you're fighting to reform our criminal justice system, to make high quality education affordable and accessible for all Americans, or to lift more families out of poverty, our fight is a constant one. And today, during each panel, each keynote, and each conversation, we'll be reminded that the resistance is fueled by persistence, and that we'll need bold ideas to make lives better for all Americans. That is what we do here at the Center for American Progress. I am so proud of CAP and each and every one of you. So get ready, get ready to take the energy you'll absorb today back to your own communities, your communities across this nation. Please consider this your five minute warning. Thanks everyone and get ready for an amazing day. Thank you all so very much.
Good morning, everyone. Please welcome Neera Tandon, President and CEO of the Center for American Progress. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Good morning. OK, good. You're awake. And welcome to the 2019 Cap Ideas Conference. Over the course of today, we will hear from an incredible lineup of elected officials policy experts, and grassroots activists. Together, they are shaping a positive agenda that serves as an alternative to everything the current administration represents, an agenda that stands up for women's rights, reforms our immigration system, strengthens our democracy, and forges a truly inclusive economy. At this moment, we're witnessing a series of rich and far-reaching policy debates about the best solutions for moving our country forward. And CAP is thrilled to help drive that conversation through our work every day and through today's event. I believe that these kinds of debates are more important than ever. Now I know that some believe that thoughtful policies founded upon research and rationality or, or are no longer in fashion and no longer matter. After all, our current president often appears untethered to the facts or any sense of rationality at all. But the truth is that the public is still moved by ideas and solutions which focus on addressing the real challenges they face. And recent events should remind us that ideas, bold yet realistic, far-reaching and impactful, still have the power the powerful to pr potential to improve people's lives. We saw the enduring strength of these ideas during last November's midterm elections, and we're continuing to see the strength, their strength during the ongoing presidential primaries. In fact, the new democratically controlled House has also passed, has already passed one landmark bill after another. And I'm proud to say that CAP has done its fair share to lay the groundwork for this progress. Let me give you just one example of our impact. In 2014, many years ago now, CAP released a major report that outlined a plan to end discrimination against LGBTQ people across all of our society, from the housing market to the workplace to our country's public facilities. Then, in the five years that followed, we worked along alongside a host of other progressive organizations and leaders to rally support for this proposal. And just last week, the House passed the Equality Act, a historic piece of civil rights legislation that championed the same ideas we put forward in 2014. <laughs> Over the last few years, we've also put the issue of political reform at the forefront of the progressive policy discussion. And congressional candidates throughout the nation embraced these ideas last November. Their energy and these proposals help fuel the For the People Act, a series of sweeping reforms that will renew our democracy by strengthening voting rights and curbing the corrupting influence of special interests in our government. And H.R. 1, the For the People Act, was the first bill passed this year. Later in our program, I'll have the privilege of sitting down with a great leader and the person most responsible for realize, realizing these achievements in the House, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Now, we all know that America is currently in the midst of presidential primaries that feature a remarkably deep and diverse selection of candidates, all 23 or 2,300 of them. <laughs> Fantastic ideas are at the heart of the debate that's unfolding about the future of our country, and CAP's policy solution solutions are also playing a role in setting the terms of this debate. That includes our proposals to enact universal health care, to ensure affordable, high quality childcare is there for all, to pursue a foreign policy that is focused on protecting democratic values here and around the world, and to significantly raise the salaries of America's teachers. But while the 2020 race will continue to dominate the headlines, it is vital for us all to remember that there's incredibly important work to be done all across the progressive movement right now. 
That's why this conference will showcase inspirational voices who are leading the charge on every front, from mayor's offices to governor's offices to the halls of Congress. Today, with nearly 18 months remaining until November 2020, it can feel like we're in the eye of the storm. But this is not the moment to be overwhelmed or immobilized. Not when our government is on the brink of a constitutional crisis between Congress and the president because he's obstructing all oversight. Not when the president continues to attack our democratic institutions while embracing foreign dictators. Not when the American people suffer because of Trump's tariffs, which are attacks on all of us, while officials in his, in his administration feed at the public trough. And not when hundreds of migrant children remain separated from their parents. The stakes have never been higher in my lifetime. We have an immense responsibility to rally Americans in every corner of this country to help defend and advance the fundamental values of our democracy. And we can accomplish that mission with ideas, ideas that can and will produce meaningful change in people's lives, lasting change, change for the better, and change for all. Fighting for change and for progress from one generation to the next has been the defining story of our country since our founding. And I believe that in, even in this darkest of moments, we are planting the seeds of ideas that can forge a stronger, fairer, and far better America for generations to come. That is what today is about, and that is what the work of the Center for American Progress is about every single day. Thank you. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing our next speaker, a true trailblazer and fighter who has always understood the stakes, Stacey Abrams. Stacey? Oh, let's do it around. Woo! Stacey is the first woman and the first African American. <laughs> Stacey is the first woman and the first African-American woman to, be, to ever serve as leader of the Georgia General Assembly. And she, is a, she became the first black woman in American history to win a major party's nomination for governor. Uh, she really needs no introduction, but she's now the founder of Fair Fight, an organization devoted to mobilizing voters across Georgia and to ensure that every single vote is counted, and I am so thrilled she is kicking off our conference today. Thank you. <laughs> I got my cue early. <laughs> Thank you. I don't drink coffee, so I got my cue a little early, sorry. Thank you, Neera. Thank you, Center for American Progress, for not only having me on the board, but allowing me to open this conversation about how we amplify voices and our values in this coming election. I want to remind us that it's not just 2020, it's 2019. In Virginia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Kentucky, we're having elections and we're setting, we're setting the stage for the future. And while it is said at every single election with the same degree of intensity, these may be the most important elections of our lifetime, given in part that if we don't get it right soon, we won't be here anymore. <laughs> But I want to talk about who we are. In 2018, as Nira said, I ran for governor of Georgia. I do recognize I am not the governor of Georgia. But I do like to point out something that is true for me and for many in our state. And that is, we won. We won by transforming an electorate we were told was static. We won by changing the dynamic and changing the rules of engagement. We won by increasing the Latino vote by 3x in the state of Georgia. We tripled Asian Pacific Islander votes. We increased youth participation rates by 139%. We increased African American participation rates by 40%. And to put that in context, in 2014, 1.1 million voters voted Democratic for the governor of Georgia. In 2018, 1.2 million black people voted for me. We
we accomplish this transformation of the electorate by centering communities of color, by talking about marginalized identities, by reaching out to the disadvantaged in all 159 counties because we have one county per person. We did this by pulling people together and saying that we had a shared vision for the state, but that we understood the obstacles that stood in the way of many. But we also transformed the electorate by doing something we were told could not happen, that if we talked about the demography of Georgia, we were going to ignore and eliminate and exclude the normative white voter who has been the soul in the center of the, of the state of Georgia. But in 2018, I accomplished something no one has accomplished since Bill Clinton. I increased the white share of Democratic votes in the state of Georgia. We were able to do this because we amplified the voices of Georgians who all want the same thing. They want access to health care in a state that's one of the 14 that has refused to expand Medicaid. We increased participation by talking about economic security in a state that still has a state minimum wage of $5.15 an hour. We had conversations with domestic workers and farmers, with tech CEOs, and with startup business owners. We did the work of building a coalition of the marginalized and their allies, yoking them together with union members and traditional Democratic voters, and it worked. Unfortunately, we also have one of the best voter suppression systems in the country operating in the state of Georgia. And that's the challenge, that if we want to amplify our voices and live our values, we have to tackle the single most threatening aspect of our election system, the worst part of what's happening in our democracy, and that is voter suppression. Now, there are those who would discount it. In fact, the Wall Street Journal took time a couple of weeks to go to write an entire editorial page rebuke of my argument. They suggested that because black and brown people figured out that they could vote, that there could be no voter suppression. They ignored the fact that you can energize communities by seeing them and engaging them and still have those who seek to stop them from casting their ballots. For anyone who would argue that voter suppression is not real, let me tell you about Georgia, where I faced an opponent who happened to be the Secretary of State and decided he should be the scorekeeper, the referee, and the contestant in our race. Over the past eight years as Secretary of State, he led the purge of 1.5 million voters. He led the closure of 214 precincts. He was responsible for 53,000 people in 2018 alone being put on what's called the exact match system, meaning that if a typographical error was made in your application to vote, you could be prevented from voting. And while ostensibly you should be able to walk up to your precinct and hand them a, a copy of your application and your ID and say, please let me vote, it was up to volunteers vol vol to decide if you overcame the suppression. We live in a state where African Americans face the longest wait times in the nation, some up to four hours. And if you're making $5.15 an hour and you have to wait four hours to vote, you cannot afford to give up a half day's pay in order to cast a ballot. We had under-resourced communities where we had one or two machines and we in fact had one precinct, one of the heaviest precincts, where they forgot the power cords for the machines. We lived in a state where the Secretary of State was the only one out of 50 Secretaries of State who refused the support of Homeland Security to stop the hacking of our very vulnerable 2000 era machines. And that's just the beginning of what he did. Over time, he not only mismanaged his office, he encouraged localities to underperform. We had absentee ballots that were rejected at an, an alarming rate including one county that refused to send out 4,700 ballots. We faced the issues of registration access, ballot access, and ballot counting, which I like to refer to as Florida. <laughs> because it was hard to get on the rolls, to stay on the rolls, to get to your polling place, to receive a ballot, and to have that ballot counted, on November 16th, 2018, I refused to concede the election. Now, let's be clear. I acknowledge the legal transfer of power to Brian Kemp. I acknowledge that he is the legal governor of Georgia. But what I refused to condone was the process that silenced the voices of thousands of Georgians. Voices we know were silenced because we received 50,000 phone calls to our election protection system in a 10-day period. And if 50,000 people knew to call, 50,000 more didn't know, and 50,000 more thought it was their fault. Because that's the insidious nature of voter suppression. 
It convinces us that it's user error. It convinces us that it's a one person problem. But it is a system of oppression that is weakening our democracy and corroding our trust in our country. But if you think it's just Georgia, look around. We know that in Wisconsin and in Michigan, voter suppression had a great deal to do with the outcome of 2016. But this is not a faraway problem and this is not a yesterday's problem. Because in the last six weeks, Tennessee passed a law that would limit the access of third party registration organizations to the registration of people to vote. This is in direct response to 90,000 African Americans being registered by the Tennessee Black Voter Project. And this new law would make it a criminal act to register voters under certain conditions. Knowing that the research says that if you want low income or communities of color to register to vote, it requires third party action. In the state of Texas, they have criminalized making mistakes in casting your ballot. In the state of Georgia, we had people who went to vote, husband and wife, finding out that the husband was registered in one county and the wife somehow miraculously was sent to a different county. When, we followed the, when those women followed the directions given by the registrars, they went across county lines and had their voter, votes nullified. Well, in the state of Texas, making a mistake in 2020 can lead to criminal penalties. And often these criminal penalties will be directly related to language barriers. These acts of voter suppression are not new. They are not unusual. They have been a part of the systemic attempt to push against the demographic changes in our country for the last 20 years. And in case we think I'm being a little hyperbolic, there's a new bill pending in Texas where they're going to eliminate the ability of vans to pick up the infirm, the elderly, or communities of color and take them to the polls. You'll be limited to bringing three people, and that you have to get permission to do. That is a pending bill in the state of Texas. In Arizona, they're attempting to roll back access to their mail-in ballot system because too many people used it the last time. When too many people can use democracy, that is a problem. And let us not forget Florida, where 1.4 million ex-offenders returning citizens were granted relief from one of the most draconian restrictions in our nation's history, only to now face puni I was about to say something deeply inappropriate. <laughs> they now face a poll tax that will strip them not only of their rights, but their dignity. Voter suppression is real and is an external threat to amplifying our new voices. But the call is also coming from inside the house. For those of us who are in this coalition of new and engaged, who are in this pursuit of progress, we have to recognize that the internal threat we face is a fear of who we are. The notion of identity politics has been peddled for the last 10 years, and it's been used as a dog whistle to say that we shouldn't pay too much attention to the new voices coming into progress. I would argue that identity politics is exactly who we are, and it's exactly how we won. By centering communities in Georgia, we not only increased voter participation, we brought new folks to the process. And we have, please. <laughs> but when we refuse to engage in the conversation of identity politics, when we refuse to acknowledge that we see you and we understand you, when we understand the barriers that you face, then what we are met with is a lack of trust. And the very communities we need to show up to engage and to ensure economic security, climate change action, access to abortion rights. When people see that you don't trust them and you can't understand them, they have no reason to engage and no reason to show up. And when I hear Democratic candidates, progressive candidates, American candidates decrying the identities of their voters, I am deeply worried for our democracy. But we also know that our values are lived values. That when our elections occur and when our elected officials do their job, people will engage, solutions will be found. And we know the corollary is true. That if their voices are silenced, if they are not seen and not heard, then the policies that are passed do not reflect their needs. In the state of Georgia alone, where 70% of Georgians say they believe in support of Roe v. Wade and do not want it overturned, we are one of the states leading the nation with these aggressive and deeply unfortunate forced pregnancy bans. Anti-abortion is not the will of the people. Less than 25% 
across the country believe that we should overturn Roe v. Wade, and yet in Kentucky, in Ohio, in Indiana, in Missouri, in Mississippi, in Georgia, in Alabama, we see these bans moving forward, and it is not a reflection of the will of the people. We still grapple with access to health care, and we still question whether or not the climate is changing, because leaders are being elected who not only reject science, but reject the voices of the people they were elected to represent. But I'm here to tell you there's a solution. It is not, however, having everyone in America run for president. <laughs> but that is also not an announcement. <laughs> but my response is this. We have to demand a fair fight in America, a fair fight for the values that we hold to be true, a fair fight for the voices that are pushing to emerge, a fair fight for our democracy to survive. I stand before a group of people who understand that democracy may be resilient, but it is always vulnerable. Look no further than what happened in Egypt. Look no further than what happened in Venezuela. The rise of authoritarian regimes happens when we start to silence the minority and when we take systemic action to limit their ability to reverse the trend. And America is not immune to this. As we watch leader after leader put their signature to laws that limit access, that deny agency, and that undermine the very values we seek to uphold, then we are under threat. But the solution is to fight back. Fair Fight Action was an organization I created on November 17th. I was a little upset on November 16th. <laughs> and on the 17th, we launched a three-prong attack, litigation, legislation, and advocacy. Litigation because we have to fight bad law by asking the courts to force good law. It has worked before and it will work again. By having these ballot initiatives across the country that are forcing good ideas, that's an important step, but we cannot ignore litigation. The litigation that forced Hamilton County in Indiana to open up precincts after they moved the one precinct for majority African American communities to the outskirts of town. Litigation that can force the state of Georgia to look at laws that may be on the books but are being manipulated for the sole purpose of denying the right to vote to Georgians. And it's going to work. Just yesterday, there was a decision made by Amy Totenberg, a judge who is looking at our voting machines. And she understands that we have the most hackable machines possible. And now our governor seeks to spend $150 million to purchase what has been called the worst machines in America the single largest purchase of voting machines in the country. Litigation can work, but we have to fight for it. But we also have to look at legislation. On the congressional level, we have HR1, which has done an extraordinary job of articulating the needs of the people. But in places like Georgia and Alabama, in North Carolina and Texas, we are still fighting for the basic access of legislation. And we know that in Wisconsin and Virginia, I apologize. One second, please. This is not a Marco Rubio moment. <laughs> Sorry. In Wisconsin and Virginia, we know that in, was in Pennsylvania and in Maryland and across the country, we have a fight happening in legislation. Legislation to expand who can vote and legislation to restrict who has access. But that legislation should be met by, song, by strong action strong action from the people demanding that their voting rights be restored and that the Voting Rights Act be restored. In the state of Georgia, we were proud to be a part of Marsha Fudge's panel that looks at how we restore the Voting Rights Act across the country and how we expand access to every single voter. But we also have to bring new voices to the table. The internal threat that we face can only be fought back by making sure we have candidates running for office who see everyone who understand all of us and who are willing to do the work standing at podiums, but also standing in the streets and pushing people to vote. When we have candidates who look like our communities, we have communities that see themselves and engage. It is a virtuous cycle. The more we engage, the more the people engage, and the more the people engage, the more progress is made. And that should be the goal of every person. That should be the goal of our democracy. We are not an authoritarian regime just yet. We have time in 2019 and 2020 to roll back the stakes and to change our trajectory. 
We have the ability to call out our values and to stand in those values firm and true. We have the ability to demand better from those who are elected, and if they will not behave, we have the ability to throw them out of office and bring in new voices. That is our opportunity. In 2018, progress won. We didn't win every Senate seat and we didn't win every House seat, but we changed the narrative. We achieved the highest turnout rates in midterm elections in a century. And more importantly, we brought new voices to the table that should remain. I was with Ayanna Presley yesterday and she said, power should be closest to the people who are in pain. And I will say this, it can be done because it has been done. And whether we have 23, 24, 25, or 150 candidates for president, we should demand from every single person an adherence to the values that we hold to be true. They must speak about voter suppression every day until every person who is legally entitled to vote has the right to vote in the United States of America. But they must also be willing to look every voter in the eye and say, I see you. I understand your challenges, I see the barriers you face, and I am willing to tackle those obstacles, not through vague language and not through opprobrium, but through action, through policy, and through determination. Because when we see our voters and we give them their voices, we will see the change we need in America, and we will survive for another generation. Thank you so much. Please welcome to the stage Representative Sharice Davids, Representative Katie Porter, and Moderator Daniela Gibbs Leger, EVP for Communications and Strategy at CAP. Good morning, everyone. So, we just heard a wonderful, powerful speech from Stacey Abrams, a true trailblazer in the progressive movement. And now I have the immense pleasure of sitting down with two fantastic women who are breaking ground in their own rights. Representative Sharice Davids is, along with Representative Deb Holland, the first Native American woman ever elected to Congress. And she's also uh, the first openly gay person to represent the state of Kansas on Capitol Hill. <laughs> Representative Katie Porter is the first Democrat to ever be elected from California's 45th district. <laughs> She also knows how to go viral, which we'll get to in a moment. <laughs> Together, they embody a new wave of women leadership sweeping our country, and we are delighted that they could join us today. So I would like to start by asking both of you, as women who've recently been elected to Congress, can you describe your impressions of Washington, D.C.? Uh, what has surprised you most about Congress? Um, well, I don't know. I, I'm really curious to hear Katie's answer. Uh, so. I would say a couple of the biggest surprises were, um, and maybe this is because, I know we're gonna talk a little bit later about um, what these who these institutions are built for, but um, my lived experience um, led me to not expect so many sitting members of Congress to reach out to me after I won my election and ask me what kind of help I needed and what kind of support I needed. Um, it was, it was a really interesting, heartwarming experience to have uh, just a whole bunch of people instead of saying, well, why do you think you should run for Congress, to welcome to the team, we're glad you're here, what can we do to help? Um, and then it is, well, I, I shouldn't say this with Katie sitting next to me, it's a lot flying back and forth every week. <laughs> but I, I rescind that comment. <laughs> I'm not even a third of the way there when Sharice is home. Um, it is a lot of flying back and forth, though. Um, so I think for me, one of the things that's been a surprise is when, when I came to Congress, and I had testified before and had the uh, privilege of knowing some sitting members, I knew there weren't a lot of women. I knew there weren't a lot of people of color. I don't think I'd focused as much on the class issues um, as I do now. So we sometimes see things in the media about you know, members of Congress are millionaires and therefore they must somehow have done something inappropriate. But the reality that I don't think I realized is a lot of people are able to run for this office and endure 
serving in this office because they have means. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that that came home to me very early on. So when we had our orientation, we were actually in the same room with the benefits person together. I don't know if you remember this. It was your birthday. Or no, it was, yeah, it was sorry, November. Okay, yeah. So we were sitting there next to each other and she was doing her benefits thing and I'm doing mine. And they said, well, um, your health insurance starts February 3rd or February 1st. And I said, well, but my job starts January 3rd. What, what should I do? And they said, well, you can go on your spouse's insurance. And I said, well, I'm a single parent. I don't have a spouse. And they said, well, just buy Cobra. As if I could just buy Cobra. Um, and so we ended up figuring something out, but I literally was confronted. I was like, doesn't everybody complain about this? And they said, no, mostly people complain about how their pension's gonna be less. And I thought, wow. Like, what a different perspective. We had the same thing when I was trying to rent an office. Um, we were not, you're not able to use government funds to put down a security deposit. And in Orange County, California, a lot of the landlords weren't super excited to have me as a tenant. <laughs> and it was very difficult to find That's rental surprising. property. And um, they, one of the excuses they kept using was, there's no deposit. The government doesn't give you a deposit. So I called the house admin office and they said, a phrase that I have come to dread which is just use your personal funds. I don't know what these personal funds are and what account they're in, but if somebody could direct me there, I would be so grateful. Um, so I think that aspect of it, um, particularly for those of us who are, are single earners, who have families to support, I mean, I am the first single mother to be elected um, in her own right to Congress. And so, I, you know, I've been surprised by how things like my everyday experiences are somehow fascinating mm -hmm. simply because I'm a member of Congress. So we literally have reporters from wonderful institutions like the New York Times who want to see me grocery shop. How else would the groceries get there? <laughs> like, I mean, I just don't understand. I, mean, I appreciate the media coverage, but how else do they get there? And then I started thinking. I guess for some people, somebody else does this, right? And so that class element, which I think, I think, well, you know, part of the diversity of the new freshman group is around class, both how we grew up and how we were living when we made the decision to run for Congress. Can I, can yeah, I add sure. a little bit? So actually, um, I'm glad you brought that up. I remember the meeting, there were a couple of different times when this specific issue came up and I think I actually like glossed over it when I said my lived experience has not been one where I show up and people actually are happy that I'm there. Um, it is when the government shutdown was going on and uh, there was an awful lot of discussion around whether or not the members of Congress would take their paycheck or not. And um, it actually was a moot point for most of the time because there was we weren't going to get paid for uh, a month after we started anyway. So, um, but one of the things that ended up happening very quickly that, and I don't know, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this, was that very quickly you could tell which members were very eager to give up something that they weren't depending on already anyway. Mm -hmm. And then the members who were coming off of nearly two years of not having a paycheck, of not having health insurance, of not having real financial stability because um, a lot of us cleared out our entire savings. I didn't have nearly no retirement to speak of. And it was not an option for a lot of the new members who were coming in to say, I'm not gonna take a paycheck. And to me, it just highlighted how many new members are here that are actually more reflective of, a, of the, the vast majority of, majority of people in this country because um, I can guarantee you, I don't have any friends or family members who could just say, I'm not gonna take my paycheck this month or every two weeks, you know? Mm -hmm. we, don't, we get paid monthly, which is also an interesting adjustment. <laughs> this is a perfect segue to my next question, half of which you answered is, um, you know, it's clear that Congress is not an institution that is set up to support women, women with families, uh, people without means, I was gonna say, so do you think that's true? Obviously it is. Uh, what can we do to change that? I mean, I think one part of this is, there's sort of two parts of this. One part is how do we support candidates um, as they run 
who are people who are, have different life situations, single moms, single parents, um, I said that, um, people with moderate means, people who maybe don't have access to savings or health insurance or things along the way. And you know, one of the hot fundraising tips I got since I got to Congress was I was saying, I'm really, I said to a member, I'm, I'm really stressed about raising money my first quarter. I, I don't wanna let anybody down. I know my seat's gonna be tough. I wanna keep working hard. And they said, well, make sure you get your spouse to double max to you. And I just, I was speechless. I was like, this is what you've got for me? Like, I, I don't have a spouse, but when I shop for one, I'll look for a double maxer. Like, well, I, I just... At the grocery store. I, I just was like, this is not helpful. But like, this person was truly trying to... I mean, there was not a comment met with ill will. It was actually meant with reflecting their... I'll just say his real life experience. Um, and so I think there's that side of it on the campaign side. And then I think on the, on the existing side, I mean, there are a lot of parts of this institution that are just not very functional. And I hear a lot of people kind of afraid to acknowledge some of that because they think it will uh, weaken the American public's belief in Congress's efficacy. But to be clear, if you've seen any polling over the last like 80 years, the American people have some concerns about Congress's efficacy. And I think we will regain their trust by admitting what some of the barriers are to our doing our jobs effectively. So for me, an incredibly long meeting is 30 minutes. And I am someone who was a professor before I came to Congress, and I worked in increments of like nine hours. <laughs> and so, you know, if you read every single management book, how to have creative time, how to focus on relationship building, how to be strategic, how to think long range, and then you did everything differently, you would have the United States Congress. <laughs> so I, I sometimes feel like Congress's slogan is solving the problems of yesterday, tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> and so I think acknowledging that and then saying, how do we fix it? What do we do? We have the select committee to modernize Congress. Um, I'm eager to see what they produce. I, I think it's going to be a, a list of recommendations. I think the question is going to be, what kind of will can those of us who are trying to shape the institution, not just let it shape us, what kind of political will can we as freshmen push back on to actually move this Congress forward? It's not just about it's not really about making our lives better. It's about making, serving this country better so that we continue to attract a new group of candidates and it's about being better leaders. Um, it's just hard to lead in, in 10 minute increments, it just is. That's why I have 12 minute meetings. There you go. <laughs> it makes all the difference. It does. Um, so I, I agree with all of the things that you said. Um, I think that there are, there are a lot of very interesting ways that things, and you got, presumably most of the people in this room know that uh, DC doesn't, doesn't function the way that uh, maybe the districts that we live in function, um, the, way, the way business is done here is, is just, it's very, very interesting trying to figure out which levers you have to pull and that sort of thing. Um, but even more basic than that, if you take a step back, um, the number of times just this week that I've been stopped going into the house, um, whether it's on the floor, whether it's walking into the building, is, uh, I mean, it's May. These guys all have pictures of us, and there are not that many members who look like me. Yeah. <laughs> so, Shouldn't it be that hard? Um, there's like a couple that I get confused with occasionally. But... Um, just, it's like simple things like that. Sometimes it's like death by a million paper cuts. Um, and this is actually reflective of what it's like sometimes to be uh, a person who is, I'm used to being the only person like me in the room. I'm used to being the only woman in the room sometimes, the only, um, the only native woman, the only LGBTQ person, the o I'm used to a bunch of, the only person who's a first generation college student or knows what it's like to go to community college. Um, but there is something about the level of um, blindness to that, 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 that I see, not just on the floor, but in the halls. And, um, you know, I'll let you in on a secret. I, that now everyone is gonna know, I wear a book bag 
because it's better for my back. But I wear a book bag, and I know no one's going to, no, no one recognizes me because I'm wearing a book bag, and people think I'm uh, an intern or something. Well, maybe not an intern, but, you know. And, and I think that uh, in a lot of ways, just the fact that we have a new Congress with ref really, truly reflective experiences is going to make a huge, huge difference because we're asking questions that have never been asked before about health insurance and about just the process. How are these decisions being made? Who decided that this was the direction the entire caucus was gonna go when I just found out about it coming to a meeting? It sounds like there were all kinds of conversations. We are inserting ourselves into, a, into an institution that has evolved and we're, we are part of that evolution. Great, and I just want to note for folks that Representative Porter has to leave a little bit early um, to go and grill. So last question, uh, Secretary Mnuchin. So we're looking forward to watching that video. <laughs> so I want to talk about the current attack that's happening across the country uh, when it comes to women's rights, uh, specifically around our healthcare access. Uh, you can look at what's happening in Alabama and Georgia, Ohio, Missouri, and other states uh, where these draconian bills are being passed. Um, you know, can you discuss the threats that women are facing and what people can do to push back on them? Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing is wrong on so many levels and frankly is an attack on women's lived lives. That's what this is about. Um, and so I want to offer a thought about Alabama in particular. Under this new law, the penalty, the criminal penalty for raping somebody is lower than the criminal penalty for having an abortion. So that tells you something about how these lawmakers think about women's bodies and the control of women's bodies when they think that being violated sexually is a lesser offense compared to making the choice not to bring a new life into this country when you are not capable, able, ready, or willing to do so. And I think that just reflects that there is a deep, deep lack of understanding of what it means to be a mother, the responsibility that comes with being a mother, the weight that you carry financially, socially, economically, all of it. Um, the, the way that it affects your professional life and the way that it affects your family dynamic, your marriage, all of these things are incredibly important and incredibly personal decisions. And our government has no business deciding my most intimate moments, period. And I think we have to also be able to say abortion is a woman's choice. And we have to say that word, abortion. And I'm all for women's health care. I'm a, I a Planned Parenthood patient myself. Um, they tried to get me to tour the clinic, and I was like, dude, I was just there. Like, I was a patient. I, I just was there. Um, but I think we have to be able to say the word abortion, and we have to talk about that is what is being put at risk here. And so we see, you know, at the same time, I had a great conversation with one of you who might be in the audience today about the failure of health insurance to cover infertility treatments and to treat the decision to have a child as a completely optional one, and not to fund and treat infertility as a medical problem, which it is, treat that as a healthcare issue, but then when it comes to abortion, it's all about deciding what's right for us, not allowing us to make our own healthcare choices. Um. Well, one, I was, I, com I completely agree. I'm going to, I'm going to go to most things and just sit after you and agree with everything that you just said. My witnesses um, are never that cooperative. Oh, <laughs> well. Uh, so the one, I want to acknowledge that Kansas Supreme Court recently, I recently put out a decision protecting a woman's right. Um, as a constitutional right to get an abortion. And I think there are a lot of people who would not have thought that Kansas would be the place that would be doing that. They also didn't think that Kansas would be the place that would elect me. So um, we're on a really good trajectory and it highlights for me the importance of, um, one, making sure that we are electing pro-choice women. 
And the more pro-choice women that we elect to our state legislatures, it, county commissions, school boards, all up and down the entire ballot, we have got to have more pro-choice women in office because a, a room full of men making decisions about what's going to happen with my body, with my autonomy over my body is absolutely not okay. And none of us should think that that's okay. All of the men in this room should be working to make sure that women, pro-choice women, are getting elected. <laughs> the men who are helping to decide whether or not it is a good idea, helping a woman decide whether she should run for office because is she gonna have enough support or not? All the men in this room should be stepping up to make sure that that's that that is happening and supporting organizations that are helping women get elected because at this point it is going to take a very concerted effort for a very long time one kansas supreme court decision is not going to make sure that every single woman in this country is uh, has access to the reproductive uh, care that they need that they have choice that they're able to get an abortion and that's not okay that we're still trying to fight off these attacks on Roe v. Wade, that is, it is, blows my, it blows my mind that in 2019, this is where we're at right now. But every person in this room, I hope, was a huge part of the midterms and will be a huge part of us winning the Senate in, in 2020 and winning the presidency in 2020 and making sure that we maintain the majority in the House because that is really what stands between all the women in this room having autonomy on, over our bodies or not. All of you stand between us and oppression. Please take that seriously. Spread the word. I know we're doing it, but that, that is what I have to say about that. Can I just add one thing? That was incredible, and I think the, the comment about oppression is important, and it's important to acknowledge that that is what this feels like to people who are confronting this. I just wanted to add on the topic of um, electing women, the pro probably women. besides pro-choice, thank you, um, I want to add that the single most common question I get besides, are your kids okay? Um, the, the, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, they seem to be doing great. Like, they're not having to deal every okay? day with Kevin McCarthy. Like, they seem happy. Um, so, uh, the single most common question I get asked, and you, I guess you might too, is what's it like to serve with so many women? And I've started answering that in a different way. At first, I said, oh, it's amazing. It's great. I love blah and blah and blah. And these are my friends. And this is amazing. And we're going to change the world. And I've started pushing back a little bit and I say, what's it like to serve with so many women? I, I don't know. I can get back to you when I do. Because 20% of the house is women. That is not so many women. It's like there's this artificial number and we just tricked a little bit beyond it. And now we've achieved this massive swell. 20% is not equal proportional representation. It is deep structural underrepresentation. And that's where we are despite the incredible progress that we made with the support of so many Americans, most importantly our voters around the country. So that work is ongoing and that struggle is ongoing and you're absolutely right. So Representative Porter, um, obviously I want to talk about what happened yesterday. Uh, you have been an outspoken voice on the issue of tax fairness and the recent clip of you grilling a Wall Street CEO, like I said, went viral. Um, and then yesterday, you were interviewing our illustrious Secretary of Housing. Um, and he confused a, a question or a term that any other Secretary of Housing would know what it meant for a, a cookie, a delicious cookie, but a cookie. <laughs> So my first question is, how do you maintain your composure when he said that? Uh, but more importantly, you know, what does his test testimony signify about this administration, how they approach uh, issues around housing, around inequality, around people who you know, aren't at the top of the economic ladder? No, I mean, with regard to the questioning, part of it is, having been a professor for years and years, I had some great students, and I had some not as great students. Um, and your goal in the classroom is always, how do I get this student 
to a stronger knowledge base? How do I empower this student to know more and then to be able to do more with that knowledge? So the part of the conversation that I found the most flummoxing, particularly having had a night to sleep on it, I mean, the, the fact that he doesn't know what an REO is and that he doesn't understand the way that FHA is contributing, among other things, to blight in this country, all of that's frustrating. But what I, on reflection, I'm most bothered by is that when I began to ask these questions, rather than saying, I don't know the answer and I will need to research it and I will get back to you immediately, he said, explain. That was it. Explain, as if my job is to empower him with knowledge. And I said to him, and he offered, he said, I'd, he'd be happy to have me come to HUD and teach his people about the job that they're doing. And I thought, yeah, in 2020, yeah. there I'll be. <laughs> but it was, it was the fact that, and I watched later some of his exchanges with some of my other colleagues, with Representative Joyce Beatty, with Representative Ayanna Presley. There was a clear pattern of disrespecting the questions being asked by these amazing, by, by Representative Sylvia Garcia, who called him out for referring to human beings as illegals. And his response to all of those questions was flippant. Um, and it was, it was marked, and it was noticeable, and I think it's a problem. So, and the economic issue, look, the questioning of Jamie Dimon, the discussion with Mark Begore, the CEO of Equifax, about identity theft, the discussion with Tim Sloan about whether consumers can trust Wells Fargo, all of these conversations are designed to help push forward what the everyday economic concerns are of everyday Americans. When I asked that question of the head of the CFPB about um, APR and calculating an interest rate on a payday loan. The amazing thing that came out of that was that people began to call our office and ask, what's the answer? What is it? My husband and I don't agree. I got this number, they got this number. Can you really charge 521% for a loan in California? Yes. And I didn't know that was the law. There should be a law against this. What are we gonna do about this issue with regard to payday loans? We saw the exact same thing with Mr. Diamond. What is the right wage? Mr. Diamond in his 50 page shareholder letter has an awful lot to say about the incredible burdens that he is under to deal with the excessive capital at Chase Bank. <laughs> and I read that shareholder letter and there was a theme he has too much capital, it's such a problem. There's so much capital, what's he gonna do? What should he do with all this capital? They got a lot of capital. I have some ideas, which is under a capitalist system, the point of raising the capital is to reinvest it into growing our economy and growing our business. So that means dividends to shareholders, it means higher wages for employees, and it means reinvesting in the business to grow jobs for tomorrow. It does not mean you write a shareholder letter complaining about how hard it is to have too much money in your institution. So I am a proud capitalist, and I think we need people who understand that for capitalism to function, you have to have things like reinvestment of profit into the workforce, reinvestment of um, the benefits into um, you know, the investors and the shareholders. And so this whole idea that the entire economy is all about the stock market makes me crazy. 50% of Americans have no retirement savings at all. They are not glued to the stock market ticker Right? And so this, the economy is more than the stock market, so much more. The economy is about what housing costs. The economy is about the ability for people to save for retirement and have enough left over to do that. The economy is about the costs of the things that matter most to families, like college. And that's where I want to see this administration focusing. And the stock market is a barometer, it's an indicator, it's, it's important. But to say that that equals the economy, I think is, a, is to really mistake where the average American is, even in an area like Orange County, where we're not the poorest community in the country. And even there, I hear all the time and see all the time, people struggling to figure out how they're gonna do right by their children and by their grandchildren. Thank you. There's a porter, I know you have to go. I'm gonna go, I have a question or two for Mr. Mnuchin, but I apologize. <laughs> um, we got very late notice of this hearing and the schedule has moved, but thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you. Go get them. <laughs> hey. 
So, Representative Davids, I want to ask you also about the economy, um, especially for communities of color and for you know the Native community to go to tag along to her point about the stock market and how that's not an indicator of how things are going. Uh, so, what are your ideas on how you build an economy that is actually inclusive of everyone? Well, I sit on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and one of the reasons that I fought so hard to get onto the, so first of all, I didn't know that it was gonna be so hard to get onto transportation and infrastructure. Uh, I think 85 new members started um, this past Congress and like 90 of them wanted to be on TNI. I didn't know that. Um, but the reason that I wanted to be uh, on this committee is because, first of all, most people don't think about transportation or infrastructure generally. In, our, in the day to day, people are not thinking about that until something has gone horribly wrong. Uh, we are on the cusp of a lot of things going horribly wrong, and in some places it's already happened, like in Flint. So one of the things that I think that we can really focus on to make sure that we have a thriving economy and society is to build equity into every piece of policy that we're pushing forward when it comes to how we're building out our country's infrastructure. Because we're, we're operating on and using the infrastructure that our grandparents built, and it did not, the people who were building that infrastructure did not have equity in mind or equality, true equality in mind when they were building that infrastructure. Um, that means that we have the opportunity to infuse those concepts and ideas as we're contemplating how we build out a strong infrastructure for our grandchildren. Because we know that it's our grandchildren who are gonna be either the beneficiaries or the ones who are trying to fix what we do right now. And I think that if we want to encourage people to start their own businesses, if we want to encourage people to, um, or make sure that people have access to opportunities for different kinds of jobs, um, if we wanna make sure that people have access to healthcare, to education, to places of worship and even recreation, because I think that we, we often treat recreation as something that only wealthy communities should have. And if we do all of that in transportation, then our economy will thrive because every single person in this country would have access to opportunity. And we have not been, um, at least Congress and in general the federal government has not been focused on that. And it has negatively disproportionately affected communities of color, commun native communities, I mean, that's, there's a whole set of issues around what the federal government has done to prevent native communities from thriving. But we can, we can and will in this, in this uh, Congress start to infuse more concepts of equity than I think we've ever seen in Congress before because of the, the diverse experiences that, that the new members bring to the table. It's so exciting to watch. Um, I wanna talk about the Equality Act. Yay, Equality Act. <laughs> So you've been a longtime champion of the LGBT community um, and equality uh, and an inspiration to so many in the movement. So can you just talk us through your, your personal experience of what it was like to see that passed on the House? I think it's gonna take years to process what this whole experience has been like. Um, and that, that experience is probably no exception, but I can tell you that um, when Deb, so, so Deb Howland, the other Native American woman serving, um, when we got sworn in, I couldn't sit with her because she had a whole bunch of kids with her. And um, so I, I remember we got sworn in, I turned around, I looked at, at Deb and I immediately like walked over and we hugged and uh, cried like babies. Uh, Deb cries a lot, I am, I cry <laughs> enough, but um, you know, it's healthy, but uh, Almost the same thing happened when we voted on the Equality Act. I turned to Deb and I asked her um, if she was gonna see her daughter who is part of the um, uh, LGBTQ community. And I said, will you tell her how proud I am that we got to vote on this 
um, today. And of course, Deb starts crying. And then um, we were hugging all over. Everybody on the floor, on the Democratic side of the floor, was hugging, and we were excited. <laughs> and um, and then we hugged, and and it was one of those. I started crying, and it felt like I like I could feel it in my soul that we had just done something that will probably save the lives of some young LGBTQ people um, because of the, of the suicide rate that we have in this country. Um, and we just had a body of Congress, the House of Representatives just sent the message that it is important to protect LGBTQ people from discrimination. It is not okay for you to be discriminated against because of being part of this community when you try to go get an apartment. How crazy is it, how wild is it, that I can be the third district representative of the state of Kansas to the United States House of Representatives, and if I went to get an apartment, I could be turned away for no other reason but that I'm part of the LGBTQ community. That is outrageous. And it is something that we have the chance to fix. Now, if the Senate would do their jobs and vote on things. Mm. Say that <laughs> again, yes. <laughs> if the Senate would do their job and vote on things, we would have more people in this country living without fear of discrimination. And imagine what that would do for a thriving economy what that would do for a thriving society. Those are the things that I think so many of us came into office to work on. And a lot of times it's in, it's, it's in the, I know I already said this, but the questions that we're asking of people have not been asked before. And I think Congresswoman Porter is, a, is an amazing example of that. And we've seen over and over and over again that these, uh, the cabinet secretaries, the people who think that if, if you don't have money in your bank account, you can go out and get a loan, that that is literally, that is going to stop. And it is going to happen really, really soon. These folks are all on notice that in 2020, we're coming for the seats, we're coming for the White House, and if we can do it in Kansas, it can be done anywhere. Yes. <laughs> So I, I want to end and, uh, and ask about something I call imposter syndrome, which is something that I feel a lot of women, especially women of color, myself included, feel that we know we're talented and we're able to sit at the table that we're sitting at, but we start doubting ourselves and we let those voices uh, get into our head. Um, you are a member of the LGBTQ community. You're a native woman. You're a former MMA fighter. And if we had more time, we would talk about that for like 20 minutes. Uh, so I, I want to know, did you have that syndrome? Did you doubt yourself? And what advice would you have to any you know, young girl or senior citizen in between who's thinking about running for office? For sure, I'm, yes. Um, I would say that it's hard not to question your ability, your voice, your experience when the default is so different than the experience that you have. And um, I only know what it's like to be me. I only know what it's like to be a woman or part of the LGBTQ community or native. Um, and so I think I was probably just out of uh, law school the first time that I realized how much of an impact it was having, it was having on uh, my participation in meetings. Um, and when I, when I got to law school, I knew that in my head, I knew I was there because I was native. And that is a, now thinking back, what, what that, just that thought carrying through with me might have done, I don't know, I made it through law school, don't worry. 
Um, but, but what did that do to my interactions? What did that do to how I participated or didn't? And then when I got to the law firm, I remember sitting down at a meeting. Um, this is one of those flashpoint moments where you're, you have an epiphany. And I was so nervous because I knew I had to ask something in this meeting. I don't remember the question, but, um, and I realized, wait a minute, nobody here knows how nervous I am. You guys don't know if I'm nervous or not. I'm a little bit nervous. But I remember thinking, these guys don't know if I'm nervous. So I like took up a bunch of space and I like spread my things out all over the table. And I was like, I'm just going to, this guy over here seems like he's got all kinds of confidence. I'm just going to do that. So I like took up a bunch of space. And then, um, and then I started thinking, you know what? I'm going to ask a question every time. And when I got to the Department of Transportation as a White House fellow, and I was sitting in the room with the Secretary of Transportation, and people were going around the room asking questions. First of all, I went and sat at the table. Um, I'm not sure if I was supposed to, but I was like, I'll sit at the table, and then if they tell me to leave, then I'll, you know, to sit back away from the table, then I will. But other than that, I'm, I'm just gonna sit here because I think I have something valuable to bring. And I asked a question every single time, and I remember the number of times that I asked a question that nobody else in the room was even thinking about demonstrated to me that a, per, a Native American, a woman, an LGBTQ person, uh, a person with an associate's degree from a community college, someone who's a first-generation college student, someone who came from a family with no money, it's, it's not that I think I'm worthy of being in the room, it's that I absolutely have to be in the room. I have to be asking the questions. Because my experience and what I'm bringing to the table is valid and it's real. We have a different experience. Your experience is valid and real and you're bringing stuff to the table that if you weren't there asking questions, no one would. And that's not how we get to a, a real democratic process. It's not how we get to a system that engages and, and thinks about every single community. It's only by making sure that, that all of these decision makers have a very reflective group around the table. Now our job is to make sure we bring more people. Mm -hmm. Representative Davids, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone. We, we didn't plan this. No, this was not planned. We'll now have a brief break. Our program will resume shortly.
Everyone, please take your seats and welcome Representative Hakeem Jeffries. Morning, everyone. Morning. It's an honor and a privilege to be here at the CAP Ideas Conference and certainly thankful to uh, Nira Tandem for her tremendous leadership. She's a voice for the voiceless and a defender of the disenfranchised and an all-around force of nature on behalf of the progressive causes that we all hold dear. I want to thank each and every one of you for your tremendous uh, involvement over the last few years in particular and helping to turn things around or begin the process, of course, of turning things around here in this great country. It's my understanding that uh, after I speak, Adam Schiff is next, and so I'm really just his warm-up act. Uh, and so I've decided that I'm going to follow what has often been referred to as the B rule of public speaking. The B rule of public speaking, be brief, be bright, and be gone. Uh, but I do want to share a few thoughts about the House Democratic agenda. agenda. Uh, so privileged and honored to have the opportunity to serve as the chair uh, of the House Democratic Caucus, position that I assume responsibility for at the beginning of this Congress. Uh, my first act as chair of the House Democratic Caucus, in fact, uh, it was my responsibility to place the name of Nancy Pelosi in nomination as our next speaker. And isn't she doing a great job? She's doing a great job. Donald Trump has no idea what to do with her. I mean, he can't even come up with a nickname. He just calls her Nancy. Uh, she's doing a tremendous job, and we're so proud of her. My first responsibility was to place her name in nomination. And so a few days before that, I was uh, in my living room thinking through my remarks, and my youngest son, Joshua, who's 14, came up to me and said, Dad, what are you doing? I said, well... You know, as the incoming chair of the House Democratic Caucus, it's my responsibility to nominate Nancy Pelosi. She's going to be our next speaker on January 3rd. Do you have any advice for your father? And without missing a beat, he said, Dad, don't blow the moment. <laughs> and I just really want to say that we recognize as House Democrats that this is a critical moment. And we have a responsibility both to deliver on the kitchen table, pocketbook issues that we talk to the American people about in advance of the midterm election with a focus on lowering health care costs and increasing pay for everyday Americans. But we also recognize, of course, and Adam will talk about this, that we have a responsibility as a separate and co-equal branch of government. We don't work for Donald Trump. We work for the American people. And we have a constitutional responsibility to serve as a check and balance on an out-of-control executive rent. We will never bend the knee to Donald J. Trump, the first of his name. This is a democracy, and we recognize the moment that we are in. The beautiful thing about the House Democratic Caucus is that we are the most diverse legislative caucus in the history of the republic. Democrat, Republican, 20th century, 21st century, House, Senate, the most diverse legislative caucus in the history of the republic. More women serving in the House than ever before, over 100. More African Americans, more Latinos, more Native Americans, more members of the LGBT community. So we authentically represent the American people. And we, as a House Democratic Caucus, recognize that diversity is a strength. It is not a weakness. Uh, we are a nation of immigrants, some voluntary, others involuntary. But as Dr. King once observed, we may have come over on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. We are a gorgeous mosaic of people from across the world. We are white, we are black, we are Latino, we are Asian, we are Native American. We are Christian, we are Jewish, we are Muslim, we are Hindu, we are gay, we are straight, we are young, we are older, we are women, we are men, we are citizens, we are dreamers. 
Out of many, we are one. That's what makes America a great country. And no matter what xenophobic behavior is coming out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, we're not going to let anyone take that away from us. Not now, not ever. And so we're proceeding with an understanding of our values and our diversity and our unity, which makes us strong. Understanding that these are very challenging times. We want to move the country forward. They want to turn back the clock. We want to bring people together. They are trying to tear us apart. We're fighting for the people. They're fighting for the privileged few. We're trying to stand up for the least, the lost, and the left behind. They're standing up for the wealthy, the well-off, and the well-connected. We believe in the public interest. They're all about the special interest. We want to protect Social Security and Medicare. They're trying to take it away. We believe in unions and the right to collectively bargain. They want to destroy our freedom to negotiate. The stakes are incredibly high. But we're proceeding anchored in our values, understanding that we believe in a country that provides for the poor, works for working families, makes sense for the middle class and stands up for senior citizens. We believe in a country with liberty and justice for all, equal protection under the law, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And so we clearly have laid out our for the people agenda. And in connection with that, we have made clear to the American people that we are going to fight and work hard to lower health care costs, protect people with pre-existing conditions, deal with the high cost of life-saving prescription drugs, strengthen the Affordable Care Act, increase pay for everyday Americans, enact the real infrastructure plan, defend the dreamers, clean up corruption, address the climate crisis, deal with the gun violence epidemic, and end the era of voter suppression once and for all. That is the House Democratic for the People agenda. And we've already begun to do a lot in that regard. In the first 100 or so days, we passed H.R. 8, Comprehensive Universal Criminal Background Check legislation. We passed the Paycheck Fairness Act because we believe in equal pay for equal work. We passed the Equality Act because we believe that love does not discriminate based on gender identity and neither, or sexual orientation, and neither should the law. And of course, we've worked to lower health care costs and protect people with pre-existing conditions in the face of an onslaught from this administration. What is clear is that this administration wants to take away health care from tens of millions of Americans. We're not going to let that happen. This administration wants to impose an age tax on people between 50 and 64 because that is what will happen if you take away the Affordable Care Act and that will dramatically increase premiums, co-pays, and deductibles for those Americans. We're not going to let that happen. This administration wants to take away protections for pre-existing conditions. That would impact more than 100 million Americans, perhaps one of the most significant accomplishments of the Affordable Care Act. And we're going to stand to defend that. In many ways, we believe that is what the 2018 midterm election was about. We recognize as House Democrats that there are millions of Americans who are battling cancer. That's a pre-existing condition. There are millions of Americans struggling through heart disease. That's a pre-existing condition. Millions of Americans, including children in neighborhoods like those I represent and others all across the country, particularly in low-income communities, dealing with asthma in part because of the impact of environmental racism, that's a pre-existing condition. Over 10 million Americans struggling through an opioid addiction, that's a pre-existing condition, and more than 100 million Americans have either diabetes or pre-diabetes. That 
is a pre-existing condition. The stakes are incredibly high and we, we understand the moment that we're in. We also have made clear to the American people that in addition to strengthening the Affordable Care Act, we want to drive down the high cost of life-saving prescription drugs because there is no reason in the world that here in America we should pay more for life-saving medication than any other nation in the world. It is a direct result of the special interest power of Big Pharma in this town and we are determined to break it. And we believe that in order to do that, there are several things that we are working on, and I'll only outline a small few. We believe that Medicare should have the ability to use its bulk price purchasing power to negotiate lower drug prices for the American people. And we are determined to make that happen. Medicaid has the ability the Veterans Administration has the ability. There is no reason in the world while Medicare shouldn't have that ability, it would result in lower drug prices for tens of millions of Americans. We will not rest until that occurs. We also want to break up the racket that exists in so many ways between the brand name companies and their desire to maintain monopolistic type control over the pricing that the American people pay. The FDA has said that brand name drugs and generic drugs have the same therapeutic medicinal impact. The same impact. But over time, generic drugs cost 80 to 85 percent less than their brand name counterparts. And that's the reason why we want to break up the monopolistic racket in a few different ways. One of them is outlawing the practice that's known as pay for delay. That when the brand name drug is about to come off patent, there have been pharmaceutical companies who will actually pay the generic companies not to put the generic drugs on the market in order to delay the onset of competition that will result in lower drug prices for the American people. We in the House Judiciary Committee and the Energy and Commerce Committee have already passed legislation that would make the pay for delay practice illegal under law, and we are determined to get it through the House and outlaw this outrageous practice. We also are dealing with something called citizen petition abuse. Under the current law, the FDA uh, has a mechanism by which when a brand name drug is getting ready to come off patent, anybody in America can file a petition with the FDA to express concerns about the soon coming availability of the generic drugs. But what we've learned is that while citizens may or may not be filing petitions, and that is their right, the pharmaceutical companies have actually been stepping in and filing petitions to stop the availability of the generic drugs. Baseless sham petitions that are ultimately dismissed by the FDA but delay the availability of generic drugs by months or sometimes years, costing the American consumer hundreds of millions of dollars in lost savings. We are determined to break the back of Big Pharma and dramatically lower the high cost of life-saving prescription drugs. And so we're proceeding essentially along three principles, that we believe that America, the wealthiest country in the history of the world, that no one should ever have to choose between putting food on the table 
paying the rent, or getting access to the life-saving medication that they need in order to live their life with the dignity and grace that they deserve. We believe that in America, the wealthiest country in the history of the world, that health care is not simply a privilege, it is a right. And we want to bring that right into reality for every single American. And we believe that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, every single American should have access to high quality, life saving, affordable health care. And that is a position that is shared by every single one of the 239 Democrats in the House of Representatives. And we're going to make sure that that principle becomes the law of the land. And in closing, let me simply say, some have said, well, that's an ambitious agenda. You're dealing with an obstinate Senate, the Grim Reaper, self-described, over on the other side of the Capitol, and a president who, of course, is out of control. How do you expect that we can bring all this into fruition? And some of those ideas we hope to enact during the 116th Congress, others we will lay a foundation and be able to move them forward. But ultimately, I'm confident that we will succeed. Let me quote the words of our, our great president, Barack Obama. <laughs> Some of y'all were getting nervous on me. Our great president, Barack Obama, when he said, yes, we can, Democrats can be successful because we've always gotten things done on behalf of the American people. Democrats are the party that gave this country Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, a living wage, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, the Lilly Ledbetter Act, the Fair Sentencing Act, the Affordable Care Act. Democrats and Barack Obama saved our economy. Democrats save the automobile industry, and together, Democrats will save our democracy. God bless you. God bless CAP. God bless the United States of America. Thank you, Congressman Jeffries. Uh, there's such an expansive agenda, and I want to thank you for your remarks on health care. I, I really wanted to just ask a question or two about some other elements um, uh, on issues that have been very divisive on the past. A, a good example is uh, the House passed legislation that promotes re-entering the Par Paris Accords. Climate was an issue that previously has created divisions, um, have seen uh, uh, regional differences, in uh, the caucus, or actually in the country. Um, could you talk a little bit about what it was like to pass uh, that bill, and how United the Caucus was doing in that, and how do you see that issue as a, a front line on the issue of climate? Well, thank you for the question, and that was uh, an important first step and a foundation for what I expect that we will continue to do to address the climate crisis uh, that we face here in the country and, of course, throughout the world. In our first legislative act uh, on day one, uh, we enacted a rules package that included as a feature the uh, constitution of a select committee on the climate crisis that the speaker indicated uh, would be a focus on how we move forward, led by Kathy Castor from Florida. Uh, the first piece of legislation in that regard was legislation that would uh, express a resolution of disapproval in connection with uh, the effort to exit the Paris Climate Accord, and we're going to pursue legislative and appropriations remedies designed to prohibit the use of funds uh, to do anything other than make sure we keep our commitments in that yeah. regard, and uh, explore the other legislative options uh, that we can do in a bold fashion uh, to confront the enormity of the problem. Under the legislative mandate, the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis has to report back uh, to the Energy and Commerce Committee on its recommendations for legislative proposals uh, by early next year. Their work could come in sooner than that, uh, but we want to hear from a wide variety of stakeholders 
uh, on the thoughts that people have as to how we can proceed boldly and aggressively. Hey, and, and one last question I wanted to ask on another issue that uh, people have seen as divisive in the past but had a pretty significant uh, victory in the House was background checks and, and gun safety legislation. And uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how much of that, why that was a priority and how you see that playing out in the future? Yeah, this is an incredibly important distinction between the last time Democrats uh, were in the majority and I wasn't uh, in the Congress at the time and the current moment. Uh, there, there was a decision in the prior majority not to address the issue of gun violence in a comprehensive way in part because many of the members of that new Democratic majority came from rural states and districts where uh, those members felt at least they could not address this issue. Things have changed significantly and every uh, member of the House Democratic Caucus is of the view that we have to do something meaningful mm -hmm. to deal with the gun violence epidemic. We started with universal criminal background check legislation. Uh, it did receive some Republican support on the floor of the House of Representatives. We know that the overwhelming majority of gun owners and NRA members support the notion that no individual, particularly one where there's reason to believe, could do harm to others, should be able to access a gun without background checks. And so we're going to continue to aggressively push that and other issues forward and keep the pressure on the Senate so that Mitch McConnell either does his job and allows these bills to come to a vote or we vote them all out of office and we have a new Senate majority in 2020. That's a great ending. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Here it goes. Either way. Either way. Here, let me take the mic. Thank you. Uh, let's give another round of applause for Representative Hakeem Jeffries. Now we all understand that one of the fundamental roles of Congress is to serve as a check on the potential abuses of power performed by the executive branch. Uh, I don't know why we have potential in there, but we have potential. Uh, at the same time, it has become abundantly clear that the presidency of Donald Trump represents an existential thre threat to our democratic norms and to the value of transparency in our government. So, ever, given everything that is at stake and in this particular moment, we are thrilled to have the discussion coming up about, uh, I assume, many topics, the, the mindings, our democracy, uh, oversight in general, and I am thrilled to have the pleasure of turning things over to Ari Melber, an attorney, journalist, and host of MSNBC's The Beat with Ari Melber, who will moderate our next conversation with the chair of the Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff. Good morning. Great to be here, and great to be here with Congressman Schiff. You have a mic uh, right there. We're going to have a whole rip-roaring conversation, and then we're going to take questions from all of you. And we're not on TV, so we don't have to be as formal. Uh, your committee is making news. Congressman Schiff, as, as everyone knows, is a chair of the Intelligence Committee, a former federal prosecutor, among other things. And you have a breakthrough with the Justice Department uh, this morning. What is it? Well, we had uh, been a series of negotiations over getting the underlying materials, the documents uh, behind the Mueller report, and in many respects, those materials are more important than the mere redactions in the report uh, because they go to what witnesses said, uh, the details of the investigative uh, tactics that were used, uh, and the particular interest that we have is in the counterintelligence and foreign intelligence information because the investigation, after all, began not as a criminal probe, but as a counterintelligence probe into whether uh, people around uh, Trump and then Trump himself were acting as witting or unwitting agents of a foreign power. Uh, so as part of the negotiations, we said, look, here are 12 sets of documents that we want. They're identified in the report. None of these are even arguably privileged in any way. All of these involve counterintelligence or foreign intelligence information. Start by providing these or we're going to go to an enforcement action. Uh, this was a test of whether they were acting in good faith or without 
any faith. And uh, close to midnight last night, they uh, finally agreed, okay, we'll provide those documents as the initial set of what we hope will be a rolling production. So that's a positive step. On the 12, you, you haven't publicly identified what they are. We have not. But your description suggests it's, for example, presumably not grand jury material, but could be other underlying evidence that informed uh, the intelligence parts of the probe? Yes. You know, if you look at uh, any number of the uh, incidents that are reflected in the report, there's intelligence behind them that goes into far more detail. Uh, and, you know, just to give you illustrations of the kind of thing without saying whether this is implicated in these documents or not, um, we know that Manafort was giving polling data to someone linked to Russian intelligence. We know very little about that. Is, is that a totally normal thing? Um, in this campaign, the answer would be yes, apparently. Uh, and, you know, discussing uh, election targeting in the Midwest and whatnot, um, a lot of the chapters or really sub-chapters in the report are not fleshed out beyond very summary descriptions and conclusions. Uh, and so what we're predominantly interested in is where did the counterintelligence investigation lead? We don't even know at this point whether it's still ongoing or whether it was closed at some point. We do know from the Mueller report that periodically FBI agents who were embedded in the Mueller team would send findings back to headquarters. Um, we, and those fall into two categories, those that directly related to Russia and the election. And then there was a, another category of things that didn't relate to the election. Uh, but nonetheless could compromise our country. And you know, to give you the paramount example of a counterintelligence issue, which is discussed in the report, and that was the effort by Donald Trump to build Moscow Trump Tower during the campaign, the lies about it, and the fact that they sought to get the Kremlin's help to make it happen. Uh, and here, and this is uh, you know, kind of astonishing, a year later when it's disclosed that even though the president had been saying no dealings with Russia, no business deals, blah, 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 that in fact he'd been seeking to make the most lucrative deal of his life um, and seeking Kremlin help when that became public a year later, that they'd made outreach to Dmitry Peskov, this guy close to, to Putin at the Kremlin. Peskov issued a statement saying, we never followed up on those inquiries. That was a lie. And so here you had the Kremlin covering up for lies of the president of the United States. So you can imagine what counterintelligence and compromise concerns that kind of behavior raises. And so in a room like this, uh, people are familiar with what's been happening in Washington, what the storylines are. Most of the storylines in the relationship between a relatively new Democratic House of Representatives and the White House are of stonewalling, are of alleged obstruction, are of people blowing through even typical oversight hearings, defying subpoenas, refusing to show up and testify. Why today are you making news with your committee getting what looks to be progress from the Justice Department? Is there something you're doing right? Are your underlying statutes stronger? Or are you at risk of being played by Attorney General Barr? What is your view? We don't know whether the, this kind of last minute decision to comply is tactical uh, or whether this is indicative of the uh, thinking at the Justice Department that ultimately they're going to lose on these issues. Uh, it may be a result, for example, it may be influenced by the Mazur court opinion uh, earlier in the week, which not only rejected a lot of the same arguments that the Justice Department uh, and Trump administration have been making, uh, that there's no legislative purpose or that it has to be somehow set out specifically what bill you're going to introduce as a result of your oversight. Of course, that's a completely false reading of our oversight authorities. Uh, so it may be a result of the major court saying basically the legal equivalent of get out of my court. Um, that, that argument makes no sense whatsoever. So let me push you on that. If that's door number one, that the DOJ is adjusting in response to an adverse court ruling, why only then giving ground to the Intelligence Committee and not also the Judiciary Committee? Well, my hope is that they will give ground in all of these committees. And uh, what we're doing, we've made it clear to the Justice Department, um, doesn't, doesn't have the need for them to comply with the rest of our document requests. This is just the first. It also doesn't mean that an enforcement action against 
Don McGahn should not go forward, it should, uh, or Bill Barr. Uh, the actions the Judiciary Committee uh, is taking are very important. None of those are uh, mitigated by compliance with a different committee on a different issue. We have different statutory authorities. Uh, the National Security Act provides that counterintelligence and foreign intelligence information must be given to our committee upon request. In that respect, the statutes for our committee look a lot like the statute in the Ways and Means Committee regarding the President's tax returns. Now, does the, the recognition that we have a solid legal basis for our request in our committee mean they're suddenly going to comply with Richie Neal's request? Probably not. So uh, tell us a little bit, uh, although some people have worked on the Hill, obviously, in this room and know about it, but, but tell us how it works with your fellow chairs. I mean, we're hearing this morning that you're getting more breakthrough on this, some of the same underlying Mueller evidence than Chairman Nadler. So do you guys compare notes? Are you saying, well, you know, Barr called me back. He didn't call me. You know, he, he said to me that Mueller was snitty, but then to you, he, didn't, he wouldn't even say anything. I mean, how do you guys compare that? Uh, and yes, we're in a town where people sometimes make it too much about personalities, but it does look like you right now are on better terms with uh, the, the Bar Justice Department than the Judiciary Committee. I don't know whether we're on better terms or not, um, but in answer to your question in terms of how the committees are operating, uh, Chairman Nadler, Chairman Cummings, uh, Chair Chairwoman Waters, uh, Chairman Neal, and others, we uh, discuss what we're doing constantly. Um, the chairs meet constantly. We meet with our leadership constantly so that we keep each other abreast of what we're doing, what we're hearing, so that we cannot be played off against each other, so that our legal strategies are harmonized, so that we're making the same arguments in court. Uh, and obviously, uh, for example, the Mazers accounting case is a oversight committee case. Um, but it's very similar to the case that we're making along with financial services for the Deutsche Bank records, which is going to be heard, actually it's being heard right now. Um, and we are uh, obviously making the judge in that, a different judge than in the Mazur case, uh, well aware of what the court has ruled in the Mazur case. We're making the same arguments, we're urging the same accelerated timetable. So we are making sure that we have a harmonized legal strategy uh, as well as a political strategy and having the same lawyer, the, the same office of general counsel handling all this litigation obviously facilitates that. And one of the ways uh, you talk, of course, is through these caucus meetings. There was a, a major one scheduled this morning. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, of course, is going to be here at CAP later. And we understand there's certain aspects of that you're not going to get into. But do you walk out of that meeting this morning feeling that Democrats are closer to impeachment proceedings or not? Uh, you know, obviously I don't want to go into the discussions in caucus, um, but look, I, I think our members are, you know, much like where the American people are on impeachment, and that is there is a variety of opinions about whether now is the time, whether we need to do more oversight work before we get to that point, uh, what the ultimate repercussion would be of going forward with an impeachment, knowing what the result would look like in the Senate, uh, there isn't unanimity about that, but there is unanimity about this, and that is the administration is engaged in a wholesale cover-up. Um, right, and, and we're talking about some of that, but is, is there a world where Speaker Pelosi reconsiders based on the caucus and launches an impeachment probe, or is that really not in the cards, in your view as a chair? I don't, you know, I don't know that I would characterize it as reconsiders. I think her view is we need to do our oversight work and if we get to the point where we've developed the factual record where that makes sense, then we go forward. Uh, we have to keep in mind this is about what's best for the country. Uh, and I think what, what, what she is weighing is knowing where this would end up, do we put the country through a uh, divisive experience of, a, of an impeachment? Um, is that the best thing for the country? Uh, and she is weighing against that the whole set of priorities that Hakeem just talked to you about, uh, or talked to your colleague about. Um, what does that mean in terms of our healthcare agenda? What does that mean in terms of uh, prescription drugs and infrastructure and the other issues that we're working on? So, you know, well, that, that is what we want our speaker to be weighing. And let me ask you one more piece on that, and then, and then we'll move on. I'm curious by a show of hands here, how many people in this room have worked on advocacy or legislation that you didn't think ultimately was likely to happen, likely to pass, like, likely to become law? 
And then there's a few people who don't have their hands up who are just super effective and <laughs> only do winning things. These are, those are the DJ Khaled people in the room. All they do is win. They've never worked on something else. I see you with your hands down, and I don't believe you. And this is, a, as you know, as a prosecutor, what we call a leading question. Uh, but I'm leading for a reason, which is there is a legitimate and substantive argument against proceeding to impeachment, and we've heard that laid out. Then there is this other argument that you didn't directly say, but I think you've gestured towards, and certainly the speaker has said, which is, well, if, if it's not going to have the, the outcome that you would support if you were for impeachment in the Senate, then why do it? And I think the answer would obviously be what we saw in the room, that this town and social change and movements and politics is full of things that start out unlikely, like, say, a reality star real estate developer running for president and being laughed out of the room, and then become likely. So do you give any credence to that argument that the reason not to do it is that you won't win over Senate Republicans, or do you have a different argument to the extent you do against it? Well, look, I, I obviously, I, I don't think the analogy of uh, whether you try to offer a bill because, uh, and you have to be certain that it's going to pass before you do is a particularly good analogy. You might, you might, um, you know, and just you, briefly, when one person with a JD tells another that it's a bad analogy, <laughs> that is a withering <laughs> rejection. But you go know, on. Well, sir. I've used another analogy which people have also taken issue with, and it's also an imperfect analogy, and that is how many of you are former prosecutors uh, who indicted someone in the knowledge that you would be unsuccessful in trying to prove the case to a jury? Uh, probably none of you. Um, and indeed, one of the things that Mueller points out in his report is on the issue of uh, conspiracy, the Justice Department guidelines required him only to move forward and even then not fully move forward if he felt he could prove all of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt uh, before a jury. Um, I do think that, that notwithstanding all of that, that there is a valid argument to be made that if you fail to bring an impeachment, even knowing it would be unsuccessful, but if you fail to bring an impeachment, what does that say about this president's conduct and whether he is fit for office? Um, and so I, I do think that that has to be weighed, though, against the, the other concern, which is, what does an acquittal say? Because then you have a, an adjudication that this conduct is not an impeachable offense. Um, and that is the dilemma that we are stuck between. Um, both are equally unpalatable. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I think that... Um, we do a disservice to each other if we diminish the significance of this debate. Um, and there are good and valid points, and one of the ones that you know, has resonated with me among the pro-impeachment uh, arguments is if they do continue to completely stonewall the Congress, if they obstruct the Congress the way they obstructed the investigation, that really raises the ante. Um, and then maybe we need the most vigorous response to that, even if it ultimately doesn't prevail. I'm not there yet, but, but um, I, I don't want to do, exclude the possibility either if they continue this kind of uh, lawlessness. I believe you drew applause for both sides of the nuanced argument which is very Talmudic. <laughs> well, uh, there's you know, as they say in my line of work, I have friends on both sides of this issue, and I stand firmly with my friends. <laughs> uh, so we've, we've dug into all that, and that's where your committee was making news. There's a lot of other issues that you work on that I also want to get to now. So turning the page, when did you first learn uh, that the president was seriously considering uh, pardoning more than one convicted war criminal, a story that broke in the New York Times recently? Well, probably like, like most folks when it broke in the New York Times. And what was your first reaction? My first reaction is that uh, this is classic Donald Trump thinking, that this would score political points, but at a cost of sending a message that um, disregarding orders, uh, murdering people in violation of the, the laws of conflict, uh, is something that be, can be excused if it's politically advantageous. 
Um, and the damage that would do in terms of our standing in the world, the damage it would do in terms of the ability to maintain discipline among among four, if they believe they can ignore uh, the rules of engagement, uh, ignore uh, the morality that yes is is challenged in, in combat, um, the damage it would do, I think, would be incalculable. It's one thing if you were to decide, as the, the as the president of the United States that someone that had been brought up even on a war crime charge uh, had been, for some uh, reason, after vetting by the Department of Justice and thorough examination, deserving of a reprieve. That is not apparently what's happening here. Uh, what's happening here is a wholesale view of whether we should simply, uh, and for the most transparently political reasons, um, pardon anyone who has been uh, accused of some of the most serious wartime offenses. Do you think it sends a message uh, to enlisted officers and soldiers that as the Trump White House has suggested, or at least his allies have suggested, that this means they will be thought of and quote unquote protected no matter what? Or do you think it sends a message that undercuts U.S. national security? Well, I think it certainly undercuts U.S. national security. I mean, imagine the reaction around the world uh, if the president pardons people who have committed uh, murder in the way that they were charged. Uh, what that would mean to, for example, if offenses were these offenses were committed in Iraq, what that would mean in terms of our relationship with the Iraqi government, the Iraqi people, um, I, I, and, and also what it means, and, and again, this is like the argument against torture, what it means in terms of American service members uh, and, uh, and the military forces of other countries. Uh, so uh, there's no, I think, good way to look at this. Um, and of course, it is not happening in isolation either because it's taking place when the president is pardoning people for other obviously political reasons, such as they're conservative and they wrote a book talking about how great Trump is. Um, or they're a sheriff uh, who was part of the birther conspiracy uh, and, uh, and stuck with Trump. I mean, this is basically our president's message about everything. If you say nice things about me, if you have my back, I will have yours. The law be damned. Uh, and um, it is just part and parcel of the most serious attack on the rule of law and our democracy, certainly in my lifetime. What do you do with the riddle that on the one hand, the pardon power, like other uh, national security powers of the commander in chief, uh, is it's not completely unreviewable, but I think we would agree it's close. It's, a, it's an incredibly powerful unitary option. And yet we have a president who is actually so responsive to the media, to public pressure, to, as you just alluded to, his own general vanity, if you want to call it that. Um, that a, the fact that this leaked in the Times and then sparks a debate over whether it is quote-unquote, I don't mean to oversimplify, but part of the debate has been, is that quote-unquote pro-military or not, may actually be the thing that prevents him from doing it. Um, do you in your role, obviously you have a very serious security role, but do you also and your colleagues think about, okay, how do we use that lever to prevent a thing that might be negative because you're almost certainly not going to prevent or override that pardon once it's issued? Well, the pardon power, like any power in the Constitution, is not absolute. And, uh, and you see this absolutist argument made in many contexts. Uh, you see now the, and I hesitate to call him the Attorney General, he's really more the personal attorney for the President, uh, but you see the argument What made, do you mean by that? You don't think he deserves the title anymore? No. Uh, I, I, think, I think Bill Barr... Bill Barr has all the duplicity of Rudy Giuliani without the good looks uh, and, uh, and a general likability of Rudy Giuliani. Um, I mean, the most dangerous thing I think that, the, that uh, Bill Barr has done is basically say that a president under investigation can make the investigation go away if he thinks it's unfair, which, by the way, means the other 14 investigations farmed out to other offices he can also make go away. Uh, but it also means that if you want to fire the FBI director because he's not doing what you want, he's not going easy on Michael Flynn or some other friend of yours or some other witness who might incriminate you, 
that you have an absolute right to do it. There's nothing absolute about it. The fact that the president has the right to fire an FBI director doesn't mean he has the right to fire one for an improper reason. Uh, any more than an employer who has an at-will employee can fire them because they reject their sexual advances. Uh, that's not how the law works. It's not how the Constitution works. Uh, and in the pardon context, if the court were to interpret the power of the pardon as absolute, it would mean that a president could instruct people, like Arpaio or others, to violate the law on his behalf uh, and say, don't worry, if you get arrested, I will simply pardon you. Um, you know, to, to paraphrase one of our justices, the, su the, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. Uh, and to interpret it in this way would be self-defeating. Uh, it would mean that the president is above the law, uh, that we are no longer a, a system of checks and balances. So there are ways that we can meaningfully constrain abuse of it. Uh, I've introduced a bill which would require that if the president pardons someone, uh, in a case in which he is a witness, target, or subject, or his family is, the entire investigative files will be provided to the Congress. Uh, that may not prevent the issuance of that pardon, but it will deter its abuse. Um, and there are other steps like that that we can take uh, to chill its abuse. Um, but uh, I do think that, like every other power in the Constitution, there are limits to it, uh, and the abuse of it is unlawful, and of course the abuse of it can also, uh, if we have a, a Congress that is beholden and dutiful to the Constitution and not simply the person of the president, can remove that president from office for violating those standards. A couple other topics before we go to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Iran, in your role, including the intelligence you see that we don't, Number one, factually, how grave a security threat is Iran to the United States and its allies, which is sort of what should we know? And then second, the part that often gets collapsed into that, given your view of the threat, what is the right way to contain it right now, uh, and what is your view of the administration's approach? Well, you know, I have to say, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about what does the intelligence show about the Iranian threat. In many respects, I. I think, I, not your question, but I think that question is the wrong question. Um, I think the, the more important I'm question... I'm a television news anchor. I do that all the time. <laughs> I, I think it's like a the, specialty. Uh, I think the, the more important question is, how did we get here? Um, because the steps that have been taken over the last two years that began with a president who refused to keep certifying that Iran was in compliance with the agreement, even though Iran was in compliance with the agreement. But let me uh, push you, because I want to hear that, but I'm asking about the facts precisely because many people in, who sat where you sat have said, oh, gosh, there's a lot here. I mean, what, if you were going to put it on a scale of zero, Canada, to 10, what is your view or what should we know about the actual threat? And then, and then yes, let's hear your view of well, what they're doing. Well, the, the threat from Iran is increased over what it was a month ago, which is increased over what it was a year ago and two years ago. Um, now, I think some of the steps that we are taking and have taken are increasing the risk, not decreasing it. Uh, and, and this, to me, is, is the, the most important point, and that is if you take actions over time uh, that you know the result of which will be to increase the likelihood of hostilities, then why should you be surprised that the intelligence now shows you there's an increased chance of hostilities? You should be surprised if it were otherwise. Do you think there are people in the Trump administration who actually want to make the threat worse to then drive towards a clash that they're pursuing? Uh, I don't know whether it's the case that, you know, this is a deliberate march to war by people who are just eager for a full-on conflict with Iran, or whether this is simply a product of people uh, like Mr. Pompeo and Mr. Bolton and others that think that belligerence is a strategy and a method worth uh, um, a value in and of itself, uh, who don't think about what the end goal is except in a kind of a dreamlike way because it is, I've never gotten an adequate answer to the question, how will our leaving the agreement, how will our forcing Europe to leave the agreement, how will our forcing Iran 
to leave the agreement and go back to enriching, improve our national security. Um, what is a realistic expectation of where this leads other than to conflict or a nuclear armed Iran? I've never gotten a serious answer to that question. And the, res and the reason I think is there is no good answer to that question, except for maybe a uh, philosophical belief that if you act tough and sound tough, that maybe good things will follow. Um, but the, the idea that this maximum pressure campaign, which I would more aptly describe as a maximum belligerence campaign, is somehow going to cause the mullahs to say, okay, you got us. Um, let's completely renegotiate the agreement that we were complying with and you reneged on, uh, and we'll give you everything you want. That is so, I think, pie in the sky that uh, proceeding down that path with no expectation of success means that we're just proceeding down a path where the likelihood of conflict is that much greater. And, and I think that's where we are. The final thing I want to ask you about before we go to questions uh, relates to trying to get ahead of the efforts to use propaganda to sow discord or disrupt our deliberative process in America. Uh, and some of these uh, efforts are more sophisticated than ever, and your committee has been looking at that, which is very interesting. And so one way to do this, I'm just curious, because I wasn't very familiar with this in scanning uh, your hearing schedule. How many people in the room uh, have heard of this term, deep fakes? Pretty good room, and that's still a minority. Uh, and yet part of what you're arguing is that it is precisely learning about this and having some sort of attitude inoculation that may help us. So what are deep fakes? Why are you holding uh, hearings on it? What do you hope to achieve? What should we, and particularly policymakers uh, in the room, know? Uh, you know, before I, I answer that, Ari, if I can just say, make one last point on Iran, and that is the fact that this is, has been the wrong path for us to leave the agreement uh, and take these other steps doesn't mean that there wasn't another way to be tough on Iran. There was, and there is. That would have made much more sense. Iran is a malignant, malevolent actor and a great danger to the region and ultimately to us. But had we stayed in the agreement and focused our enforcement actions on going after their sponsorship of terror, their use of these terror proxies, their uh, development of their missile program, we would have been united with Europe uh, in containing the Iranian threat. Instead, the effect has been we are isolated, not Iran. We are at odds with our allies, not Iran. Uh, and ultimately, none of that makes us safer. Um, you know, if you ask the intelligence agencies whether this was predictable, uh, I think that's a very important question. If you ask them, are we safer today than we were a year ago or two years ago, that is an important question, and maybe a more important question than does the intelligence tell us now we're at a heightened risk of, of conflict? In terms of deep fakes, back in 2016 when we were watching the Russians interfere in real time and they were dumping these stolen documents, the predominant fear I had was that they would start dumping fakes among the real documents. Uh, that they would take a real email between two Clinton people uh, and insert uh, an additional paragraph suggesting they were engaged in illegality. Once that document was released into the uh, social media ecosystem, you could corroborate the fact that these two people were actual real people and they were in touch with each other and uh, much of the substance of the email could be corroborated uh, and it would lend additional credibility to the fraudulent paragraph suggesting illegality. There would be no way to disprove that in the run-up to the election. That was my biggest fear. Um, Going forward into the next election, there's this new technology called deep fake technology that allows you to produce very easily and very inexpensively highly realistic, almost indistinguishable from real, fake video and fake audio, which means that at any time the Russians or anyone else could insert into the social media ecosystem at multiple places at multiple times and with a fairly good anonymization, a video of Joe Biden saying something he never said, uh, or of Beto O'Rourke, or of Donald Trump, uh, and the ability to show the electorate that this is false would be almost impossible. 
You can see a situation in which a completely fraudulent video of Joe Biden is released, and there are good experts on television saying how you can see from this indicia, and when we run the algorithms from that indicia, how this is not how Joe Biden speaks, or he's blinking the wrong percentage of times, or whatever. And on Fox News, they would have their experts saying, this is unquestionably real. Um, and you add to that the, the converse problem, which is real material gets labeled as fake, which our president is already doing. Uh, and we end up in a world where the truth is now uh, so difficult to ascertain that people just fall back on their tribe and their political party, uh, and it doesn't matter whether something is real anymore. And it's hard to imagine something more corrosive to a democracy than an environment in which the truth doesn't matter anymore. It sounds terrible. Does it make you want to just retire to a beach, try something else? No, it doesn't. Uh, but, you know, I will share this anecdote with you, apropos of nothing, uh, except that, you know, you do need a little levity now and then, given what's going on. I was in your hometown uh, last week um, visiting my daughter, and we were walking down the street in the Upper West Side, and I was in blue jeans and a canvas jacket, and I was wearing sunglasses, and I thought pretty unrecognizable. But I was still getting stopped, uh, which was irritating to my daughter. Um, particularly when it got to the point where somebody asked her to hold their beer while we took a picture. Does your uh, daughter know how powerful you are? Probably she, not. She said, what am I, the beer holder now? <laughs> uh, but, you know, after the third time I was stopped, I turned to her and I said, Alexa, I'm kind of shocked that people recognize me uh, looking like this. And without missing a beat, she says, well, you know, Dad, it's the pencil neck. <laughs> Well, your family keeps you grounded, always. Yes, they do. Uh, yes, they do. Thank you to Congressman Schiff. We will take some brief questions. Uh, we have mics, as you all know. Please state your name, your affiliation, and a good rule of thumb is if it ends with a question mark, it's a question. Or uh, right here, right by you. Hi, Congressman, thank you for your service. My name is Diane Wachtel, and I started a group called Lawyers United to support the legal groups working on the rule of law in the country. I heard you say um, that you thought that some of the progress uh, you made this morning might have been due to an adverse uh, court ruling, uh, and the administration changed their stance, and um, I understand that you feel that if the administration defies congressional subpoenas, the stakes may go up. Do you have the sense that they might defy a court ruling, and what would happen then? Well, that's a very good question. And you know, we, we had a debate uh, a week or two ago about whether we were in a constitutional crisis or not. I, I think we were at the precipice of one. We would be in a full-blown crisis if the court ordered the administration to take action to provide documents, make witnesses available, and the administration simply refused. Now, it's one thing to refuse pending appeal if the court stays the ruling. But if the court doesn't stay the ruling, and the refusal is simply um, a violation of court order, much like they are violating the uh, constitutional obligation to provide the Congress, they would now be ignoring yet another branch of government, then I think you are in a full-blown crisis. Because how does that get resolved? Um, so, you know, I, I do think those circumstances would certainly uh, be another grounds for impeachment. Um, but the, at the end of the day, it still leaves us asking, where is Howard Baker? Um, there is no Howard Baker. Now, Justin Amash, I give him credit. Um, he's had more guts than any other GOP member of the House or Senate. Um, <laughs> I, I remember uh, talking with John McCain before the midterms, and uh, I think in one of the last conversations we had, and marveling at why isn't there a single Republican in the House or Senate who feels they have a constituency to be the John McCain of the House? You know, why is that? I would think that'd be a good place for any number of my colleagues to be. And his answer was, well, if it stays that way, they'll soon be calling you chairman. Um, and up until this week, it did stay that way. And, um, and I think it was a courageous thing for, for Justin Amash to do. Whether you agree or you don't agree, um, the fact that he is willing to risk his seat um, 
shows a lot of the courage of that conviction. And that has been in very short supply. Uh, you know, we all have known, I think, intuitively that courage is contagious, but so is cowardice. And I think there's been a real contagion of cowardice. Uh, if the Congress of the United States won't stand up and defend its power of the purse uh, against this bogus claim of an emergency, and, and then what chance is there we will defend any of the other institutions? Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for what Justin Amash has done. I hope others will find their voice because what really has our republic trembling right now is not just the lack of ethics and character of the President of the United States and his anti-democratic inclinations, but the fact that um, one party has made itself a cult of his personality, utterly unwilling to stand up to him. And that really has what, uh, is what has our democracy trembling. Thank you. Uh, why don't we come to the middle here? Hi, I'm Mark Aronchek from Philadelphia. Uh, on the courage theme, can you give us some insights on what happened to Rod Rosenstein, who seemed to be independent and somewhat courageous and suddenly folded? And in that vein, are similar things from your perspective happening in the Southern District or in some of the other places where there supposedly are investigations that are going on? Um. You know, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, during the last session of Congress, uh, the Republicans in Congress sought uh, documents in the Clinton email investigation uh, and documents in the Mueller investigation, and they subpoenaed the Justice Department, uh, and the Justice Department ended up providing over a million documents. Uh, by June of last year, they sent me a letter saying that to date they had provided 880,000 documents. Now that was the same Justice Department led by Rod Rosenstein that has refused all of our requests until last night and also under Rod Rosenstein. Uh, and when they were in the process of turning all these materials over last session, I raised this issue repeatedly and said, you're setting a precedent here uh, that you're going to have to live with if the Congress changes hands. You're not going to be able to tell a Democratic majority that you give a million documents to only a Republican Congress, but as to a Democratic Congress, you're going to claim privacy and privilege and all the rest of this. But that's exactly what they've done. Um, what explains that of a career Justice Department official? And, you know, I think James Comey came probably very close to the accurate critique of Rod Rosenstein. He just wasn't strong enough. Uh, and you know, someone made the observation, uh, and I don't recall who the writer was, that power doesn't corrupt, it reveals. It reveals who you are. Um, and I think for, for Bill Barr, it has revealed who Bill Barr is. I think for Rod Rosenstein, it has revealed who Rod Rosenstein is. And I think Rod simply wanted his job too much uh, and was willing to make too many accommodations to, give, to keep that job. Uh, and, and I think that um, in, in Bill Barr, uh, when he was serving with George Herbert Walker Bush, when he was serving with a president of integrity and character and decency, then it, it uh, kept him tethered. But serving with this unethical president, he has become completely untethered. Um, and, and, and on that, I'm curious, what do you think... When Rod Rosenstein, who was directly involved in the removal of James Comey, then was a fact witness in that part of the obstruction probe, so soon after the Mueller report was finished, was publicly attacking James Comey, uh, who he helped oversee the removal of, did that strike you as inappropriate at a time when the Congress hadn't even fin hasn't finished its review of those issues? What, what I, I guess what I found most inappropriate is that someone who participated in uh, one of the most important vignettes that this, that this council wrote about might constitute the crime of obstruction. In writing the memo that was used as a pretext for the firing of Comey, that he would participate in the whitewashing of the obstruction, that he would participate in Bill Barr's decision to say there was no obstruction here, that he would stand behind Bill Barr at that press conference, that to me was, was the most um, 
uh, offensive uh, and destructive to the rule of law. Do you think the Congress should call or subpoena Mr. Rosenstein to further explain that very controversial memo, which is the origin of the Mueller probe, in a way? Uh, I think he should be brought before both the Judiciary Committee as well as our own committee, and, and we are taking steps along that uh, regard. Well, now I have to ask, what are those steps? Have you, have you, are you <laughs> telling us today that you have requested Rosenstein testify to the House Intelligence Committee? I, I'm not prepared to comment on where we are in terms of specific witnesses, but... I feel like you kind of did, though. Well, <laughs> we, we, our ordinary course of action is we request voluntary compliance of documents and appearance, and that's not forthcoming. We move to subpoena, and... and so my last one, I don't want to turn into a deposition. It's an ideas conference. Would it be reasonable to infer you've already requested a voluntary interview with Mr. Rosenstein? <laughs> This does feel like a deposition. Uh, you know, it would be more than reasonable to infer that I think it's fully appropriate and uh, for him to come and testify before Congress um, and explain what were the circumstances, among other things, what were the circumstances under which you wrote that memo that was used as a pretext for the firing of James Comey? Did you know when you were asked to write that meeting, that memo, that Comey was going to be fired? Did you know when you were asked to write that memo that Comey was going to be uh, fired for a reason different than the one that you set out in the memo? Uh, why is it you felt that didn't require your recusal from the ultimate decision on obstruction of justice? And Did you seek an ethics department uh, opinion? Did you follow that opinion? And doesn't the Mueller report state that Rosenstein knew that Donald Trump was going to fire him and that Russia was the reason he wanted and he removed that but wrote the, the memo anyway? Well, um, let's, let's have... Rosenstein come before the Congress and the American people uh, and articulate exactly what happened, whether he disagrees with Mueller's conclusions, uh, whether he agrees with them, and why it is that he felt that the country could have confidence in his judgment uh, on an issue in which he was a very important witness. All very interesting and forthright answers. I see zeros here. I want to confirm. Does that mean I am? We're out? I'm getting a correct from stage right. Uh, if you're like me, you could listen for even longer uh, to Chairman Schiff explain much of these difficult issues around the world and here in the United States with nuance. We are out of time, and I want to be respectful of the time of the next speakers. Please join me in giving a warm welcome, and thank you to Congressman Schiff for coming to CAP today. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage CAP board member Donald Sussman. Good morning and welcome. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing John Tester, the senior senator from Montana who distinguished himself in being one of only three organic farmers in Congress, one who still actually drives his own tractor, is a former school teacher, and someone who actually won for re-election when Trump won in his state by 20 points. I welcome my friend John Tester. Well, thank you, Don Sussman, for the introduction. It is a pleasure to be with you all uh, here today. <clears throat> As Don pointed out, I am indeed a farmer. Uh, could get in trouble for this, but it's the truth. The only working farmer in the United States Senate. My wife and I, and I literally mean my wife and I, uh, run an 1,800-acre farm in north central Montana outside a town called Big Sandy, population 600. Uh, it is the same land that my grandparents uh, homesteaded a little over a century ago. It's the same land that my folks farmed for 35 years. Uh, both those generations were FDR Democrats, and they were FDR Democrats because they knew that without the policies of FDR, uh, their grandson and son, myself, would have never had the opportunity to take that farm over. Uh, my wife and I have been uh, married for some, uh, be 42 years this year, actually. Uh, and we've been, we've been on the farm for, uh, for uh, 41 of those, um, and uh, we've raised some pretty good, uh, pretty good commodities. I'd rather call it food, but uh, in this particular case, commodities are a little better. Things like peas and wheat and oil seeds and 
and even children. Uh, <laughs> but with our, our kids and grandkids uh, quickly becoming scattered across the United States, uh, it is just the two of us, uh, no hired man. My wife is a hell of a woman. Uh, she can do everything I can do, and she is doing that right now as I'm in Washington, D.C. on the farm. Uh, it is planting season. Uh, we're just wrapping that up. We've been racing to get the seeds in the ground uh, between the wet weather and the service in the United States Senate. And during planting season, uh, we think a lot about the phrase, you reap what you sow. It is a phrase that Democrats looking to connect with rural America would be smart to heed. Uh, we hear a lot of pundits uh, talk about rural America and what folks in towns like Big Sandy, Montana expect from their elected leaders. I am no pundit, but I am a product of rural America. And while my flat top haircut or my odd number of fingers on my, I guess it's an even number, on my left hand, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that um, uh, I, I live by the values of, of rural America, but make no mistake about it, those values sell in both rural America and urban America. And it is why I believe that Montana has re-elected me in 2018 after Trump won a presidential election in 2016. So what should Democrats be sowing uh, in rural America? Uh, my parents always said, you've got two ears and one mouth, act accordingly. And so I think that politicians are great at coming in and telling people what they should be believing. But the truth is, in rural America, I think you ought to start out by listening. And if you're able to meet the people where they are and listen, that's a good start. Uh, and I think folks in rural America think the Democratic Party has stopped listening to them. And in fact, I can tell you that there are political consultants, maybe some in this room, that have already pulled rural America off the electoral map. I think that is a huge mistake. And because of those things, <laughs> because of those things, I think rural voters believe that, that all politicians, all politicians aren't fighting for their families or their way of life, and they're not listening to them. But the truth is, is rural America's values uh, are things like accessible health care and good paying jobs and affordable education. Those are, those are our values. And, and quite frankly, uh, they are progressive values. And they are exactly the values that we all need to fight for. And they are exactly the values that this administration has attacked time and time again. Take health care. Uh, number one issue in the 2018 campaign as far as concerns in rural voters' minds across Montana. Uh, this administration's Singular focus has been on dismantling the ACA, uh, dismantling rural hospitals, rolling back Medicaid expansion, which has impacted 90,000 Montanans, which might not seem like a lot, but it's nearly 10% of the folks that live in Montana. And I would just say this. I talked about my grandfather patenting the land in 2015. 50 years after that, in 1965, we were able to build a hospital in my little hometown of Big Sandy, Montana. Now, for the first time in 50 years, 50 years since it was built, that hospital may well be looking at potential closure because of the policies that have gone on in Washington, D.C. and this administration. There is opportunities out there, folks, for Democrats, for progressives, if you want to talk about health care in rural America. Education, I would just say this. I don't need to tell you guys, nothing has done more to make this country the leader of the world than public education. It is, <clears throat> it is the great equalizer. It is the thing that gives everybody a shot at the American dream. Yet this administration has done everything within their power to try to privatize public education, voucherize it, send it off and charterize it, do whatever you need to do. But the fact of the matter is, instead of working to build public education and make education what it needs to be, this administration's tearing it apart. There's opportunity in education in rural America, if you've got the right message. College affordability. Look, my grandmother and grandfather, and I'll put it on my grandmother, uh, they had four kids. Three of them were girls, one of them was a boy. All three of those girls in the 1930s went to college and got a college degree, in the 1930s. Okay, they did it 
partially because they thought it was really important and they could do it. They could afford to get them off to school. They knew how important college education was. I went to school and the folks pretty much paid for my education. They had the ability to do that. In the 1960s and 70s, they made enough money on the farm they could send my two older brothers and myself to school. When my kids went to school in the late 90s and early 2000s, we could afford about half of it. My grandkid, my granddaughter in another four years is going to be in college and I dare say my kids are going to have a hard time paying much of that. We need to make college education more affordable. If we're going to have our next generation of well-trained workers, of entrepreneurs that are going to drive this economy forward, we need to have education that's affordable. It is critically important. The other thing, and you don't hear a lot of Democrats talk about this, but I think it's important in rural America is the debt. We're pushing $22 trillion uh, of debt. Uh, fiscal responsibility is important, and we will be the first generation to inherit from our parents and borrow from our kids. That is not something that's good. Uh, and we can deal with the debt. And it doesn't take, you don't need to be a nuclear physicist to do it. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, and this has no impact on working families or small businesses. A couple of months ago, I was in McAllen, Texas. Got a chance to look at the uh, border wall on the southern border. A border wall that's going to spend 24 to 32 million dollars a mile. A border wall that, quite frankly, in my opinion, and I would debate anybody on this, is going to create more problems it's going to solve. A border wall that uh, is going to provide um, security uh, to no one. Uh, and something that we could do with technology for literally pennies on the dollar. So let's start there if you want to start addressing some debt issues. Let's start talking about that tax bill that we passed a while back that added $1.5 trillion to the national debt and has caused us to have a structural imbalance in our budget today of $1 trillion a year. That's the kind of stuff we should be doing. That is smart politics. By the way, and it's smart politics for rural America. Another lesson that my parents taught me is your handshake means something and that your word is your bond. I don't say this is an overstatement. I say this is an absolute fact. Trump's handshake is worth nothing. He's quick to make a promise. He's even quicker to break it. 25 years ago, the American bankers saw him for what he was and quit doing business with him. And over the last two and a quarter years, we have seen, uh, we've seen our trading partners and our allies say, no more. We want no more to do with this dude. And pretty soon, I think the American people will see that too. They're starting to see the impacts of this reckless trade war that we're in. They're starting to see the impacts of ripping away health care from rural communities. And his attempt to get tough on China has only tightened the screws on folks like me in family farm agriculture. And it is no secret that our folks in production ag are hurting. Commodity prices are down, folks are filing for bankruptcy at an alarming rate, and those who are live, making a living off the land are seeing our market access disappear, and the Republicans' promises of better trade deals ringing hollow. Let me give you an example. I don't remember what I did last week, but I will tell you in May of 1978, I went over to my neighbor's house, that's when we took over the farm, and I said, I've got a little bit of wheat to sell, Willard. It's at 350 a bushel. Do you think I should sell it? Willard said, you know, it's been banging around that for a while. If you need the money, sell it. I sold it for 350 a bushel. A month ago, I called the little elevator in my town to see what hard red winter wheat was worth. 414 a bushel. That's not inflation adjusted prices. It's a fact. We're going to lose one of the two most important things to our democracy, public education being number one, family farm agriculture being number two, if this administration's policies continue on as they have in the past. So, look, I could talk about climate change, I could talk about, uh, uh, which has had an amazing impacts on my farm, uh, but the truth is, and this administration has completely written it off, written it, written it off. And, and if we don't start doing something about that, you want to talk about draconian actions that our kids' generations are going to have to take. It's not going to be pretty. But Republicans have gone after our schools. They've gone after health care in rural communities. It's a killer. You lose your school, you lose your hospital. It's not if. Your community is gone. We understand that as Democrats, as progressives. And our leaders and our candidates have bold initiatives. 
often bipartisan plans to drive down prescription drugs, to incentivize teacher hiring in rural schools, and to keep the doors open in health clinics. My folks always said, don't make a promise you can't keep, and it is true in rural America. But rural Americans appreciate hard work, and they appreciate talking truth. Unrealistic promises of things like totally free college or jobs for everybody and a living wage doesn't make sense in rural America because it doesn't make sense. You've got to figure out how to get that done, and I don't see how you do it with just words. In my family, it is more important to show up and to be yourself and not be a rubber stamp. I will tell you that, that uh, when I ran, um, Trump uh, come to my state four times, uh, Pence came three times. They tried to make, little Donald came a whole bunch of times, he's thinking about running for governor uh, in Montana. Uh, but the fact is, is that I didn't waver, I stayed with what I had done for the last two terms before that. We talked about what was important to rural America, we talked about healthcare, we talked about education, we talked about infrastructure, we even talked about climate change. And I'm gonna tell you, in the end, when the distorted view was put forth and people went to the ballot box, they said, you know what? We know who John Tester is, and that's who they voted for. <clears throat> so in conclusion, I would just say Democrats don't need to call rural America home to get our support, but they certainly can't ignore the folks who live there. Uh, if they want to connect with rural America, come in, listen to the concerns, Communicate, communicate a clear, no bullshit vision. And neither, <laughs> truth is, no, neither party has all the answers, but the fact is, is Democrats have good ones that work. <laughs> One last thing I will say, and that is, is it, if you don't show up, you don't get the vote. If you're running for the legislature, you knock on every door. If you're running statewide, you go to every town. I'm going to tell you something that concerns me a lot, and I think it's why we lose elections. When we, you get a legislative candidate, you get a little clipboard, and you say, knock on these doors. Don't knock on those doors over there. Just knock on these doors. I think this holds true for urban America as well as it does in rural America. But you knock on every door if you're going to win. You knock on every door. And the folks out there, the folks out there that tell you you're wasting your time when you're knocking on that door, well then, as Max Bach has told me, go figure out where you can get some more time. Because the truth is, is those people are important, and those people are the, po the folks that if you can get them to vote for you, you'll win that election. So lay out common sense initiatives. Listen. Don't be phony. Guess what happens? We win in 2020. God bless you all. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage CAP's Chief, Chief Operations Officer, Ambassador Gordon Gray. Good afternoon. How about another round of applause for Senator Tester, please? <laughs> We're really grateful that he could join us today to discuss his bold ideas for expanding opportunity on behalf of rural communities. Before joining CAP as its Chief Operating Officer, I served for 33 years as a Foreign Service Officer. During my diplomatic career, I saw firsthand the essential need for thoughtful and reasonable policies to safeguard our national security and to promote American values. But right now, under the erratic direction of Donald Trump, we're seeing the democratic norms and institutions come under attack both here at home and throughout the world. Fortunately, there are still many strong, smart, and experienced leaders who remain committed to advancing a progressive vision for American foreign policy. And we're so glad that three of the, these leaders can join us for our next panel. Now I have the great pleasure of introducing John Podesta, the founder of the Center for American Progress, who will moderate the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, well, good afternoon, and um, I would note that it's just under two and a half years uh, of his presidency, and 
uh, President Trump has shown little regard for U.S.'s traditional treaty allies. He's welcomed autocrats to the Oval Office. He's had a brief love affair with the little rocket man, but now seems to be nowhere in regard to denuclearizing North Korea. He's on the brink of triggering military confrontation with Iran. He's engaged in an escalating trade war with China. He stated his intention to pull out of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, and he's diverting $6 billion of defense spending uh, to build a wall on the southern border that the American people don't want and security experts say won't work. So Donald Trump promised to disrupt U.S. national security policy, and I think we can all agree that is one of the few things he didn't lie about. Um, with me to discuss the implications of these actions for American security and how progressives should respond is a terrific group of experts who have been on the front lines of national security policy making, two of whom now serve uh, in Congress. Uh, Susan Rice uh, served as national security advisor to President Obama, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, is now a senior fellow at both American University and Harvard University. Uh, her memoir, Tough Love, will be published in October. I might have something to ask about that in a little bit. Uh, Alyssa Slotkin served as a CIA officer on the NSC staff under uh, both Presidents Bush and Obama as an acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. In November 2018, she was elected to represent the 8th District of Michigan in Congress. Abigail Spanberger uh, served as a CIA case officer and after uh, a career in the private sector was elected in November 2018 to represent the 7th District uh, of, of Virginia, ending a 48-year uh, Republican hold on that district. Uh, and uh, they, they join in the new majority in Congress. Uh, they both serve uh, on relevant committees. Uh, so I want to start by talking a little bit about, the, uh, about today's hotspots and maybe uh, begin with Iran. Uh, Susan, you, uh, you were the, at the center of President Obama's uh, Iran policy uh, from the very beginning of engagement in 2009 to the conclusion of the Iran uh, nuclear deal, deal. The Trump administration has obviously pulled out of that agreement. Uh, yesterday, Secretary uh, of State Pompeo and Acting Secretary of Defense uh, Shanahan uh, were up to brief the Hill, and I want to get our uh, representatives to talk about that too. But they were, uh, let me begin with you, Susan. Uh, they were describing the Iranian threat, uh, increased Iranian threat, uh, and uh, some people saw that as a prelude to potential military action, military conflict with Iran. So how concerned are you right now about where we stand with respect to the Iranian uh, threat, and what do you see uh, the actions that uh, the United States needs to take at this moment? Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh John, thank you for hosting us, and it's good to be back with you. And it's great to be with these two wonderful women members of Congress who are doing such an exceptional job of uh, providing leadership um, throughout the Democratic caucus, and uh, particularly in the freshman class. I am very concerned about what's going on with respect to Iran for a number of reasons. Um, one, the decision to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal um, and to put on uh, crippling sanctions unilaterally, um, alienating our allies uh, and um, driving Iran to a place where um, after a year of pressure, uh, it is likely to come to the conclusion that the benefits of staying in the nuclear deal um, are uh, outweighed by the downsides and thus a deal that had effectively constrained Iran's nuclear ambitions, cut off every pathway to a nuclear weapon, verifiably so, as validated by our intelligence community, DOD, the International Atomic Energy Agency, is likely to fall apart. And the constraints on Iran's nuclear program will be lifted without the attendant benefits that the administration sought by pulling out of the deal, i.e., a reduction in Iran's support for terrorism, dealing with its missile program, its nefarious behavior in the region, all of which are real, but are much more worrisome in the context of an Iran that may be able to break out and develop uh, a nuclear weapon. So that's the first reason I'm concerned. The second reason I'm concerned is because it does seem, and I don't say this lightly, I say this with 
um, concern and regret that there are some within the administration in senior positions who really seem intent on trying to provoke a conflict with Iran uh, or you know, cause Iran uh, to take steps that give them some justification for military action, whether initiated by the U.S. or initiated by one of our partners in the region and then backed up by the U.S. And I think this is a very dangerous situation for all the president's professed reluctance uh, and concern about potential conflict. He has green-lighted, or I hope he's green-lighted, I hope it's not happening without his approval, the dispatch of ridiculous quantities of military assets into the region. And while I don't doubt uh, the, the, the reality that there may be at the present an increased threat emanating from Iranian blacked militia, we've seen that before. Uh, and whatever the level of threat now, um, I think we risk um, miscalculation and an inadvertent conflict by virtue of everybody being on heightened alert and our own red lines being very blurry. So I'm, I think this is a dangerous moment. I'm concerned that uh, we may end up in a conflict that the American people don't want and that doesn't serve our national interests. Congresswoman Slotkin, maybe you were in the briefings yesterday. You serve on the House Armed Services Committee. Are we, are we headed towards a military confrontation in Iran? Well, I, I mean, obviously the briefing was classified, but I, I do think that um, if you and I can't understand what the strategy is, there is no way the Iranians do, right? So we hear from the president that he doesn't want to war, that he cares only about the nuclear file, but then over the weekend threatens to essentially wipe Iran off the map. John Bolton has literally written about regime change his entire adult life in Iran. Um, so whether they say they believe it or not, you just have to go with what he's written. And then Secretary Pompeo has his 12-point plan um, that he has been talking about that explains what he expects from Iran. So I think it's very hard to tell here in Washington whether we're talking about an attempt at regime change, an attempt to restore deterrence, um, an, attempt, you know, an attempt to look strong, whatever. So we know the Iranians won't be able to understand it. Um, and then, given all the additional resources in theater, um, combined with the risk, I do think we are at risk of a real inadvertent crisis. Um, and it's one you know, that would potentially start small, like we had in 2016, when sailors sort of lost power and drifted, the Iranians picked them up. Um, you can see how these small incidents can be resolved quickly when you have diplomatic channels to the Iranians. And this administration has systematically cut off those channels. So all of a sudden, what could be a relatively manageable incident could become a serious incident that escalates, and both sides back themselves into a corner into higher and higher levels of conflict. So I, I think the, the risk is real. I think what we're hearing from the Iranians would be disturbing to any administration. Um, but I think we've lost the ability to tell what's offensive and what's defensive, what's action, what's reaction, and it's just a powder keg for an inadvertent incident. Congresswoman Woman Sp Spanberger, you want to uh, give us your take on this? Uh, I was nodding in agreement with my colleague. Um, I, I think that Alyssa's point is exactly made. If, if on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't really understand where it is that the administration is taking us, um, from an Iranian perspective, how are they to know? And I, I, I think that Alyssa's point is, is really well made that you know whether or not it is something intentional, we are creating such a frenetic uh, space where there seems to be zero apparent strategy, and that is just a recipe for disaster. And you know, uh, ideally, we will continue um, to to not see that type of disaster. But as the example she gave, that was an you know an, an an accident that was resolved quickly and diplomatically. And if we don't have the ability in the channels to do that in the event that something occurs again, I, I think it's a, a really challenging time. Let me ask uh, a question that. Uh, to, to maybe just require speculation, which is Susan raised the question of whether uh, the president ordered the Abraham Lincoln carrier battle group into, into the Gulf, uh, sent B-52s over. Uh, he says he doesn't want war. There's been reports that he thinks John Bolton's gotten ahead of him. Uh, what do you think is going on inside the White House with respect to who's essentially on first with respect with respect to calling the shots on Iran? Well, first of all, I mean, it's inconceivable to me, even in this administration, that the president wouldn't be the one to make 
the decision to send those assets. Uh, I can't rule out that possibility, but that would be uh, an even more frightening breakdown of process than at least I'm aware of to date. What concerns me, though, about how things are decided is that there really seems to be no national security decision-making process. There are not regular, thoughtful, well-prepared meetings of the National Security Council principals uh, and the president with his national security cabinet to weigh the costs and benefits uh, and the various options on these very complicated decisions. Uh, it seems that the national security advisor is um, hoarding a lot of the decision-making and information, um, keeping uh, the process to a minimum, which I think is um, what, whether it's designed to or has the benefit of enhancing his authority over what happens, um, there just doesn't seem to be the normal uh, transparent kind of decision-making process within the interagency. And that's quite concerning, not only in the case of Iran, but I think on a whole range of issues. Uh, Congresswoman Slotkin, you served both Republican and Democratic National Security Council staffs, as I mentioned. Does this seem aberrant to you? What, what, what's your sense of what's going on now? Uh, you probably have some friends who are still kind of left behind. <laughs> but uh, what, what, what do you think is, is uh, happening in, in yeah. the White House today? I mean, I, th I think it's clear this is pretty different than, you know, the past 60 years of national Process security. matter? Um, yes. I mean, I think, listen, I was at the White House on the last day that President Bush was in office, and then I was there the first day that President Obama came in. Things change. Leadership styles certainly change. The drink cart in the sit room had Diet Dr. Pepper. That's Obama, right? That's not Bush. So the, the things change, um, but uh, I think that the, 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 the behemoth of the U.S. government, right? There's lots of people who worked in the administration. The behemoth that is the U.S. government is on a good day, really hard to get your arms around and to figure out how we're all on the same page on a certain policy issue. If that's a good day, a bad day is a lot of kind of Yosemite Sam just popping off of ideas that are not, you know, they're just a loose collection of activities, not an actual strategy. And when it comes to the issues of war and peace, these are grave issues. And it's just a bad time to be popping off different ideas. Yes, process matters. Um, let's let's sh uh, shift uh, world scenes and go, go on to China. Uh, I want to ask you a couple of questions about that. Uh, Congresswoman Spanberger, you serve on House Foreign Affairs. They've been holding hearings on the China threat. Uh, we've had this escalating trade war that's been going on for a while. The focus now seems to be uh, in ratcheting up pressure on Chinese technology companies with the Huawei um, uh, uh, um, uh, in, you know, uh, sanctions in particular. Uh, now we read in the paper this morning that they're uh, thinking about sanctioning facial recognition uh, technology uh, what do you think is going on? Is the administration actually pursuing the right policies there? How do you assess the threat uh, emanating both on an economic, from an economic perspective but also from a security perspective? I, I feel like uh, Alyssa's Yosemite Sam example <laughs> might, again, be appropriate. Uh, <laughs> So I think there's, there's a couple pieces here that we've been trying to get to the bottom of, we've been trying to discuss on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, one of it is looking long-term strategically at the threat of a powerful China, China's engagement in Africa, China's engagement throughout Latin America, uh, China's engagement in Eastern Europe and Europe. And, and how does the United States position itself recognizing that challenge? Uh, and so I, I think that the valuable part of that conversation is what's our strategy as we are continuing to antagonize our NATO allies and our European allies and our allies writ large uh, across the globe, how are we, how are we strategizing a long-term relationship with them where we can use that, that center of friendship and, and partnership to counter the, the challenge that China presents? And, and I would argue that we're not utilizing that strategic uh, uh, those strategic alliances or partnerships. Also, when we look at China's long-term investment in infrastructure throughout the world and its long-term investment in things like education back home, the, the reason we're talking about Huawei, the reason we're talking about 5G technology is because domestically, we're not pursuing 
to the same level the Chinese are, or to a level that keeps us monumentally, aggressively competitive in our domestic education. And that's from the time a child enters preschool on up through college. And so I think looking at the fact that when you look at the, the strategy behind China's development and efforts to kind of grow its influence in the world, they, they're looking in 20, 50, 100 year chunks of time. And we're far too often reactive. So I, I think that the conversations we're trying to have and trying to push are how can we look at our long-term strategy? And then relative specifically to some of the 5G technologies and Huawei, for example, um, and, and the concerns that those technologies may allow uh, Chinese military or Chinese intelligence agencies to gain access to information of U.S. consumers or, or uh, consumers throughout uh, Europe or other uh, allied nations. We've been talking a lot about it, but we need to take action. And actually, Alyssa and I introduced a bill yesterday called the 5G and Beyond, uh, Secure 5G and Beyond Act, that would require that the administration and the president come out with a plan for how it is that we can, into the future, um, ensure that the technology that's being developed doesn't have the, the, the weaknesses that will make American consumers vulnerable and um, make it so that American companies can't compete. So I, I think to answer your question, we've got to have a more long-term strategic viewpoint. And we have to actually start taking action on some of the more immediate threats and concerns that we have. Congresswoman Slotkin, uh, CAP just recently introduced a, a, a report on strategy for China and made some of the points that uh, Congresswoman Spanberger made, which is investment here is in our greatest strengths in our technology uh, portfolio in uh, education, et cetera, in infrastructure, were really key to be able to compete in the 21st century. Do you agree with that? And you want to say a little bit more about the bill that you just introduced? Um, sure. It was actually Abigail's bill that she allowed. This is, this is what we do, especially us foreign policy members of Congress. Um, is there a little we, caucus up we, there? Yes, we do. We do have a little caucus. There's, the, there's um, uh, nine of us in the freshman class that are either service or veteran members of Congress, um, and we hang out a lot. Um, and then there is a subset of the women, which are in my district, called the badass women. Um, <laughs> Abigail has... Um, some people don't like that word. I'm sorry. Um, the, the, um, so we do ping pong back and forth on bills that we like. I think, I mean, listen, I think the, the, the only thing we have to know is I think today as we were coming out here, we heard that the president canceled the meeting with Nancy Pelosi on infrastructure at the exact moment that the Chinese are investing billions in their own infrastructure, right? Um, our education is going the wrong direction. In Michigan, unfortunately, we've gone from being top 10 in the country to bottom 10 in the country, while the Chinese are investing heavily in education. I think sometimes um, they just um, frame the question and frame the strategy differently, um, and we're caught constantly on our heels. So I do, I, sound, I haven't read the report. I'll put it on the list. Good. <laughs> it's good reading, let me tell you. <laughs> Uh, Susan, you worked, uh, you and I worked together on uh, on climate change. We had some success with China on on that question, on getting them to do more in Ebola, etc. But uh, President Obama has been criticized for for maybe not being tough enough on some of these uh, economic questions. Do you? Uh, how would you assess uh, the uh, you know the role that the economy played in trying to? develop a relationship with President Xi, would you do anything different if you had it to do over again? Well, I think, as President Obama actually often said, the U.S.-China relationship is the most complex and consequential in the world. And the ways in which it, we are now intertwined economically from a security point of view in terms of the span of global issues that we have to deal with makes it a very complex relationship to manage. Um, and I'm, I actually think that, you know, we managed it rather well, given that we, we will define significant areas of cooperation, and in those areas where we have to compete, which are serious on the economic and the security front, um, we competed effectively and with confidence with the backing of our friends and allies in Europe and Asia. So, you know, John, you deserve an enormous amount of credit for the progress we made with China on climate change, without which we would not have the Paris Agreement. Um, but 
it goes beyond that. We were able to work effectively with China on nuclear security and thereby help lock down materials around the world that would otherwise be vulnerable to terrorists. We worked together not only on the Ebola outbreak effectively, but on the wide span of global health security issues, um, which, you know, if you're worried about potential pandemic flu or Zika or what have you, is, is a very proximate concern. We were able to work with China on the Iran deal and other aspects uh, of our uh, multilateral agenda. And at the same time, we were engaged in fierce competition over things like their cyber theft. But rather than uh, get into uh, a trade war or an economic conflict over something like that, we were actually, through the uh, effective threat of the use of sanctions, not the application of sanctions, able to get China to subscribe to some commitments on cyber theft that were very important and meaningful, at which they adhered to until they got into the trade conflict uh, with President Trump. And so, you know, the, the thing with China is, yes, this is a serious competitor. As Abigail and, and uh, Alyssa said, we have to have a long-term strategy. We need to do it in conjunction with our partners and allies. Um, we need to do better on the domestic side, absolutely. And that means, you know, when, you deal, when you're competing with a China that puts every aspect of its hugely powerful government and society behind any economic endeavor, and we can't get Google to cooperate with the U.S. government on a small, you know, low-level project maven, we've got a problem because we can't reconstitute very easily the cooperation between government, the private sector, and our uh, universities that were so instrumental in enabling us to be effective during the Cold War. So we've got to get our own house in order. The fact that we don't have a 5G competitor in the mix is on us. Um, and, and so going forward, John, uh, we have to take the China threat very seriously, as I think has been the case in the past. And I think what we're seeing now uh, is, you know, China's uh, rise has, is, you know, been, is going on an exponential curve. It started like this, and now it's going you know, up faster. And we have to deal with that. But we need to deal with it without making conflict inevitable. And I know from discussions with members of uh, the administration that there's at least a subset of, at, at a senior level that takes the view that conflict with, an, with China is inevitable. And we might as well have it sooner rather than later when our relative strength is greater. That's literally one mindset within the administration. Whether that's economic conflict or actual physical conflict, um, that's a scary perspective. Um, and it, it's not, in my view, the way we, we need to go or ought to go. I kind of miss Jim Mattis right now. <laughs> Congresswoman, you want to get in on this? Yeah, I just wanted to say something about climate change because I feel like we're, we're um, in a room full of some of the great minds on foreign policy. And as someone who represents Michigan, I think that there's this misperception that the middle of the country doesn't care about climate change, um, that we don't care about the environment, that it's a coastal thing. And I just want to tell you, the single most bipartisan thing in my district and in my state are protection of the Great Lakes and our local environment. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge that thinking on climate change is, is changing. It's changing in the heartland, right, where um, for me, you tell a cherry farmer that in the future there may not be a certain number of hard freeze days, he's not going to have cherries on his tree, right? He is thinking about that. And then I come to the Armed Services Committee where I serve, and the Republicans are supporting amendments in the NDAA that require the Defense Department to do prudent planning on climate change. That's change, so let's acknowledge it. But the other thing that I think is happening, obviously we can see it from the young people, is we need to reframe the conversation um, and start thinking about environmental security the way we think about homeland security. It's literally about the safety of our kids and the preservation of our way of life. We need to talk about it in muscular terms. It's not a niche issue for environmentalists. It's literally in Michigan. I live 15 minutes from Flint, Michigan. Our water um, is at risk and that is you are more likely in Michigan to hand your child a cup of water that will cause an early childhood cancer or a lifelong learning disability than you are to ever be the victim of a terrorist attack. So let's talk about it in those muscular terms and not be squeamish because it's the environment. Thank you. I want to shift hot spots again and talk a little bit about Russia. So, I'm the poster child for interference in the 2016 election. 
Um, uh, the intel community tells us the Russians haven't stopped. They're going to be back in 2020. Donald Trump sort of denies that uh, for reasons that we can speculate about. Um, are we doing enough to protect our democracy when it comes to the 2020 election? Maybe Congressman Spanberger, I'll start with you. So, so I think an important point is they've never stopped. Um, and in terms of the, the influence efforts that they have endeavored to uh, undertake on social media, they've never stopped. They continue to work to sow division, to recognize what our vulnerabilities are as a people, and to seek to divide us, and that continues and has continued. Uh, and, and I think really making sure that people understand that is so vitally important. I think that when we do talk about the Mueller report or when we talk about Russian interference, people think of it in binary terms. Did it impact the election? Yes, no. And, and I think that that is so detrimental to our ability back in, in home in our districts to have a conversation about the fact that we were attacked. A foreign adversary nation sought to influence our our population and continues to do so. A foreign adversary nation um, stole from us and used that information against us. They hacked a major political party. They hacked a um, presidential campaign. And, and if we look at it in terms of they did it there, what's, what's next? Is it the electrical grid? Is it a major bank? I mean, recognizing that these threats are transferable, I think, is so vital to the conversation. Um, do I think we're doing enough? No, is, is the honest answer there. Uh, Alyssa and I are actually engaged in an effort because we've identified that we don't think that we're doing enough. So we've gotten a, a bipartisan group of lawmakers together seeking to further define the problem and come up with some, some solutions. So stay tuned for that as we continue that effort. But, but no, I, and I think that part of it actually is defining the problem better in a way where people can talk about it and digest what's happening um, and, and make sure that we are engaging with the tools that they are using. So they're exploiting social media. They're exploiting what seems like a safe place where you share pictures of your kids. Um, and, and, and recognizing, I think it's hard for people to understand or even accept that they might have been influenced, but recognizing the tactics that they're taking on the influence side of it, I think is vitally important. And, and talk, how do we strengthen ourselves against that? How do we build that resiliency where we're looking for fact and truth and we're not saying, oh, that's fake or, oh, that's true or, you know, this validates my preexisting opinion, therefore I'm going to consume this. Um, and so it is, there isn't an easy solution. I don't think we're doing enough. From a legislative perspective, we also need to make sure that foreign actors can't be buying ads the same way, um, the same way we did in an election. I, I'm sure we did 18 television ads, so the number of times I recorded my safe saying, paid for by Spanberger for Congress, so that people knew it was an ad that I was paying for, whether it was one that was in favor of me or against my opponent, but the fact that those same sort of influences can be purchased by you know, foreign entities and nobody has to know where it's coming from, that is really deeply problematic. And we're working on the campaign finance side to make sure that there's that clarity, uh, but it's a long process. The, uh, Susan, I, I, I want you to answer that question too, but I also want to just put it in context, which is they're not just playing around here, they're playing around uh, globally, really, but particularly in Europe. Your EU parliamentary elections are tomorrow. We've seen a rise of uh, pro-Russia, right-wing populist parties, uh, some of which with the help of Russia. How concerned are you about Russian activities here, and how concerned are you about Russian activities more uh, globally in terms of uh, interfering with democratic processes? Well, I'm concerned about both, but uh, I think what we've seen in Europe, at least in some places, is a greater willingness and ability on the leadership to call it out and, and, and put it on front street, which is what Macron did again today uh, in uh, highlighting the, the connections between Bannon, Russia, and all of these uh, efforts to sow uh, division within Europe. We don't have that here. <laughs> We have uh, a president who, uh, as you would say, is, is trying to sweep this issue under a rug. And a, uh, a part, his party in Congress, uh, which knows better and, and ought to understand that you know, what goes around comes around. This is not Russia you know, on behalf of the Republican Party. This is Russia screwing with our democracy and can flip the tables and, and, and undermine an election at any level in our system against either party. We're not handling it. Uh, effectively. I think everything Abigail said is right. We need to uh, do multiple things simultaneously. One is the physical infrastructure 
of our election systems, ensuring that they are as impenetrable as possible, that we have paper backups, that the, the mechanics of the election are impervious to external um, intrusion. That's job one. Uh, and we still have progress to, to, to make on that. Secondly, our social media companies and our traditional media companies need to do a better job of ensuring that they are not the vehicles uh, for this abuse. Um, and I think that, you know, the tech companies have come some distance. I think there's more to go, absolutely. Um, thirdly, it, it's on us, the American people, to understand and recognize that this is a new normal, that, that Russia and other adversaries are going to continue uh, to try to undermine our democratic institutions and sow internal division and dissent. Um, and we need to be prepared for that practically and psychologically, but we also have to understand that we're in some ways our own worst enemy. To the extent that we are an increasingly polarized, divided country, where we, you know, we view things in us versus them terms. With people we disagree with, we start to view as somehow our opponents. We are setting up uh, an environment which is ripe for abuse by any external adversary. Um, so it's, you know, it's one thing for Russia to buy Facebook ads, you know, on both sides of the Charlottesville debate and, you know, pitting Black Lives Matter people against white nationalists. It's another thing for us to allow that to be feasible because of our own domestic uh, polarization and, and, and discourse being so poisoned and so uh, broken. That's on us to fix. Um, it's not on, on anybody else. So th the one thing I will say in this bad news picture is that at least this is something that we have the ability to address if we were so motivated. Uh, I'm going to open things up to a couple of questions. We have a few minutes to ask questions, and I think people have mics. Uh, before we uh, do that, though, I want to ask one last question, which is all of you have succeeded in what is really a male-dominated male <laughs> profession. And I want to ask you what advice you have to other young women who are coming up and want a career in the national security field. So... Maybe I, I'm going to end with Susan because she wrote a whole book about this. But <laughs> It starts with being fearless. It starts with believing that your voice and your thoughts and, and your energy can, can be useful to the mission that you're serving. Um, and then to be fearless, certainly uh, serving in CIA is very different from running a political campaign. But I think both of those require that you just believe so deeply in the day-to-day -day of what you're doing and in the larger strategy and plan and what you're fighting for, um, that it drives you to be fearless, and, and it should. Um. Congressman? Um, I would echo that, but I would also say, um, in my experience at the CIA and then at the Pentagon and now in Congress, um, and people always forget because they think we have so many women in Congress now, it is like a whopping 22% <laughs> people. So, like, we're psyched, but there's still a little bit of work to do. Um, and um, for me, I always found that if I was the master of my portfolio, then attempts by some male colleagues to dismiss or to, to um, disengage would be much harder because I just really knew my stuff. And when I uh, meet young women or like, how do I become confident? How do I you know, play in these tough fields? It's like, pick something you love and master it. Bring that to the table. Refuse to sit in the back. Um, and just let your expertise speak for itself. And your brain and your own... Um, self-consciousness are something to be managed and dealt with that's inside. Deal with it and get yourself at the table. Fantastic. Susan? Tough love, love. <laughs> so the book that uh, will be coming out is a memoir, uh, and it's very much a story of my parents and grandparents, my upbringing, and then ultimately my experience in government, but it's enabled me to reflect a lot on what I learned from my late parents who were themselves uh, quite accomplished professionals. And it's interesting because both of what uh, Abigail and Alyssa have already said were among the things they taught me. You've got to be your best. You've got to bring your game every time you get into the classroom, the boardroom, the situation room. Um, you, you, you can't slack. So. Quality is, is number one. Fearlessness, of course, yes, but my parents put it to me a little bit differently. 
uh, which is my father always used to say, don't take crap off of anyone. And by that he meant, don't let anybody dismiss you or discount you. You got to know when to come back uh, in your own defense. You got to walk into the room confident. And if somebody's trying to put you down, you, you don't take it. Um, they also taught me that I should never let um, bigotry, racism, or sexism be my problem. Let it be the problem of the bigot, by which they meant if I allowed other people's prejudices about me, for whatever reason, to get into my head, to influence how I think about myself, to limit my own sense of uh, potential or ability, then the bigot has won, and I've defeated myself. So if somebody else is coming to the table with their own insecurities and biases, that's their problem. It's not mine. And as hard as that might seem, or even as counterintuitive as it might seem, that served me very well. I don't spend time worrying about, you know, is somebody going to give me a hard time because I'm African American or because I'm a woman or because I'm short or because, you know, at one point I was a 28 year old in the room with 50 year olds. Um, you just go in there and you bring your best and you, you don't let it get in your head. It's fantastic. Thank you. And we all look forward to reading and buying and reading the book. <laughs> it's important not just to read it, but to buy it. <laughs> Thank you, all John. Right. Questions from the audience? I am having a hard time seeing. Somebody in the back. Uh, do you have a mic? Go ahead and identify yourself and please ask a question. Hi, I'm McKinney Freechild with Public Citizen. Thank you all for being here. Wondering about election security approaches. There's a desperate need for resources in the states to buy paper ballot based systems and do auditing. What do you think the odds are? I know the Dems have made it a priority in HR1 and more. What are the odds of getting bipartisan funding to the states before 2020? Well, I can speak to it because we passed it in HR1, right? So it's a, a huge section of HR1 is all on election security. And it's kind of like a wish list of everything we would want to protect our democracy, to protect our systems. Didn't come with resources, so extremely hard to put on our states. Um, HR1 is unfortunately not going to be taken up by the Senate, so we have now broken off um, the pieces on election security. We're putting them through in a series through the Homeland Security Committee um, with the addition of um, uh, an authorization for funds for the states, acknowledging that they just can't do this um, without money for it. I think that will pass um, through, again, in a bipartisan way through committee. I think it will once again pass the House. and then. We have to do what we have not been doing for those who are Democrats in the room, which is putting a spotlight on Mitch McConnell for the many, many months that he has not taken up these really important bills. We're not asking everyone to pass. We are asking that they get taken up and the system of our democracy actually moves. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a ton of faith that there, these new bills will be taken up, but that's where you all come in and putting serious pressure would help. So I would second what Alyssa said. And just as an example, one of the things that's really important to me is this issue that knowledge is power. And um, I led on a bill, and Alyssa co-sponsored it, um, and, and she had good bills that I co-sponsored as well. Uh, but this one in particular is the idea that knowledge is power, and we have states that are facing threats that they may not have the ability, the resources, or even the understanding of. So this bill would require that the DNI give a threat assessment to states 180 days in advance of an election. Now, that's just the piece of them helping them understand what threats may exist. Um, and in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we had a challenge. Our governor recognized that he was unsure that there might be um, weaknesses to our election system. He hired hackers to hack our system. They were able to hack uh, the system within 10 minutes. There's no evidence that anything had actually ever happened to that system, but he was worried about that weakness. And by executive order in the Commonwealth, summarily changed all of our voting machines in order to have a paper ballot. So we know these weaknesses do exist, and when you have the resources, states can take those steps, but really the federal government does need to play a role uh, to ensure that states that may not have the resources or the ability know the threat and can contend with it once it's identified. One more, right there. Hi, I'm Ken Miller. 
I, uh, there's been suggestions made in the public discourse that the president might be a Russian asset, but no one's calling that out. To what extent do you think he was recruited as a Russian asset, is a Russian asset, and how is that possibility reverberating in the uh, intelligence community? I think I'm gonna take that. <laughs> Since I'm, I'm the only one who's not an elected official up here. <laughs> um, that was for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead, Sean. No, you're <laughs> Look, uh, I think there are a lot of questions that remain unanswered that I find concerning. I'm not prepared to speculate that the president is a Russian asset. Uh, I, I think there, you know, his financial ties, uh, his, you know, his prior history, prior to coming into office, all of those things are, are worthy of further exploration. Um, and I think, you know, we can't rule anything out, but I don't think it's healthy to frankly speculate uh, uh, on something of that degree of gravity without the evidence to, to back it up. I just add one word, which is the president likes to say that he never invested in Russia, but the Russians sure invested in him. Uh, okay, we have time for maybe one last question. Got it, right there. Frank Leonard Tiaga from Silicon Valley in Washington, D.C. I wanted to know your perspective on the epidemic of fake news and how it's affecting national security. Um, I like how you say you're just, you're here from Silicon Valley. You're just representing the whole valley. Um, the, the, um, uh, the, <laughs> Um, the, uh, so, yeah, this is a huge concern, and obviously Michigan was particularly targeted with a lot of the Russian ads um, in the last election, so I spent a lot of time looking at those ads and how they were targeted. Um, uh, but um, separate from that, I do think that people are losing faith in the way that they get their news. Um, and so I've, I even see this like seeping into places um, like academia, right? I, I, me I represent Michigan State University and I've done open forums there where a master student will ask me like, how do you get smart on issues? And I said, well, I'll go to some trusted sources and read up, um, uh, you know, online and, and ask people, you know, smart people. And he said, but how do you know that those sources are, are true? And this young person feels like he has to question every source, many, many of them legitimate, um, before he can actually take it as fact. And that's scary, right? That's scary. Um, similarly, we've now stovepiped so deeply, we see this in my district very distinctly, where people get their news through a specific stovepipe, so anything from the other pipe is just disregarded out of hand. Um, and, you know, we used to have the nightly news that we all watched together. You know, we watched as a family during dinner, Tom Brokaw, and no one was allowed to talk when Tom was talking. And we no longer have that common experience, and therefore, my experience on the campaign trail is sometimes you're, you're talking with people who are just absolutely resistant to hearing something that breaks through their sense of the world. And that was very, very difficult and very discouraging. In addition to the problem, as Elisa, Elisa described it, I think there's another aspect to it. Yes, we're all stovepiped and we have a problem with how we consume information. I think it's a very serious challenge. But I think it's, our national security is threatened even more, quite frankly, right now by having a liar in the White House. And the fact of the matter is that the president stands up every day and says something that the entire world knows is blatantly untrue, utterly counterfactual and has no compunction about doing it while he denigrates uh, and, and, and calls the enemy of the people our free press, which is a critical institution of our democracy. And I think that, on top of what uh, Alyssa described, is corroding uh, public trust uh, in, our, in our leadership, in our institutions, it's corroding international confidence uh, in the United States as uh, a, uh, as a global leader. And I think uh, one of the things that, that we need to be conscious of as we think about how we dig out of this trust deficit internationally um, and leadership deficit is the, the value of having, again, somebody in the White House and at the podium uh, whose word can be taken seriously. 
Unfortunately, we are out of time, but please join me in thanking these great security leaders. I think we all sleep better at night knowing that you're on the bridge. Thanks. Please welcome to the stage Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and Neera Tandon. Absolute privilege to welcome our very special guest, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Let's just do one more round. <laughs> Speaker Pelosi is the highest ranking woman, woman to ever hold elected office in American history. And she is one of the smartest, toughest, and most effective public servants our country has ever known. This past weekend, Speaker Pelosi also received the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award for her incredible record of leadership. And we're incredibly grateful to have her today. So let me start off. Some news happened today. <laughs> Uh, you, uh, you this morning were supposed to meet with the president on infrastructure, um, but that meeting didn't really happen, as I understand it, from Twitter and the news and cable. Could you tell us what happened and uh, what your thoughts are on that meeting or lack thereof? I'm happy to convey uh, my impression of what happened this morning, but not before I thank you, Mayor, for your incredible leadership and cap for ideas. That's mm -hmm. a big word. It means so much. And some of it, um, but unfortunately, the difference we have between the executive and the legislative branch in our house anyway is ideas based on fact, science, truth, evidence. Did I say data? So <laughs> we have a, we'll have a different interpretations of what happens. But here's the thing. Let's salute Cap. Let's thank Mira Chandler for her great leadership. Thank you. Aren't you impressed with our freshman members of Congress? Aren't yeah. they fantastic? And I know you heard from Adam Schiff earlier. We're so proud of his work. I just want you to know this. When Watergate babies came, the Watergate babies came to the Congress in 1976, it was a, it was a transformational class of members of Congress. It was fantastic. Fantastic. People have compared this class in terms of size and depth and energy and enthusiasm and entrepreneurship and all the rest, diversity, as a similar class. The reason I bring it up is in 1977, they came. Not one of those freshmen got a gavel, chaired a subcommittee in the first year. In this freshman class, 18 freshmen chair subcommittees in the Congress. We view that as something spectacular. 10 women, where's Stephanie? 10 women, <laughs> thank you, Stephanie, for helping me make that happen, and, and eight men. But this is remarkable to think that the woman who is a, I'm one of the first, I know you heard from Sharice this morning, and she's wonderful, but, uh, uh, and Deb Holland, who is one of the other two first Native American women to come to the Congress, Deb Holland is now the chair of the Natural Resources Committee Public Lands Subcommittee. That is a very big mm -hmm. deal, and it's a very big deal in the Native American community as well. So we're very, very proud of them, uh, all of them, the beautiful diversity of it all. 106 women in the Congress, 91 of them Democrats. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> Isn't that remarkable? 60% of, the, of, the, um, 60 of our caucus, women, people of color, LGBTQ, 60% of our caucus. We're very thrilled. We wish the other side would uh, have some diversity. But having said that, we say in our caucus, our diversity is our strength. Our unity is our power. 
as our power. And that power is recognized, to get to your question, uh, by this President of the United States. He knows that we will act together. Whatever our differences uh, on one thing or another, when it comes to it, we build our consensus and we make our plan and we go forward together. So this morning we went to the, we went to the White House uh, hopeful, hopeful uh, that the President would participate in the conversation as a follow-up to a previous conversation we had about infrastructure. We shared our priorities in a previous meeting. We came to some agreement, $2 trillion. We came to how it would be divided, 80% federal, 20% local. In any event, uh, today was the day he was supposed to tell us how, what he would be willing to uh, support and pay for us for all of that. Instead, in a, an orchestrated, almost to a oh, poor baby point of view, he came into the room and said that I said that he was engaged in a cover-up and he couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly engage in a conversation on infrastructure as long as, as long as we are investigating him. Now, we've been investigating him since we took uh, the majority, so there's nothing new in that. But, and then he had a, a press conference in the Rose Garden with all this um, short sort of visuals that obviously were planned long before I said, most currently, that he was engaged in a cover-up. So it's really sad. And here's the thing, and I told this to the room when he came in and made that statement, and then he walked out, and you got the Secretary of the Treasury, you got all the this, that, and the other thing, and a distinguished group of members from the House and Senate, Democrats said, you know, 200 years ago, Thomas Jefferson tasked his Secretary of the Treasury, the other one was standing right there, to, uh, to develop an a infrastructure initiative for America to build into the Louisiana Purchase, the, Erie, the um, uh, Lewis and Clark Expedition, it was the Erie Canal, the Cumberland Road, all those kinds of things for our America. 100 years later, Teddy Roosevelt instituted his infrastructure initiative, the National Park Service, the Green Infrastructure of America. And so we were, and I said to them, and I said to the press after, we want to give this president the opportunity to do something historic for our country. While there are those in our family who think, why would you work with him if he, you know, and, and basically he's saying back to me, why would I work with you if you're investigating me? But the fact is, Something happened there. So I pray for him and I pray for the United States of America. Uh, it's really, he, he walked away. Whether he ever intended to honor what he said before remains to be seen. But Democrats believe in building the infrastructure of our country, mass transit roads, bridges, uh, broadband into rural America, into underserved areas in our cities, wastewater, clean water, infrastructure of the satellites so that we can have precision farming. There's so many needs, and we thought we had some level of agreement, but you never know with this president of the United States. So that's what happened this morning. It was very, very, very strange. <laughs> <laughs> but the press says to me, were you surprised? And I said, and I say to you, surprised? Nobody could ever be surprised at anything that happens here. So, can I, as a follow-up to that, can I just ask you, why do you think you in particular um, uh, ha seem to have so much leverage or ability to drive uh, Donald Trump um, to this level of distraction, to run out of an infrastructure meeting? <laughs> he, he actually hasn't come up with a nickname. I mean, why is it, why do you think it, you have done what others haven't been able to do, which is throw him so off balance. Well, I think uh, I alluded to it earlier when I transitioned to your question. <laughs> he recognizes the unity of our caucus, and that is a very big deal because he he isn't about that. You know, he's not about consent. It, and also. Um, he, in, on his side of the aisle, he didn't see that kind of unity. So I think he sees 
the fact that we are united as something that he has to deal with. contend with, yeah. to deal with. And that is, as the leader of the House Democrats, that uh, Speaker of the House, he has to deal with me officially, but also in terms of negotiating on the, as, as the leader of the party, uh, that, that, that unity gives me leverage. Um, I mean, you've had a busy day, uh, a lot of important meetings. Um, obviously, uh, the issue of the investigations and uh, what, you, what you said, you know, that he's engaged in a cover-up um, is uh, a top of news. Uh, you have <laughs> eloquently laid out the constitutional role of Congress in oversight over the executive branch uh, with a Trump administration that is defying uh, and trying to defy the subpoenas and fighting every effort to hold it accountable. Mm. How does Congress fulfill this oversight role moving forward? And what do you say to those who believe an impeachment inquiry will give Congress what it needs to hold him accountable? Well, that's a big long question. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for that. Uh, I know you heard from Adam Schiff this morning and he's one, he's one of six chairs who are leading the way on what we are doing. First of all, let me just say, we take an oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. Democrats take that oath seriously, and we are committed to honoring our oath of office. I'm not sure uh, that our Republican colleagues share that commitment, and I'm not sure that the President of the United States does, too. So, in light of the fact that the beauty of the Constitution is a system of checks and balances, two co-equal, three co-equal branches of government, that's why he's uh, co-equal branches <laughs> of government, a check and balance on each other. The Con Constitution spells out the, pra uh, the duties of Congress, and one of them is oversight of the President of the United States. Another one of them is to impeach the President of the United States. So we have, and let me just be as brief as uh, succinct as possible in this regard. We have six chairmen. You heard from Adam Schiff this morning, who's having a success with getting documents from the Justice Department by the actions the committee has taken. You have um, Elijah Cummings, chair of the Gov Reform, Government Reform Committee, who had a big success this week with one of his cases, mm -hmm. the Mazur decision, which clearly spells out that it's Congress's responsibility and right to investigate uh, the, the, um, uh, the other branches of government. He also has a good, um, it's not our case, but it's a case that falls in his domain, the emoluments case. That's the second committee. Third committee, you have the Financial Services Committee. Maxine Waters is the chair. Maxine has laid out an indictment, uh, a, a, a series of questions, back and forth with the administration when they kept telling her, we're not answering you because you're the minority. And now she's the chair of the committee. <laughs> Today, as we sit here, we're in court in New York with the Deutsche Bank case, that, insisting that we get uh, the documents from Deutsche Bank, and we think we will win that case. So again, we're on that path. The investigation that she did, the investigation that Adam Schiff did, the investigation of that Mr. Cummings said, are reaping benefits and more to come from those committees. And then we have uh, the, um, Jerry Nadler, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, which has uh, the overarching impeachment responsibility and what they are doing with the subpoenas, where we might go with contempt of Congress and the rest there, and that we're on the path there. But you have to, you have to, in order to have an investigation of any kind, if you want to call it, impeachment or whatever, you have to have the subpoena, you have to go to court, you have to develop your case. Then we have the um, uh, Richie Neal, Chair of the Ways and Means Committee. The law could not be clearer. The IRS shall turn over the documents to the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. And so we feel that we'll be in strong, that's the clearest possible case. Okay. So then one more is um, Foreign Affairs, which has had hours of testimony from Secretary Tillerson. We haven't, I've been out this morning, so I haven't heard what some of the results of that are yet. But understand that, you know, intelligence, we're getting the documents. Government reform, we've won the court case, too, actually. 
financial services. We're in court right now, and ha this is a very good case for us, all built on investigation, uh, ways and means, and, the, and again, the Judiciary Committee. So we're very proud of the work that our leadership on those committees, uh, the, the work that they have done, and they have taken us to a place where we get more information that, to predicate the next series of actions. But, uh, but this is why I think the president was so steamed off this morning, because the fact is, in plain sight, in the public domain, this president is obstructing justice, and he's engaged in a cover-up. And that could be an impeachable offense. Ignoring this, ignoring the, um, ignoring the uh, subpoenas of Congress was Article Three of the of the uh, Nixon impeachment. Article Three, he he did not honor the subpoenas of Congress. So, it's not just the substance that we're after, and we want to have to give the truth to the American people. But in striving to get that, the intervention that the um, uh, that the obstruction that the administration is engaged in is, um, as they say, the cover-up is frequently worse than the crime. Very true. Uh, you know, I think there's an interesting paradox because there's a lot of people who talk in the press about some of the issues of impeaching or not impeaching because it, an, an impeachment could cloud the agenda. Um, and I think the paradox of that is sometimes reporters don't cover the agenda, and so uh, that's actually happening, and these issues get much more coverage. Uh, I think uh, when you look at the last several weeks of the new house, uh, I think it would be just interesting to maybe talk a little bit about what has passed so far, because uh, it is... Uh, it's a reminder that actually the Congress has been busy passing bills. These committees are very busy, and that's extremely important. Oversight is a constitutional responsibility. But uh, issues of concern to voters every day in their lives are also issues that are coming up. And so I'd love for you to just frame perhaps what you see as speaker in the legislative agenda on what has ha been accomplished so far. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for that question. <laughs> uh, when we ran, we promised an agenda for the people. Lower health care costs by reducing the cost of prescription drugs and uh, strengthening uh, the uh, benefit for, to protect people with pre-existing conditions. Lower health care costs. Bigger paychecks by building the infrastructure of America in a green way, resilient and for the future. And third, cleaner government, HR1, uh, we have passed in the House. and, and uh, Pieces of it, like the Voting Rights Act, will, be, will come separately. Protecting of our elections, as the Congresswoman discussed earlier, coming forward. But here's the thing. Uh, we have passed, we have our top 10. The first 10 uh, pieces of legislation are the prerogative of the majority. One, for the people, passed the House. Infrastructure bill, we were working on that today. Prescription drug bill, we have passed several last week. Voting Rights Advancement Act, that's part of H.R. 1, but it has its own place because we need to build the constitutional basis of stronger for it. Equality Act, we're so proud we passed that last week. Dream and Promise Act, they're uh, marking it up in committee today. As soon as we come back, we'll pass that. Paycheck Fairness, Equal Pay for Equal Work, passed the House. Background Checks on Guns, Common Sense, Gun violence prevention, background checks, passed the House. Uh, climate action now, that's HR 9, passed the House May 2nd. Uh, the climate issue and the overarching issue of climate and the overarching issue of the ending the disparity of income and equal equity in our country drives most of the rest of the agenda. They're all in furtherance of that. So I want you to join a club that I'm starting. It's called the Too Hot to Handle Club. <laughs> Mitch McConnell has said he's the Grim Reaper. He's yeah. going to kill every bill we send over there. And we're saying to him, we have news for you. These bills are alive and well with the public. They're needed in their lives. And we are, 
Our hope is the outside mobilization that many of you are engaged in, the outside mobilization to say to the Senate, take up these bills. What are you afraid of? What they're afraid of is they will pass. And since they're handmaidens of the gun industry and handmaidens of the fossil fuel industry and, and the handmaidens of the pharmaceutical industry, you know, they don't want any of these to pass. But we, again, public sentiment is everything. Abraham Lincoln, with it you can accomplish anything, without it practically nothing. We are t we're making it too hot for them to handle with our public advocacy largely in the hands of the grassroots mobilizers in our country, which helped us save the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to protect it in court now, but save it from them uh, with 10,000 events around the country. So inside maneuvering, very important. Outside mobilization, essential. The strength of it all, it's what they fear the most, too hot to handle. I'm thinking of getting like potholders or those mittens. <laughs> <laughs> those mittens to uh, uh, send to our supporters uh, who are involved in making it too hot for them to handle. Uh, we're running out of time. I just have two quick questions. One is a very quick follow-up to that. I think what uh, people lose sight of uh, around the country is actually how little the Senate is doing. So while the, con the House is passing these bills, um, the Senate has mostly been doing nominations, not legislation. Uh, and in addition to the too hot to handle line, are there things this room and uh, people who are paying attention online and elsewhere can focus on actually doing with their senators, maybe um, some of the senators who have claimed to be moderate in the past? Well, the, the, actually, this whole list that I read to you has broad bipartisan support in the country. And when we came into office in the majority, we said, we are uh, going to do this in the most transparent way so people will know what, this le what legislation means to them and, and what a vote for or against means uh, to their member of Congress. So it's going to be transparent. It's going to be bipartisan. To the extent possible, we'll try to find our common ground. Where we can't, we stand our ground like a rock. That would be Thomas Jefferson. And we, um, and we can't do that. The third is unity, e pluribus unum, from any one. So these bills are not, we didn't go picking a fight with the most contentious legislation. What we did was to say, where do we have common ground to make the biggest difference in the lives of the American people? Lower health care costs, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, bigger paychecks, building infrastructure, cleaner government. I'm not sure the Republicans are interested in that. But nonetheless, <laughs> the American people are. And it's important to the American people because it caffeinates the other issues. Yeah. If they think big dark money effect is going to be reduced, they'll have better confidence that we can do something about gun safety mm -hmm. or climate change against the fossil fuel industry or the list, uh, the list goes on, lower prescription drug prices. So that is, um, that is what we have to do as far as the Senate is concerned. And I do believe and hope that some of the senators uh, in, in the states that we need, we think we have good prospects uh, to um, change their vote on this, or at least get them to vote to bring the bill up. I'm very proud of working with Chuck Schumer and Dick Durbin, the two leaders over there, and uh, many women in the leadership over there as well. And uh, they, they're relentless in pounding it away. But the, the press is just totally obsessed with the uh, impeachment part of it, not obsessed enough to write the particulars of what we're doing in our committees and how important that is, but just to say, when are you going to do that? Well, if we do, we, if, if the facts take us there, that's where we have to go. It has nothing to do with politics. It's not about politics. It's not about, um, uh, pa I don't know, passion or prejudice against him, it's not personal, it's about patriotism, and that, the facts will take us where we need to go. To your point, I'm not sure that we get any more information by instituting an, an impeachment inquiry, but if we thought that we would, that's a judgment we have to, that we would have to make. So again, getting back to the Senate, I know this isn't a political event, <laughs> 
Yeah. And I fully, actually, it's technically not, actually. Fully, so. no, well, just as a civics observation, yes. uh, we fully intend to retain our majority in the House, and we're on our path to do that. But it is absolutely essential that we uh, elect a Democratic Senate and, of course, absolutely essential that we elect a Democratic President of the United States, not from partisan reasons, but just from the standpoint of the air our children breathe, climate, uh, uh, jobs, uh, all the things about fairness and the rest. And, and an existential <laughs> threat to our democracy in terms of the Constitution of the United States. So it's about the Constitution. It's about the country, this beautiful land we love, which Constitution which they are not honoring, the beautiful land we love from sea to shining sea and beyond, degraded. Who we are as a nation, a nation of in, in, uh, immigrants denigrated. Our values, what they put forth in a in a uh, budget that they're giving tax breaks that benefit 83% benefit the top 1%, while they say, oh, well, we can offset that while we're cutting Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. I think we should have a bill on the floor that says we're for Medicaid cuts for all, because that is the Trump Republican mm -hmm. agenda. And let's see where they vote on that. So, <laughs> mischief. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have one quick last question, uh, but I just want to say, because I think this is a, an impo important moment for women, you are the highest ranking woman in the government today and actually in our history. Last week, Alabama passed an absolutely draconian abortion ban, and I'd just like to ask you, what do you say to women who are feeling scared about that and actually just feel shocked that in 2019 we are seeing backlash laws like this that really assault the dignity of women? And just in, if any words yeah. of wisdom for them. Well, uh, let me just say that I look down and downcast when somebody introduces me as the highest ranking women in the Senate because I just wish that designation would go away and that we would have a woman president of the United States. I never thought that this, I mean, really. So when people say that, I know it's supposed to be like a compliment or something, but to me, it's just a reminder. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, th I thank you for that recognition, but it doesn't make me happy that I am that. I wish we had a Democrat. I, yes, of course, a Democratic woman president. Uh, the, um, and, and then the issue about a woman's right to choose. Don't tell anybody I told you this. However... The reason the president is the president of the United States is because of the support that he has in certain elements of our population for the overturning Roe v. Wade. This is serious, this is dangerous, this is real. Three years ago next month, in June, when he was engaged in the primaries, he said he would choose his judges for the court from a certain list. That was the list that had the imprimatur of the pro-life agenda. I, I don't even like to give them that title, pro-life, because we're all pro-life, but mm -hmm. they took that title. So they, so just so they have their, their justices on the Supreme Court, and now they have two, now they have two, uh, means they're happy with him. So that's where we are. That is a very dangerous place, the Supreme Court, in my view. I still am hopeful, though, that... Uh, Justice Roberts might do the right thing. But I, I don't have, I just, the answer to every question is the same. Mobilize, mobilize, mobilize. The, our whole country changed when women decided to march. That was the transformative moment. Women marched, women ran, women voted, women won, women lead. And, and the people have to see. <clears throat> now, I just, I'll just end with this because for 30 years in the Congress, I have been making this case, and people didn't really believe me for the first 25, 26 years of it. This is about family planning. It's about birth control. This isn't about... They like to argue the case in some words that aren't true but are, are uh, alarming to people about... 
uh, abortions that must take place in the late term, the health of the mother, whatever it is, but they describe it terribly, and it has a market, and that's why they do it. But what women should know is this isn't just about that. It's about family planning and access to women's health. It's about in vitro fertilization to have babies, to have babies, which the church and some of these folks strenuously object to. So I think we, we cannot accept, uh, I mean, really, Alabama, but I was in Ohio last week, and they have a heartbeat bill, too. And what, does Missouri on its way to one, or does it have it already? Mm -hmm. This is a, this is bigger than, as big as that issue is, this is about lack of respect for women. This is about some fear that is in our community, our society, about women having the, the ability to have the t size and timing of their families, working with their husbands, with their doctors, with their God, whatever it is. But to, to just see it as a choice issue is one piece of it. It's about lack of respect, and it's reflected when they won't give equal pay for equal work or family um, a, a medical leave that really mostly benefits women and the rest. So I think that that March and then the, year, the next year and the rest scared some of these people. Good. Good. But we do have to fight some of the consequences of their fear. This is a, now I say that as someone, when I have this debate with my colleagues, I, I, when we, my husband and I brought our baby Alexandra home from the hospital, our oldest child, Nancy, Alexandra's our fifth child, our oldest child, Nancy, was turning six that week. <laughs> So I'm with the program. You know, I get the point. <laughs> and so I say to them, when you have five children in six years, we'll have a conversation about this. <laughs> Otherwise, you have no standing whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> to the point that when we had this debate, they said on the floor of the house, they said, Nancy Pelosi, and as I say this as a de very devout Catholic, practicing Catholic, it means a lot to me. It, it's part of who I am, my Catholic faith. But they sit on the floor of the house. Nancy Pelosi thinks she knows more about having babies than the Pope. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> really? Guys? But, you know, when you see, <laughs> when you see them lined up in the, in the floor of yeah. the house. Guys, 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 guys. Just white guys, 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 <laughs> signing for their discharge petition uh, in a way that is really doesn't even represent the truth of what they are putting down there. So do I have any, uh, I would just say, we don't agonize, we organize, and we cannot let this happen to the families of America. So. I think that is a great ending to our remarks. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Please welcome back Winnie Stackelberg. <laughs> Speaker Pelosi, what an incredible, timely and dynamic conversation. Please join me again in thanking Speaker Pelosi and Neera Tandon. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. If you please keep your seats, we've reached the time in our program with all of these, all of these ideas percolating. We need some fuel to help sustain us as we forge ahead. In other words, it's time to eat. But please, please remain in your seats so that staff can access the tables. And if you have a dietary restriction meal card, please place that on the table now. As you all know, the Center for American Progress is a think tank, a research institution that develops bold policy ideas based on rigorous analysis, data, and numbers. In fact, Speaker Pelosi talked about the incredible ideas that come out of CAP every single day. But at the Center for American Progress, we don't stop there. We know that given all the noise, in all the incoming that you face on a daily basis, 
We must work hard to communicate those ideas with stories, with images that connect our policy solutions to men, women, children, and families. Storytelling hasn't always been a part of think tanks, but it is an essential part of the Center for American Progress. So here's just a taste of some of the stories behind the crucial fights we're engaged in, from LGBTQ equality to disability justice, early childhood education, to one of the defining fights of our time, the fight to combat climate change. So please join me as we take a look at some of these videos that represent CAP's critical work to tell the story of the big, bold ideas. Thank you so very much. In 1974, the Equality Act was first introduced to try and comprehensively address the problem of discrimination against lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. This early version of the Equality Act wasn't perfect, but it recognized that people need protection from discrimination across every area of their life, in their workplaces and in their homes, and even while shopping on Main Street. It is unacceptable that in 2016 alone, one in four LGBTQ people experience discrimination. And that discrimination harms our health, our families, our communities, and our economy. As marriage equality became the law of the land, federal lawmakers were faced with a choice. Keep going one at a time, fighting the same fights, or return to that first bold idea of a comprehensive nationwide solution to the problem of discrimination. CAP worked with lawmakers and other LGBTQ advocates to push for that bold solution. Senator, is it your intention to introduce an Equality Act uh, in next Congress that bans discrimination in all these facets that you were just talking about? Yes. <laughs> if I failed to make that absolutely clear, I absolutely intend to introduce such an act. This week's historic passage of the Equality Act in the U.S. House of Representatives shows the power of our voices and our stories to make change. We have come so far since that first step 45 years ago, and we have much to celebrate. But we also have a lot more work to do to make real the promise of full equality under the law and to ensure that promise reaches every community. Please join us in making that a reality for all. Be on the right side of history, join the movement, and help fight to get the Equality Act signed into law. People will say, leave your feelings at home. That's very difficult to do sometimes because what this means to me is everything, everything. One in three Connecticut residents have some type of criminal record. Any record, no matter how old or minor, can stand in the way of jobs, housing, education, and more. For people like Roxburgh, the economic and emotional trauma can follow you for decades. My record dates back to 1987. I was arrested and I was a substance abuser. There was no counselor, there was no it was just me. In the decades after her release, Roxburgh got clean and tried to rebuild her life. She got her undergraduate degree in human services and tried to start her career. But at every turn, her record stood in her way. I went looking for jobs and every door that could possibly close was slammed in my face. When I began to do the social work, I learned that I couldn't get licensed. There is a waiver process, but it's designed to deter the employer because they're saying to the employer, this is who you're dealing with. Do you really want to deal with them? In order for me to measure up to what people who have my degree and credentials, in order for me to measure up financially, I have to work two full-time jobs. Roxbert started Connecticut's expedited expungement process that's supposed to let her have the career she's worked so hard to start. But she's been waiting six months. Now, my application sits as of yesterday, waiting for someone to take it. They've had my application since around the end of January completed successfully, but no one's said anything. A new bill introduced in Connecticut called the Clean Slate Act would make expungement for people like Roxburgh automatic after they remain crime-free for a set period of time. Then they can move on with their lives and provide for their families. What clean slate means to me, it means the world to me, because then 
I can celebrate and say I'm free. Roxbert has learned from her past, as Time Connecticut does too. Go to cleanslatecampaign.org to learn more. At CAP, we understand that disability rights are civil rights, and disability rights are also human rights. Disability justice is a very deliberate and intentional framework as a means of embracing difference, confronting privilege, and challenging what is considered quote unquote normal. It goes beyond the traditional notions of disability rights and really centers wholeness, interdependence, and intersectionality. Part of this community allows you to be in a position of strength. And so that's what we need to, that's the word that I think we need to spread in an, an attitude of like, don't look at me with pity. I earned this wheelchair and I own this wheelchair and I'm proud of it. And I'm going to use it to, you know, get places faster than you could ever run. How can we take it to another level? So what was really intentional about the movements that started to spark out today is that we said we're going to base it on a framework of intersectionality. And we're going to say that openly. If you don't center and think about people with disabilities explicitly, you will be doing bad right making, you will be less effective, you will not be thoughtful, you will not be thinking about all the populations you need to be solving for, and including many of the most marginalized people in, you know, in any community you're solving for. Not only progressive groups need to work with um, disability groups, but I think also disability groups need to reach out to, to communities of color and show a real partnership in, in, in spreading our work and showing coalition building um, in, in a real manner that, that, that builds relationships and that builds trust between communities. We have been talking a lot about the Disability Integration Act, um, making sure that people with disabilities um, have the home and community-based services that, that they need as an alternative to, to institutions. And so that's what we need to do for the ADA. They're coming to try to dismantle it. They're trying to weaken it. No, we mass our fires as a group and we push back and we push back and we enhance and expand the ADA. That's what we need to do. One out of every five Americans are people with disabilities. That's why every issue is a disability issue. Join the conversation at hashtag disability at CAP and at Cap Disability. Leave me now If I told you I got caught up in a wave Almost gave it away Would you hear me out If I told you I was terrified for days Thought I was gonna break Whoa.
I didn't understand why more and more students were coming in with health issues, anywhere from asthma to cancer. I didn't understand why I had more kids with ADHD. Learning disabilities are part of the side effects of pesticides in this area. Or pyrophos, a pesticide some studies suggest may be damaging to a child's brain. Children exposed prenatally to the pesticide had increased odds of developmental and attention disorder. The Obama administration was trying to ban it, but now the Trump administration is putting the brakes on that. The CEO of Dow Chemical, the maker of the pesticide, seen here with the president, applauded the decision. Dow Chemical had donated $1 million to Trump's inauguration fund. I've been teaching 22 years and I've seen what pesticides have done to my students. I've learned that chlorpyrifos was um, used as in war, World War II, a nerve agent. The great majority of our students' parents work out in the ag fields. A lot of them worked while they were pregnant, while not knowing the consequences. We've had reports where entire crews have gone to the hospital. The decision to ban chlorpyrifos was made based on scientific evidence. The current administration ignored everything about that science and those studies. My second graders understand science and evidence and make decisions based on that evidence. I don't see any reason why chlorpyrifos should not be banned. Unfortunately, it's not being banned because the current administration, they care more about profits than people. We need to protect our children. We need to protect our communities. Please welcome back Winnie Stackelberg. We have the distinct honor of welcoming to the stage a fearless leader with an unflinching commitment to progressive values, America's only sitting Latina governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham of New Mexico. In, in 2019, her first year, Governor Lujan Grisham, her accomplishments include expanding background checks for gun sales, creating the Early Childhood Department, proposing a historic K-12 funding increase, and increasing the minimum wage for all New Mexicans. And that's just in her first year. She's just getting started. <laughs> Governor Lujan Grisham has fought tirelessly to oppose the Trump administration's assault against many of our nation's most vulnerable people. She has boldly called out Donald Trump for his charade of border fear mongering. And she has advanced a more compassionate vision, strengthening our nation's immigration system. We are so grateful that she could join us here today. So please welcome with me Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank, I don't know who's yelling back there, but I love that. So you just keep that coming. Uh, and in my state, uh, my uh, very my inaugural address, I uh, declared throughout New Mexico, and I needed to do it for every place in the country that the podiums should be shorter. <laughs> right? I am, in fact, the shortest governor in the country. I was the shortest member of Congress, uh, and uh, I make up for all of those aspects by being incredibly long-winded. So I don't know why they would have me come in the afternoon, but I do wanna say thank you for just giving me this opportunity. And as I start, uh, I hope, navigating through a variety of issues, uh, this is an organization that makes a difference, not just for Democrats with an agenda to get things done for the people who need us, but to create an environment where you're thinking about the newest efforts uh, that you can start to uh, demonstrate in your state. So I want to thank you all very much for those efforts and give you a sense about how they're taking shape in my state. Now, Winnie talked a little bit about the border. So, of course, uh, I'm one of the... Uh, 
uh, very few handful border state governors who don't get to engage in immigration policy. And on the one hand, I'm actually going to say, okay, Trump administration, you are accurate about one thing. And of all the stuff they're working on, I do think it's only one thing. Immigration is a federal issue. They are right about that, which makes this even more challenging and difficult because they have abdicated in every context their responsibility in day-to-day -day immigration enforcement, immigration support, and are in, uh, creating the kinds of humanitarian crises that governors like me are now dealing with at the border with absolutely no productive federal support, and I'm taking advantage of my time here in Washington by going to the Department of Homeland Security and re-explaining to them uh, that they must do their job. So I want to give you a couple of highlights. One, my state was one of the states when this administration said, look, we'd like to militarize the border. They were very clear about that. They weren't interested in uh, some security leveraging. They weren't interested in looking at whether or not uh, we could en enhance security using right state-of-the-art efforts with drones and cameras in areas where we know we have high risk. They weren't interested in putting personnel at ports of entry, make sure that our trade uh, was working responsibly, but also looking for nefarious activity, which is where most of that occurs in border states, is at ports of entry. It's also where you should present, right, if you're an asylum seeker. But what they wanted is the presence of a military operation to build an agenda, not just potentially in the country, but an agenda for Congress to support their national declaration of an emergency. Now, that happened before I got to be governor of a great border state. All right, so I've been to the border many times. I've seen many of these operations from the nonprofit side, uh, and uh, I've been to uh, at least six detention sites between California and all the way through to Texas. So I wanted to see what my hundred men and women who are incredible people are doing at the border in New Mexico. All right, so within the first three weeks of being sworn into office, I visit the border, and it's before the surge of asylum seekers. Um, clear to me that they're not doing any of the work, even though they're incredible professionals, that would make a difference along the border. And in fact, there was no information about any impact they had on nefarious activity, screening, security operations, uh, any of it. What they were doing is helping with maintenance of vehicles, which is important, except they weren't using any of those vehicles. And the best demonstration I could get from Incredible, I don't blame the guard, but just in terms of what they were doing, was that we're good economic development for these local communities because we're living here now and present. Well, the last time I checked, uh, A, we don't use the National Guards in our states for economic development, and two, I don't think we should be militarizing the border. So I would thank you. So first governor to pull back troops uh, after they were uh, asked for by the president, not going to engage in, in militarizing the border. But like every debate, including the debate about gun violence, when we message evidence-based strategies that reduce gun violence and reduce risk from background checks to extreme risk protection orders, People buy guns. The NRA creates messaging that creates more risk. We try to navigate that productively and responsibly. Well, the same thing is happening at the border. So every time the federal government and the Trump administration says, we're building a wall and we're closing the border, two things happen. Additional panic about getting to the United States occurs and it's also a message to nefarious activity that they have access points that have increased as well. Both are occurring. So for a let's deal with crime federal administration, they're doing less on that front for border states 
than they've ever done any administration, and they're creating panic at the border. So we do, in fact, have a humanitarian crisis, and the federal government, I know that you will be shocked, and I think you probably already know this, right? They have 2,000 positions that Congress has paid for that they will not fill. Many of those positions belong in Customs and Border Patrol and ICE agents in my state, along aspect is to take asylum seekers at the ports of entry. They will not do that. And even if they let a few folks in, it's automatic detention if that's where you're coming, which means we then re-engage in potential family separation, depending upon what's going on at any of these shelters or detention sites. So the better way, you can't get through, and now 100% of the time, it wasn't 100%, now 100% of the time, Instead of the Custom and Border Patrol agents receiving asylum seekers, doing the work that they're supposed to do to screen them for any, a multitude of issues, including getting them ready to get to a sponsor family. And when they do that, they then give them the ICE. Those are the internal agents and enforcement. And then ICE is responsible for moving a population into sponsor family states and communities. Instead, and they have transportation to do that. And you should also know asylum seekers, their sponsor families pay for the travel costs. So this whole notion that public entities or states like mine are paying for that is false. It's a false narrative by the federal government. But now what's happening as hundreds every single day are coming across ICE does not have any engagement with them, which means, and they're the ones that are trained to help solve some of the transportation issues and do the secondary screening. The Customs and Border Patrol agents get as many as they can into as many vehicles as they can, and they're taking them to tiny communities in states like mine. And to put that in perspective, 6,000 asylum seekers have now uh, uh, been placed in a variety of places in New Mexico on their way someplace else. And in communities at the border, like a place called Deming in New Mexico, that can be as high as high on any given day, between five and 10% of the total population of that community. And so it does two things in my state shows that Americans and New Mexicans are incredible people who can lift up and respond irrespective of the challenges, and it also creates Meals. I'll be talking to beleaguered, tired, hungry women and their, and their toddlers. They need a quick health care screen. They have colds. And if we don't treat those colds, they lose their lives because they're three. And they've been traveling a thousand miles. They're dehydrated. By the time they get to the border, they have absolutely nothing left, including shoes. This is 
a crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis. This country, the federal government, should be spending real money to stop the surge in a productive, fair, meaningful way, meeting the constitutional requirements for asylum seekers, supporting states like mine, and then they absolutely should do the security around the border because I'm doing that now too in my state, which means my state police are responding. So we can do it. We are doing it. We will continue to lead in the absence of a federal government, but I will continue to fight. And while all of that is going on, creating that tension, you might be shocked to learn that New Mexico is on the move. And in fact, and I hate to use this, but I'm going to anyway, because it's fire season. We're on fire. All right, in a good way, we are on fire. So these distractions in terms of messaging, not distractions on the ground, cannot allow leaders like you or leaders like me from not doing the work that makes a difference. How many of you knew that in January, New Mexico was on the last, last place on any list? Public health, education, social determinants, poverty, hunger, the economy, you name a list, if it was a good one, we were at the bottom of that list. Guess where we are today? We're one of the states that moved minimum wage. It's now going to be $12 an hour. It's going to go a dollar a year, uh, although in state government it's going to happen all at once because I'm a very impatient, short 60-year-old woman, and that must happen right now. Two. We are the third largest oil and gas producer in the country. At the same time, we are now leading the country in pivoting to renewable energy with the most aggressive renewable portfolio. We passed a law that says we will be carbon free by 2045, including rural electric co-ops with the first ever in the country equity fund that goes directly to workers who are impacted in the fossil fuel industry. And about, oh, three weeks after that bill was signed into law, we said we we would beat that by five years. So instead of 2045, it's 2040 because you got to keep moving. Number one in the country. We have now diversified our economies in ways they said would take years. We've been announcing hundreds of jobs every week, including New Mexico will be the first country and the first place on the globe to have commercial space flight occur. We're the only place in the world that's got an inland spaceport with three companies located and a huge announcement about Virgin Galactic and in fact the very first photo taken from space showing our big beautiful world was taken from New Mexico in 1947. This is where stuff is happening on the ground. It's amazing. And hemp, we're the first state to do hemp growing research and manufacturing. From soup to nuts, it's all occurring, announcing companies that are already on the ground, hiring hundreds of New Mexicans. We've decided that instead of 50th in public education, we're going to go for a moonshot. We've decided that every other state should get out of our way. We'll be number one in the country, single large set of investments, New Mexico last legislative session, from teacher raises to extended days during the summer to make sure we don't lose kids between those classes with serious mentoring and day-to-day -day support, including community schools, as a statewide reform so that we're lifting up every single family and that our at-risk students and uh, our uh, bilingual language learners will get the attention they deserve. My golly, New Mexico, Spanish is a our official language. How is it that Spanish speakers struggle in New Mexico? Outrageous. No more. Gone. Done. And you can't do it unless you have early childhood education. We're going to get to universal early childhood education. We said we wanted $285 million in five years. Well, you know, I just said I was impatient. Let's see if we can't get to universal. Dominic, I want it in three years. 
We're on our way. We got tens of millions. We're creating uh, one of the first of its kind, a department moving over every single, not just the educational part, but making sure, and I want folks to hear this quick story, and I know that I'm out of time. Uh, it's now blinking at me. I don't know what happens when that happens. I'm a little nervous. But I, I, I told this story a ton while I was testifying in our legislature about why we needed early childhood education. If you want to change the paradigm in a state that's long been plagued by poverty and loses our kids in any number of ways, then you better be serious that that's a priority and we better invest not just in early childhood education, although it's pivotal, but be clear, right, that that prenatal to, to, to grave, we have to have a system of support and care for our families, focusing on children. Now, I've got a 30, I think she's 33. I don't think she likes it when I tell people how old she is. Uh, and she has a almost four-year-old and a seven-month-old. And she's in a great situation. I mean, she has me as a mom. That's good. She might argue that point, actually. Uh, she lives near me and other family members. She's got a, a, a husband who's supportive and can assist in the day-to-day, -day, both working, so part of a breadwinner, and help with the kids. Uh, and they make sufficient income that they can pay privately for both child care and early childhood education, even though it's a huge struggle in their situation. So they're already in a position that too many New Mexicans envy and aren't finding themselves today. And then she told me this story, and I'm appalled. So my daughter gets up in the morning, this will sound familiar to every parent in the room, gets up an hour earlier than you want to because you gotta get those kids up ready and packed for school. Only that's not what happens, she takes them to childcare. And they both go to the same place, which took months of waiting and navigating and uh, many late nights of worrying about whether that was ever going to happen or they're going to have two different places. Now this, because both kids go, is not an education aspect. It's child care assistance, very important. And then she goes to work. She's at work for two hours, and then she must travel all the way across town to pick up the three now almost four-year-old. Then they have to go and they miss snacks, they miss lunch, they miss naps. Now they gotta go across town to a early childhood education center. Then my daughter drives back to work. She's at work for two hours and she has to drive across town again, pick up the four-year-old. Now she's missed the second nap and the snack. She's gotta figure that out and drive back to childcare. Then she has to drive back to work because she's missed work she has to stay into the next shift at work, and then her husband picks up both those kids and is on his own instead of participating like a family. Five days a week, with no end in sight, kindergarten's still a year away, and even then, it'll be more complicated because we're one of those states where it's not automatic that you're gonna get, it's coming, full day kindergarten. How can we be doing this as a country and as a society to our children and to our families, and I just gave you the best case scenario in my state. And so, that is a thing of the past. Fixed, resolved, universal, early childhood education, full day, wherever you need it, in whatever context, and we're small enough that we can get that done in a minute. So, my message to you today, and I didn't hit every single thing we got done in this session. We also put, took care of working families and uh, enhanced that tax credit. We did so many progressive things that will make a difference over generations of New Mexicans while we were dealing with public safety, humanitarian crisis, and other issues. We all, we all pass all those gun safety laws. And so the point is this, these are not mutually exclusive and we must stand up and show by example that we can respond and protect ourselves from a federal government that is unwilling to do its job and it's doing that on purpose and you can make a difference in the lives of our day-to-day -day citizens and they expect both not one or the other, and in New Mexico, they're getting it. And I hope with your help, that's gonna be the experience with every Democratic leader in every state in the nation. I thank you very much for your support. I thank you for this afternoon, and I really appreciate your attention and time. Thank you.
please welcome to the stage CAPS EVP of Policy, Jacob Liebenlift. Thank you. Let's give one more round of applause for Governor Lujan Grisham. So it's my privilege to be here and introduce our next panel, which will delve into the urgent challenge of climate change. Since the beginning of the Trump administration, the president and his allies have prioritized the interests of big polluters, sabotaged climate research, and undermined America's role as a global leader on climate change, even as we experience the real life consequences of an action every day. Progressives recognize that our country must address this crisis with speed and with bold solutions because our planet depends on it. As Speaker Pelosi mentioned earlier today, just two weeks ago, the House passed the Climate Action Now Act, which would prevent President Trump from withdrawing from the Paris Climate Agreement. This is the first piece of major climate legislation passed by the House in 10 years, but it is only the start of what we need. During our next panel, we'll hear from courageous leaders who understand what is at stake when it comes to the climate crisis and who are willing to put forward solutions to address it at all levels, federal, state, and local. So with that, I have the pleasure of turning it over to Emily Holden, a climate and energy reporter for The Guardian who will moderate this important conversation and would like to welcome our panelists, Senator Brian Schatz of Hawaii, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes of Wisconsin, and Tom Steyer, founder of NextGen America. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. So uh, we essentially know that uh, while the science has been giving us warnings about how bad the climate crisis is for some time, uh, it's, it's getting clearer and clearer about how little time we have left to start to solve the problem. So most recently, the UN scientists, uh, some of the world's best scientists, put out a report saying that we have 12 years to, to limit warming to moderate levels. That's now a little bit closer to 11 years. Um, and Senator Schatz, can, can you start us out with talking about how you see that science comparing to the current political environment uh, right now from, from where you're seeing it in the Senate, but also where it could be in the next few years, depending on the, the outcome of the 2020 presidential election? Well, I think the politics is finally catching up with the science. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, two things. First of all, we need scale, we need magnitude, and we need sustained effort. So as much as everybody thinks that they should pass uh, you know, a carbon fee or cap and trade or a renewable portfolio standard nationally or whatever individual piece of legislation it is, uh, we need to understand that this is going to be a sustained effort to uh, transform the American economy and transform the global economy, which means it won't be just one bill. And if we frame it as though it's one bill, even the best bill will be a failure and the worst bills will cause us to throw up our, uh, our hands. And so we need to understand that this is a sustained effort to literally change our economy over time. And what has happened is young people recognize the threat. And young people have the moral authority that comes only from an intention to stay on this planet for another 60 or 70 years. And they're demanding action from all of us. So over just the last six months, I've seen the politics start to match the urgency of the scientific situation. So you're on the, the Senate Select Committee on Climate Change. Uh, from what you understand from that, or from that committee on what it would take to match what scientists are saying is necessary, do you think that we're seeing the 2020 presidential candidates put out plans that are to that level that you're, you're talking about so far? Yes, uh, and here's the thing. I, I personally favor, of course, everyone favors their own bill. Um, I favor the bill that uh, Sheldon Whitehouse and I have uh, introduced for a carbon fee, I think it's the best way to go. But that's not what I'm looking for, is whether or not someone's individual bill matches up with, with my legislative uh, approach. What I'm looking for is scale, ambition, seriousness, and a recognition that it's not about what we pass in 2021, it's about what we do in 2022 and from then on. So whether we're doing the Water Resources Development Act or whether the president uh, is doing a bilateral meeting with China or whether we're doing uh, reauthorization of the Lacey Act and dealing with the deforestation or whether states and counties uh, and private sector actors are uh, making the moves in the right direction, no one thing is going to solve this problem 
all of the things together are going to solve this problem. And so I'm looking for presidential candidates that understand that this has to be a sustained effort over time. Sure, the first bill and the first proposal has to be up to it, but we shouldn't mistake that for the whole fight. And so essentially what we've seen rolled out so far, we know that uh, the Washington governor, Jay Inslee, has a plan for uh, uh, carbon neutrality by 2045. We know that Beto O'Rourke has a plan for carbon neutrality by 2045. Um, but we basically just have those, those big outlines. Inslee has some more kind of markers along the way of how to get there. Uh, Tom, you were, you were speaking a little bit earlier when we were chatting about um, kind of what you, your impression has been of how people are thinking about the scale of this, this problem at some of the conferences you've been at recently. Can you tell us if you think people are, are really understanding what's necessary? Well, I think what Brian is talking about and what the UN study showed is that there's urgency. And I asked somebody who I think is the best climate engineer in the United States to express for me how to think about what we need to do by 2030 to avoid what the UN describes as catastrophic levels of um, global warming, which would be two degrees Celsius. And what he said was, as a globe, we need to reduce our carbon emissions every year by 32% by 2030. And currently, they're going up by about 1.5% over the last 5 to 10 years. So when you think about what that means and what Brian's talking about in terms of how much of a change, the easiest way for, that I think of this is that's how much we need to change that much of our capital stock, whether it's cars or power plants or industrial plants every single year, which is much more than you'd normally replace on a normal schedule. Mm -hmm. So the question you asked Brian was, does the political response reach the level of, the, of urgency that this problem poses for our society and our globe? And I would say, if you look at, we're starting to see competition between Democratic candidates for president to see who can have the biggest smartest program, which I think is great. But I think what, we're, what we have to face is there's an urgency in terms of time. If we get this right in 2045, that just doesn't work. So I think when we think about is it uh, sufficient, the plans are large, the plans are gonna get larger. And I think the two things I'd say are, one, given what Brian said about how comprehensive a change this is gonna be for our society, I don't think you can think about a climate or an energy program, because it has to be integrated into every other part of the way that you think about government in the United States of America. That's the first thing. This is not a climate or an energy program. This is a program that goes across employment and health and everything else. And the second thing is about timing. If we have the right idea, but we can't implement it in time, it's not just what happens in the United States. It's secondly, I don't think we can miss the extremely important point that if the United States wants to lead globally, we have to start by doing the right thing ourselves so that we can lead globally in the way that President Obama did to get the kind of global cooperation since this is a global question. So an answer to your, the short answer to your question, Emily, with that extremely long preamble is, this is lift. It, it's gonna require a gigantic effort of will. And I think it's up in the air whether in fact we can summon that will in time. Well, and with the political schedule here in the U.S., it would take us a bit more time, a few more years, to get to the point where a new president could be in office, starting to work on these things, working with Congress to pass something. Um, and there's the possibility that there won't be a new president in office. Um, so what do we think could happen in that case? What do we think that Congress might be able to achieve under a second term Trump presidency? And what, what might we see from states? I know... Lieutenant Governor Mandela, Wisconsin has, uh, Mandela Barnes, excuse me, has, has recently joined the, the Climate Alliance. W what does that mean for Wisconsin and how quickly can you get your state's efforts off the ground to, to limit emissions? Yeah, so it means a lot for Wisconsin. Unfortunately, we have a very hostile legislature that's not on board. Uh, but with that said, states like Wisconsin, states like Michigan, uh, and also Minnesota and Illinois, uh, as part of the Great Lakes region, uh, we have a similar set of values. And knowing that we're together on this issue to move forward on the climate issue, uh, where our legislature doesn't act, we have an opportunity 
uh, with local government. And the local government has a huge role to play. And you mentioned that politics is caught up to the science. Well, you know, economics is also caught up to the science as well. And I think that's the more important part because unfortunately, we are where we are because economics has led the conversation of our politics. And so with that being said, now you look at mayors in small to medium-sized towns, even larger cities, uh, see that there is money to be saved if we change the way that we generate energy, meaning that our public spaces should be more energy efficient. That means buildings that are being put up with new uh, tax credits for low-income housing, that's a wonderful opportunity. If we're going to, as a state, if we're putting money up, then there should be an energy efficiency component to that, uh, to all our new buildings. We shouldn't be building anything, any new buildings that aren't energy efficient. And we also have to pay attention to communities that are adversely impacted by climate change. If you look at mm -hmm. communities of color, oftentimes feel the impact 10 times worse than other communities, uh, whether it's mining, whether it's coal burning power plants, the list goes on. And we need to make sure that every community is also part of the conversation uh, because there can be unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's kind of, that's another reason why we are where we are and why communities have been so adversely impacted because they haven't had a seat at the table. And so I'm proud to be uh, helping lead this work and in my state because we have a role to play. The federal government, Trump pulled us out of the Paris Climate Accord. However, I think there's enough energy in the states to make meaningful movement. Uh, in the same way that absent of our legislature, I think that our large, well, I don't think, I know that our biggest cities in the state of Wisconsin, our largest towns, uh, they, they are composed of a majority of the people of the state of Wisconsin. We can have more significant movement. And so we can do this without the legislature. And there's room to do that. Can I, so and your, your administration is starting a sustainability office. And just yep. briefly, what sort of things might you do to make sure that the kind of communities that you're talking about are going to be involved in that process and in the goal for, uh, for carbon-free electricity by 2050 that Wisconsin, is, has, has your administration has talked about. Yeah, and so with that being said, there wasn't already an office that exists. We're looking to move that office. It had been dormant for the last eight years. If you don't know who our old governor was, uh, this, wasn't, this wasn't an issue that he, did, that he paid particular uh, attention to. I mean, we were one of those states where the words climate change was scrubbed from state websites. Our Department of Natural Resources, uh, you know, scientists, either they were retiring or they were leaving early because they couldn't do the work uh, that they dedicated their lives to. Uh, so with that being said, this new Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy is going to uh, be tasked with making sure that we are uh, at that goal, you know, uh, yes, 2050. It is a long time from now. However, it's one of those things where I feel like you get to a point where you get to uh, 25, 35 percent, the wheels start moving a little bit faster. Because at that point, it becomes uh, the more economically viable way to generate energy. Uh, so with that said, uh, we have to make sure that our state buildings, we are leading by example, uh, state-owned buildings are going to be more energy efficient. And we have to have an office to oversee that work, sort of uh, lead an energy agency council to make sure that the state uh, is a leader in that work. Also making sure that, you know, whether it's the Wisconsin Housing Economic Development Association that gives out those tax credits, uh, whether it's, you know, looking at our capital budget and construction on campuses, uh, that is where we can have the biggest impact. And that is what that office uh, is going to lead on. That's how that office is going to be effective. And like in a Michigan, for example, uh, they have a public advocate office uh, or they have a public advocate position in their office of environmental justice. I mean, that's where the conversation is right now. And it's exciting to see candidates see who can be the boldest on climate change right now. Uh, it's unfortunate that we are in this climate crisis that we're in, uh, but it is great to see so many people paying attention to it. And if you're not on the right side of the climate justice fight, you are going to be on likely the losing side of an election. Well, let me just add something about climate justice because mm -hmm. the lieutenant governor is really hitting on something critically important for the movement. And I, I consider myself a member of the climate movement since, you know, since adulthood. And um, one of the flaws in the movement is we have not been inclusive. It has been primarily uh, people on the coasts and people who were configuring solutions that were largely technocratic um, that could have ended up being derivatives or some kind of financial instrument traded on Wall Street. And both as policy and as politics, that was a failure. Um, there, there has to be a paint a picture and paint me in it. So if you're going to do this, what do I get for this? Because I understand climate change in the abstract is an important priority, but how do I benefit, right? If, I, if I'm in a rural area in Wisconsin, or if I'm in Milwaukee, or if I'm in Detroit, or if I'm in rural West Virginia, what do I get out of this? And that's not a sort of secondary 
thing that we trade once we're in conference committee, which is the way it used to be thought of, is like, well, how do we kind of like deal with the fact that there's going to be dislocation? We have to start as an organizing principle with communities of color and people who are disproportionately impacted by these environmental problems. And especially in this kind of intersectional progressive movement, the climate movement has to catch up to that and recognize that young people and people of color have to be at the core of the movement for moral reasons, uh, but also for practical political reasons. So, so let me say one thing about this. In California, we've been doing this for a long time. And we have the most progressive energy laws in the world. And if you look as recently as 2017, when we reauthorized cap and trade, which was a year long, very difficult fight, it started with exactly where Mandela started and what Brian's talking about, which is how is this going to work for the people in the poorest districts in this state? And in fact, the reauthorization of cap and trade in California was led by legislators from the very poorest uh, legislative districts. And the answer was that A, as Mandela said, they were disproportionately hurt by pollution. So the money we raised from cap and trade went disproportionately to their residents and their communities to mitigate for that and to pay back for that. Second of all, there's always been a huge jobs component. It, it's a question of who gets those jobs, but that in fact we have over 500,000 jobs in California on clean energy. But Brian's point is the critical point, which is, you can't get there at the end. You have, to, before, you have to be there at the very beginning and have leadership so that the coalition is completely different. And I'll finish by saying one thing, which I think I said here in 2010, which is the number one group in America that cares about energy, climate, pollution, the environment is Latinos. The number two group is African Americans. And the number three group is Asian Americans. So when we think about what this coalition looks like, who should be leading it, where, you know, kind of how we should be thinking about it. Let's remember that there's a very inaccurate vision in America about who cares about the environment. It's in some ways very disrespectful, but it's certainly unsuccessful and incomplete. Yeah, and, and, and I can say one quick thing too, because you know, in Wisconsin, most of our energy is generated from coal. We don't have any coal in Wisconsin. We don't have any oil in Wisconsin. We are literally just sending money, $12 billion annually out of state, which is probably a small number for California. Uh, but that's still $12 billion annually we send out of the state of Wisconsin. And you know, there's also one thing we should consider too when we talk about clean energy, because there are forms of clean energy that are negatively impacting some communities too, like hydroelectric in, in, in Canada. You know, First Nation communities have been you know, their, their land has been taken over, uh, essentially, to generate hydroelectric energy. So we got to be very conscious. And that's, again, why we have to have all uh, communities at the table. And when I say cities, towns, and villages, that also means tribal communities. So we haven't mentioned it yet, but what you're talking about touches on a lot of what you see in the proposal for the Green New Deal, which at this point is, I like to call it a vision, right? It's not legislation yet. It's technically a resolution that a lot of members of Congress have signed on to. Uh, but it seems to have reframed the discussion around not what will you give up to fight climate change, but what could you gain from fighting climate change and what could communities gain? But I, I wanna ask, I wanna come back to this question of the, the politics catching up to the science, right? Because getting to something like a Green New Deal would mean that the politics would have to catch up to the science. There would have to be agreement on this underlying problem existing and it being a, a crisis at the, the scale that scientists say that we're approaching. Um, so this morning I was watching a House Natural Resources subcommittee hearing uh, where Republicans um, called witnesses who are very well known climate change deniers. That's what all of their work is to talk about the benefits that, that they see in higher carbon dioxide levels. And we know that's not true of all Republicans. Many Republicans are acknowledging climate change as a threat and talking about what can be done, although the ideas look very different than Democrats. But there are still a lot of Republicans who are, who are in that space. So how, how, do you, how do you work with people who are in that space? How quickly do you think it could change? Um, and, and especially um, with the sorts of things that we're talking about, even with a, a Democrat for president, legislation would be required. So how do you, how do you get legislation passed with that, with that political hurdle? We have to win. Uh, we have to win next year. And, and I, I, that is... There are a lot of sort of procedural forks in the road, and there are a lot of tactical decisions to be made in 2021 if Senator Schumer is the, is the leader of the United States Senate. 
Um, there are parliamentary questions, there are questions related to reconciliation and the filibuster and all of that, and including policy questions about whether we're going to do, you know, a, a national RPS or, or a carbon fee or a Green New Deal or whatever, but all of that is moot if we don't win. And so uh, I am not interested in spending too much time negotiating with climate deniers. There are a few uh, Republicans in the Congress that have come around on this, but now is not the time to try to cut a deal with them while Mitch McConnell leads the Senate. We have to focus all of our energies, all of our energies, uh, towards setting the table so that we can be successful in the next election. And then we know that we're still at the beginning of the process because the difficulty here, and I'll just mention one fight we had, which was Keystone, which was a nice galvanizing moment. The problem with Keystone was when Keystone was finally rejected, lots of activists felt like they had solved something. And what we need is a sustained effort to fix this problem over decades, which means first we have to win, and then we need to legislate, and then we've taken one step up a very, very high mountain, but we gotta start. So not every Democratic candidate, though, is going to propose an ambitious, sweeping plan for dealing with climate change. And a lot of the questions currently are about what we could see from former Vice President Joe Biden after um, a story circulated about uh, his uh, potential to take a sort of middle-of-the-road approach that could include fossil fuels still. So uh, what happens then if you, you know, if, if you either have a Trump presidency or you have a Democrat in the White House who's might not, I'm not saying this is the case for this particular person, but might not have climate change as their first priority. Um, I'll say it this way somewhat diplomatically because all of my friends are running for uh, president and that's probably the reason I'm on this couch. Um, uh, uh, and, that, and that is, I do not think we will have a uh, presidential nominee who has insufficient ambition on climate. I do not think that that will happen. And um, I do not, I, you know, I'm not gonna sit there and, and sort of rank order, someone will, but I'm not gonna rank all of the climate plans. Someone uh, did that in my inbox earlier someone today. Someone already actually, did that, yes. I'm sure. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure the candidates themselves are ranking uh, the, the, the plans. But I will just say that I, I can't imagine that we will have a nominee that is um, uh, not up to this task because I think we understand this is the challenge of a generation and because voters are demanding it. I think that we have time for a very brief audience question. Question, not statement, please. If you raise your hand, there are microphones going around. The, the, this gentleman in the front here. Thank you. Hi, uh, John Vane. Most climate models, depending on which ones you believe, suggest that if we cut off greenhouse emissions today, that the planet's going to still heat for between 50 and 300 years. What that tells me is not that we shouldn't try to decrease emissions, but unless we develop technologies that will extract carbon from the atmosphere and the oceans and sequester it, we're in deep trouble. So what actions are you guys looking to advance those technologies? I'll just be quick on that. I think, um, I think carbon capture has to be part of the equation. I think even the people who advocate for carbon capture are imagining that it'll deal with about 1% of the carbon. And so, but that's not to argue against it because you could sort of make the same argument about conservation and efficiency and restoration of ecosystems and wind and solar. Nothing is enough. Nothing is enough. Only if you do all of the things uh, is it enough. We have the same conversation, especially on Twitter about, well, if you're not for nuclear, you're not really for climate action. My view is we should do all of the things and none of those things are gonna be enough, but all of them together uh, will save the planet. I mean, the, the obvious one that people talk a lot about is not just de ending deforestation, but using reforestation, yeah. different agricultural techniques in terms of putting carbon back into the soil that has systematically been taken out of it over the last 400 years in North America. And those are things that actually make a huge difference on a short-term basis, you know, meaning 40 years, but that give us room to develop the techniques on a cost-effective basis. Because the issue about carbon capture, there are many practical issues that Brian's indirectly you know, referring to in terms of cost, storage, and size of the project, which is immense. So when we think about this, the most obvious thing we can do is to restore nature's ways of sequestering carbon, as, and that's something that can happen you know, reasonably significant and reasonably quickly. 
Yeah, and just like you said, there's not one thing. It's going to take a collection of everything. It's going to take a collection of every community uh, being involved and being integrated into this work. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned, too, like the soil remediation, because there is a tremendous role for our agriculture community to play, uh, especially with carbon capture, whether in biodigestion or biodigestion as well. Uh, it, it, in you know communities where uh, you know where there's new building construction going on, a lot of our downtown areas are, they are starting to boom all across the country. You can use circular economy tactics where we again connect communities that are far away from each other in idea and in distance, uh, but however share uh, common ideas and also uh, a space for them to work together in ways they could have never imagined before. I think we're about at time, but can we very quickly do a little lightning round here? If you can each tell me in like one sentence. What is something that you see being developed right now, policy or otherwise, that really gives you hope that the world will be able to meet this challenge? You want me to start? Sure. You're looking sure. At me. One sentence. Uh, the key to this will be a broad coalition of Americans understanding what we're trying to accomplish together, both in terms of energy, but more broadly, how it fits into a positive vision for the future. And I'll use the conversation we had uh, backstage about infrastructure. Uh, this is the real infrastructure conversation that we should be having. Uh, anytime people talk about infrastructure, it should, could absolutely uh, be based on green infrastructure as well. The thing that makes me most excited and most hopeful is young people demanding action. And I think a lot of people in this room, and certainly the three of us <laughs> on this panel, have been working on climate for a long time. And I like the pressure. I like people coming to me and saying, well, it's nice that you've been working on this for 20 years, but how's that been going? And, um, and, and you're not doing enough. And I think we all need to recognize we have not been doing enough. And there's a generation of people that are demanding that as much as we've been working on this, that it hasn't been getting it done, and we've got to get it done very shortly. Well, you heard him. Senator Schatz wants all the young people in his office. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Please welcome back Daniela Gibbs Leger. Hello, everyone. We can do better than that. Hello, everyone. There we go. I now have the pleasure of welcoming our next speaker, the former mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu. During a 30 year career in public service, Mayor Landrieu has fought tirelessly to expand opportunity for people in his home city and all across Louisiana. And during his tenure as mayor, he garnered national attention for delivering an eloquent, unflinching, and impassioned speech upon removing four Confederate monuments from public spaces in his city. We're so glad that he could be here to reflect upon his experience as a progressive leader. So please help me welcome the Honorable Mitch Landrieu. Wow, how's everybody doing? Nice to see you. Thank you for that wonderful and very nice applause. I, uh, I was asked to talk today about the issue of race. Um, so first, I want to thank them for giving me the easy topic of the day. My first observation for all of you, I think, to John and to Nira and, and the CAP crew and to all of those who are with us today is that you can't really uh, talk about race without talking about America. And you certainly can't talk about America without talking about freedom or liberty or race because they all seem to be inextricably linked. And the first recognition is that this country was born uh, in contradiction uh, from our inception. And it has uh, plagued us for a long period of time. Uh, as you know, I just finished 30 years of a tour of duty in public service in our country, 16 years as a state legislator, six as a lieutenant governor, uh, and eight serving my beloved city and our hometown, the city of New Orleans, one of the great cities in the world. It is a city that, as you know, has suffered a tremendous tragedy and triumph, from the BP oil spill to Katrina to Rita to Ike to Gustav, the National Recession. We wondered when the locusts were coming, but we've been figuratively to hell and back. Uh, but we are a city whose great contradictions are manifest. Our incredible beauty, our diversity. We actually, in a very special way, personify uh, one of our nation's mottos, e pluribus unum, 
out of many, we are one. New Orleans is a 300-year-old city where everything that we hold dear, uh, our jazz, our architecture, our gumbo, the rest of our music, our way of life is actually created by throwing everything into the pot, different cultures, different tastes. And when it comes out, the sum is always better than its individual parts. It's a uniquely American city where we are constantly reaching for more, for that perfect union that we all aspire to be. And sometimes, although it's felt far from our reach, we keep pushing, we keep reaching, we keep striving for more because of that insatiable desire for more or for better, or like they say from my neighborhood, for more better. <laughs> but we've always been a mirror of the country as well. It's a city that sold more humans into slavery than anywhere else in the United States of America, a city that enshrined separate but equal, a city with the highest incarceration and the highest murder rates, a city where we left people stranded with nowhere to go, no way to get out when a Category 5 storm barreled down on the U.S. All of us gasped at the sight of losing a great American city, and we saw fellow Americans on the steps of the Superdome and Convention Center, and we all almost at once in unison said, who left those people there? How could we do that? And the honest answer, the truth, is that we all did. Our nation's policies did. Policies that too often were guided by race and institutional racism. At our peril, we cannot be afraid of our nation's truth. We have to confront it because that is what real patriots do. That is what America does, always striving to be better. So I ask you to think about when we're sworn under oath in court. They ask us to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God, right? And the reason they do that, it's because if you don't tell the whole truth, it can often lead to either a half-truth or a lie by omission. And when you do that, something gets left behind. And in the history of America, it's our fellow Americans. Millions of people take this oath every day, and yet we as a country have never, ever fully reckoned with the whole of our past, specifically as it relates to race in a way that honors the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And as a result, the vestiges of Jim Crow and the resulting segregation that resulted is alive and well today. From the disparity in our health outcomes to increasing housing segregation and the disenfranchisement, of voters as well as voter suppression. The vestiges of Jim Crow are in fact alive and well in the transportation systems in this country in all shapes and sizes, in the criminal justice system, in the public education system, in the financial world of banking and credit and mortgage, all of it. You can't ignore this, you have to confront it, but it's out there like landmines buried waiting to explode and stop people's progress forward. And the truth is that the words of our founders and forefathers that we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal, liberty and justice for all, and even to e pluribus unum, even today ring hollow for many of our fellow Americans. So in my opinion, we can't fully fulfill America's promise moving forward to that more perfect union that we desire, that we all wish to be, if we're not honest about how we got to this place and how imperfect we happen to be at the moment. That's why we took the monuments down, and essentially that's what the monument speech was about. How do we confront, thank you. It, call, it called the question for the country, really, on how do we confront and how do we correct our past, not to lay blame, but so that we can move forward and create a better country for all of us. It is, you already know, a long and winding road. It is not a straight line. And race can be a scary topic for all of us. We really don't know how to talk about it, which is probably why we don't do it. But here's one of the things I've learned. You can't go under it. You can't go around it. You can't go over it. You have to go through it or you will stay stuck in it. You have got to find a way 
to get to the other side, wherever your other side may be. So telling the truth about our past and the present is actually just the first step. It's just the beginning. But I also believe and have learned that the six most important words in the English language are, I am sorry, followed by, I forgive you. They have to coincide with each other. They, in fact, are bookends. Symmetry can be a beautiful thing sometimes. It, in fact, takes a conversation on both sides. And that doesn't mean that anyone in this room, any one person, is at fault. Too often, you see, the discussions about race become confrontational because they start with the idea of blame and fault. Now, that conversation can go on for another 300 years, and I'm sure that it will. But as that conversation goes on, I've also learned that I don't have to solve that problem or find that answer. Because even though I may not be able to pinpoint exactly whose fault it is, I'm pretty sure whose responsibility it is to fix it and to heal the nation. And that would be everybody. Because without everybody, it's not going to get done. Let me be clear that a person's individual words and actions today should be absolutely called out and addressed. The rise of white nationalism and white supremacy should concern everybody and should be confronted aggressively and made clear that it has no quarter at the table of democracy. But we should also challenge the institutions and the policies that exist that have kept us apart for generations. And the failure to do that will keep us looking backward rather than forward. You all know this, the first American slaves were brought to Jamestown in 1619, over 400 years ago. And of course, that act, that singular act, is still shaping institutions in America today. Last year, I had the incredible honor of participating in the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission. If you don't know what it is, I would encourage you to find out. If you do know what it is, go back and read the report. I'm going to tell you now, spoiler alert, it's not going to make you feel good about our country. That commission, you see, challenged the nation to admit that racism had been institutionalized in America and had become a driving force and the cornerstone for inequality. So, of course, we did what we do all the time. When confronted with a hard truth, we ignored it. Sounds familiar. It should. We're doing the same thing with climate change. One of the main conclusions was that the United States was moving towards two societies, one white, one black, separate and unequal. And of course, this growing segregation and inequality fueled unrest. It fueled dislocation. And it reminded us of a phrase we had always heard before, that where there is no justice, there is no peace. I heard a lot about justice and peace in marches from activists, especially in the wake of Ferguson, Baltimore, shootings in East Baton Rouge, even in New Orleans around the monuments and counter protests. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. When I was a child, during the 60s, I took that as an implied threat. I heard it when I was a kid to mean something like, if you don't give me what's rightfully mine, I'm going to hurt you and I'm going to take it. I didn't really understand it. And as I got a little bit older and I began to think about the deeper meaning, and as my experience revealed more to me, I, I came to understand that really what it meant was a statement of truth. When things are not fair, it actually creates alienation and dislocation, and there cannot be peace in alienation. When people are alienated from each other, they can't share with each other what it is they have, what it is they need, and we're all the worse for it. You see, peace is not just the absence of physical violence where there is no communion, all you're left with on a good day is peaceful segregation. And we are all much worse when we are not working together. The other thing to remember that has been told to us so many times, but maybe we don't really fully understand, is that poverty can be a form of violence. So is not having access to health care or having a real job so that you too can, for your family, have a job or build generational wealth over time. 
There is institutional violence, as Robert Kennedy told us many, many years ago, that comes without there being any justice. So where there is no justice, there can be no peace. And we are going to continue to stay in stasis and not get any better until we understand what that means. And we cannot move forward unless and until we have an honest conversation about the past and then actually chart a pathway forward. Here's a truth. We all come to the table of democracy in the United States as equals. That's the aspiration. That is what makes America great. That is what everybody has a right to. That is what everybody is entitled to. But in order to get there, you've got to bring somebody else along with you. This isn't what we merely aspire to. It is a truth, in my opinion, that cannot be denied. We are all better together. We benefit from each other. We learn from each other. And we go through sorrow and pain and tragedy and triumph together. Now, again, just like no justice, no peace, that's not a threat. You see, this is not a playground game where if you don't give me what I want, you're not going to get what you want because I'm not going to give it to you. It's not a sacrifice or a zero-sum game. If you win, I lose. It's an invitation, an open hand for us to do better, to understand that we all benefit when we're at the table as equals. I only understand that today because of what we faced in New Orleans with the monuments. I should have taken, it should not take that kind of ordeal or a tragedy like Katrina to wake us up and bring us together because we already know what we are supposed to do. A child will tell you this. A child told me this in Kentucky the other day. She said, Mr., you know, I didn't like that, by the way. <laughs> she said, Mr., you know that talent is equally distributed, but opportunity isn't. Why does it take a 16-year-old to tell the adults of America what we obviously know is true? We don't have a deficit of ideas in this country. We have a deficit of willpower. We have a deficit of courage. Now, as a Southerner, and I love the South, we're a place of faith, we're a place of family, we're a place of country, we're a place of lazy, lazy rivers, good food, good music, good fellowship. Y'all haven't been there, you ought to come. <laughs> but I feel a special obligation as a Southerner, and particularly a white Southerner, to tackle the history of white supremacy and our history. Last year, I launched in partnership with the Emerson Collective E Plura Bassunum Fund to help fulfill America's promise of justice and opportunity by breaking down the barriers that divide us by race and by class. We actually have spent the last nine months traveling extensively across the South. We've been to 28 counties. We have been to 13 states to try to find bold and effective solutions to breaking down the legacy of Jim Crow so that we can actually create a new pathway forward, not only for the South, but for the country, because as you may not know yet, where goes the South, so goes the country. Yeah. We've been there before. We heard that white people lack an understanding of the scale of racism in America, that the erosion of quality public education is a product of long-standing racial injustices and a cause of ongoing racial and economic inequality, a powerful force of division in our communities that continues today because we continue to live segregated lives, in case you have not been paying attention. We saw that where local leaders openly prioritize diversity and inclusion, there is more hope, there is more optimism in the community's future. But we also saw how political leadership and the media have power to set a permissive tone for racist behaviors and to reinforce stereotypes. Across race and class, everybody wants the same thing. People really want to work hard. They'll work two, they'll work three jobs. But what really bothers them is they have to work hard to stay in place and they have to sacrifice their valuable time with their families and their friends to do it, which is why they are so agitated. They believe that we live in a who you know economy, an economy that is rigged against the working people and no matter how hard they work, they cannot get ahead. That is what they say to us if we would just listen. In other words, they know if the economy is so good and the stock market so great and everybody's got a job, why everybody's agitated. They know. 
They sense that something is broken. They sense that the system is rigged against them, and you know they are right. And it has been for a very, very long period of time. So I want you to think about it for a moment. This is not rocket scientist. It doesn't require somebody to see what can't be seen. This system works the way it does because it was designed this way, which means that the design is defective. And if you want to fix it, then you have to redesign it if you want to achieve another goal and another end. This doesn't mean that you have to design a system where I take from you and give it to somebody else. It means being thoughtful about making changes to the way things have always been, thinking about redesigning it for the way it should have always been had we gotten it right the first time. I mean, just think about it like this. If all of the kids are not invited, or the family members, to the kitchen table for dinner, the experience is always different, and we're the worst for it. Everybody deserves a seat at the family table. As intentional as we have been, in this country about designing laws and institutions that kept us apart, we have to be that intentional about bringing people together. So looking to 2020 and beyond, it's time to force the conversation on race in America. There are many people, maybe people in this room, that have advocated that we should reject discussions about racial identity and tough discussions about race. I strongly disagree with that. I think that we could not be more wrong. With Donald Trump in the White House, there actually can't ever be a better time than we've had in our lives to confront this nation's history and truth about race as a means of bringing people together rather than separating us. We can tackle the toughest challenge in the country one way, and only one way, and that's by facing them telling the truth about them and making a commitment to change them. For generations, our diversity, our multiculturalism, has been seen as one of our nation's greatest strengths. One of our nation's mottos out of many, we are one. E pluribus unum. It's hard to say, but you know what? It's really, really easy to understand. That is what this country is based on, and yet that idea, the foundation of this nation, is being questioned by those that are in charge today. And they're doing it aggressively. And I think they're wrong. Elections, you see, are about choice. And choice matters. We're beginning to painfully understand that today. And so what we choose to do is going to matter about where we end up. We need leaders who see public service as a calling and as a vocation. We need leaders whose political philosophy is tied to a greater ethos rooted in common sacrifice and shared responsibility. We need leaders who can discern when they must do the hard things for the sake of what is just and what is right. We can, in fact, be a nation of law and order, but we're also capable at the same time of being a nation of justice and mercy. That is well within our wheelhouse. We need leaders who will face the truth and will lead us to a new path forward. One of the other things that I have learned from my work is that this road is long and the path is arduous. There are going to be ups and downs, but you have to keep going one step at a time. Now, while I still have hope in my heart that Dr. King was right, as President Obama often said, that the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice, I am equally sobered to the fact, and more sure today than I ever was, that that arc does not bend on its own, and in fact, can be bent backwards if you let it, which is happening today. And so as this all comes into stark relief for us and for the nation, the choice seems to be pretty clear. You're either going to go backwards comma again, or are you going to go forward? And I believe that the choice should be clear for all of us in this country, and that is where we all come in. And at the end of the day, 
it is just a moment, a very important moment, not the only one we will ever have. But don't be confused that this is not one of those moments, because it is, where we can either go backwards or we can go forward. It's time for all of us to make that choice. Thank you very much.
Jacob Liebenluft. Hi, everyone. I hope uh, you enjoyed your break and your snack and that you're ready for our next discussion uh, on how we create shared prosperity for all Americans. Uh, President Trump often uh, brags that the economy has taken strides for the American people under his administration. But in reality, his economic policies have concentrated their benefits on the elite few. His actions have demonstrated his true priorities. President Trump and congressional Republicans enacted a tax plan skewed towards the wealthiest Americans. And the administration has repeatedly rolled back critical protections for workers and stacked regulations in favor of large corporations. But the challenges that we see in our economy, from wage stagnation to inequality to an erosion of worker power, did not begin with Donald Trump, even if he has exacerbated them. To rebalance our economy and our democracy, we need bold solutions, solutions that create a stronger economy for everybody, and especially for those, including women and people of color, who have been historically and systematically excluded from prosperity and economic security. In a moment, we'll hear from three leaders and thinkers who have both offered us new ways of thinking about the economy and bold solutions for building a better future. So please help me welcome CAPS President Neera Tandon, who will moderate our next panel. Thank you. Senator Merkley, come on in. Everyone, everyone come on up. Senator Merkley. Uh, Professor Stevenson, Professor Hamilton. Uh, have a seat. We're just going to get started. Um, I'll just quickly introduce our uh, illustrious panel. We have uh, Senator Jeff Merkley, a powerful champion of progressive values who has served the people of Oregon for 20 years. Professor Derek Hamilton, the executive director of the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at The Ohio State University, who's published, oh, we have a good Ohio contingent, <laughs> or just fans of Professor Hamilton, uh, who has published groundbreaking work on creating a more just society for all Americans, and finally, Betsy Stevenson, a professor of economics at the University of Michigan's Ford School of Public Policy, uh, and was the architect, she was also the architect for many of President Barack Obama's economic policies as a member of his White House Council of Economic Advisors. Um, oh good, we're doing it. excellent. So Senator Merkley, I would like to start with you. Uh, we're focused on this panel on uh, economic inclusion. Um, but I think a lot of people see rising inequality in the country uh, in parallel track to a government that seems to work more for the few than the many. And I'd like to just ask your views both on that issue of rising inequality and how it connects to challenges within our democracy. Great. Oh, hey, it works. All right. <laughs> uh, greetings, everyone, and thank you for coming to a conversation about the future of our, of our country. Uh, because we do see this massive inequality, and we see it in both wealth and in income. And there are points in, in a country when that disparity becomes so great, and there are so many ways a small circle of privileged and powerful can have access to the levers of power that they can make it a country that works by and for the powerful rather than people. And I feel that is where we've gotten to. Mm -hmm. uh, we've gotten to that. We see it in 2017 in the Senate, where half the year was spent trying to undo health care, cancel health care for some 20 to 30 million Americans. And then the second half was about a tax bill that borrows a trillion and a half dollars and gives it to the wealthiest Americans. Now, I hold a lot of town halls. Uh, this year, I'll, I'll probably hit my 400th town hall as a U.S. Senator. And uh, <laughs> I can tell you, no person has ever come to a town hall and said, I have this great idea. Let's borrow all this money and proceed to give it to the people who need it the least. And so... <laughs> Uh, we have to take on the fundamental corruption of our government. And by that I'm talking about gerrymandering, I'm talking about voter suppression, intimidation, and most of all, most importantly, taking on the dark money because if we don't reverse the corruption that has so inhabited 
our legislative process, we will lose on everything else, including all the fundamental ways to address income inequality and wealth inequality. So uh, let me say then, if we win that battle, and I must say, as Mitch McConnell undoes the Constitution, the vision, the distributed power of the Constitution, the Jeffersonian concept of equal voice, which had big problems in it, but that's what he called it. He was talking about distributed uh, uh, political power. If we don't undo that, we will lose on housing, we'll lose on health care, we'll lose on education, we'll lose on, on infrastructure, we'll lose on equality, we'll lose on climate. So I want to win. So the first thing we do in, in January 2021, when we have 51 votes, is restore and defend the vision of we the people by simple majority in the U.S. Senate. <laughs> so I didn't get to concrete ideas. But uh, <laughs> I, I have a whole, whole yeah, bunch. You could just, if you want to just say another, uh, another a minute or two, it's more than welcome. Well, with that power, with the people power, we need to uh, take and have things that are embedded in employment now become just automatic in America, including Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. And that that becomes a fundamental attribute to everyone everywhere, so it isn't something you have to win through part-time jobs where it's very hard to get it in our economy. I like the idea of guaranteed work. Work creates structure in life, it creates meaning, and to have that guaranteed work with the right wage gives you a foundation on, from which to build. Then we need to take on the power of workers to negotiate that has been deeply eroded and, and damaged. When workers have the power of a union to be able to negotiate a fair share of the wealth they, they create, they get a fair share of the wealth, and that is a vision we saw 40 years ago and we often don't see now. I'm a blue collar kid, I live in a blue collar community, and what I see is that hope and opportunity are much further away now for the families in my neighborhood than they were four decades ago when I came out of, out of high school. And it's not because the families have changed, it's because America has changed in this imbalance of power. Excellent, I, I wanna uh, go to you, Professor Stevenson, and, and ask you a, a kind of follow-up question to that, which is, um, you know, in this economy in particular, uh, we've seen growth, but we've seen very unequal growth, right? So uh, rising levels of inequality um, where uh, the, 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 the benefits of growth have really not been equally shared. Uh, we've seen a major shift in the balance of power, which uh, Senator Merkley referenced, but I'd love you to develop up on what policies can, you, in your mind, can both produce economic growth and ensure that growth is more fairly shared? So technological change has enabled um, really big growth and inequality. We've become a winner-take-all economy. But what's happened in our political system is that the policies have cemented that winner-take-all um, by those winners then ask for more. And that's what that trillion and a half dollar tax cut was all about, giving more money to the people who've already won. The problem is this, in the long run, will slow down and erode growth because we're not investing in the skills for the future. I, very specifically, the federal government underinvests in children. And children, investing in the human capital of our children is where growth from the future is going to come from. When we give money to the people who've already made money, it's not true that they turn around and use it to grow the economy faster. Right? That's not what a market economy is about. A market economy is about opportunity for everyone so that the brand new ideas percolate up to the top. They get out there and they become the new next big thing that allows us to grow. We can't do that unless we're investing in every single one of our children because I don't know who's going to have the next big new idea. And i got to make sure that we've laid a platform that allows whoever has it to rise to the top and make it happen. So, Professor Hamilton, thank you, Professor Stevenson. Professor Hamilton, uh, uh, we talk uh, a lot in economic circles about income inequality, but we have, obviously, a range of inequalities that are functioning in the economy and, in many ways, uh, becoming exacerbated. And inequality is growing on inequalities. You've written extensively on racial inequality and the racial wealth gap and how that is a generational uh, that is, has, has, is uh, exacerbating itself generation after generation, in that, and, and our policies make it worse generation after generation. So um, 
What are your thoughts on how to, uh, how to reduce that inequality as well as income inequality? And uh, some strategies, Senator Merkley just referenced a jobs guarantee, other ideas that you've, uh, you've uh, developed and highlighted. That's an excellent question. Uh, I, I think uh, we need a package of goods. Inequality does affect us in many domains. The senator mentioned health care. Um, you've talked about income, guaranteed income. Uh, but wealth is also a critical yeah. domain by which people have agency in their lives, the ability to be self-determinant. And if we look at wealth as an outcome, it allows us to refute all those narratives that have come about by this free market revolution, which in my estimation was in reaction to the revolutionary gains that came about from a New Deal and a civil rights movement where the government was used mm -hmm. to empower people. So in reaction, we have this, free, rights, this uh, free market revolution, but in the domain of wealth, it is not education, it is not income, it is not mere grit that allows people to attain wealth. The, the critical ingredient is capital itself. The critical ingredient is having some asset that puts you into an yeah. automatic vehicle of savings, like a home, like a debt-free college education, like some seed capital to start a business. So if we are trying to empower everybody with the ability to have self-determination from an economic standpoint, mm -hmm. then we need a government that facilitates some capital for everyone. So, you know, uh, Senator Booker is mm -hmm. now proposing baby bonds. It's an idea that you know, we've been talking about for a long time, but a birthright to capital. The, the ability to grow wealth should not be reserved only for the wealthy, but rather we should have every American with some seed capital to put them into a vehicle of savings, uh, not individual savings, but literally passive savings, like the automatic appreciation from a home. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that should be extended to everyone. And uh, um, your race, should not be a criteria, or the family to which you're born into should not be a criteria by which you have access, access to that asset freedom or asset security. Senator Merkley, I wanted to ask you in response, um, uh, ideas like baby bonds, ideas like jobs guarantee, um, these are new, these are, some of these are old ideas that have a fresh, have a fresh look. I think one of the issues around all of these issues is how do you, should we make them universal? Should we make them targeted? Another question is when you look at how policies, uh, how we're dealing with the Trump administration that is trying to pit people against each other, right? Rural communities against urban communities. Uh, uh, white people against black people and immigrants, the documented against undocumented. How can you, you represent a state that has a rural community as well as an urban community? How do you see economics as a way to think through an agenda that actually brings people together versus uh, cementing these divides between working class whites and people of color, et cetera? So are there ideas, maybe some of the ones we've discussed are them, but what are, what, are there ideas that can actually try to glue people back together in a world where Trump, the president, is trying to divide us consistently? Well, let me start. Uh, before I talk about specific economic ideas, we have to talk about the, the philosophy of, of, our, of our hearts. We have a, a president who is putting gasoline on the fire of racial and ethnic division. Every time we hear President Trump attack a group in America, be it African Americans, Latin Latino Americans, immigrant Americans, Americans with disabilities, Muslim Americans, we need to reach out and stand with those groups and say we are one nation under God, indivisible. We stand for working together to build a more beautiful, a more successful nation. Resist the hate and division. And I'll tell you, there are a lot of policies that accentuate more help for those best off. And let me, we mentioned, so let's talk about home ownership. Uh, you get a massive tax deduction if you buy a really big house. And if you buy a small house, you get no help. Uh, when Mary and I first bought a house, we didn't itemize our first year. Our interest didn't exceed the standard deduction when the standard deduction is half of what it is now. So if we're going to give massive 
gifts to those best off buying really big houses, how about we have a, a guaranteed uh, tax credits or grants that go to first time homeowners to buy homes for the closing costs. We had a program in Northeast Portland when I moved back to, to Oregon uh, that uh, was project down payment that was about empowering families through home ownership. And we knew that home ownership was the biggest wealth builder for the middle class. Well, right now it's under serious damage, partly because of the student loans people are carrying mm -hmm. out of college, partly because people are a little more scared of home ownership after the predatory lending of 2000 well, li that led up to the crash in, in 2008. But let's make an extra effort to empower families of more modest means to participate in the ownership society. And then this idea of, of baby bonds, I like this idea. Um, there is a version of this called uh, uh, IDAs, Individual Development Accounts. Uh, and when I was working for a nonprofit housing group, I started the first IDA west of the Mississippi. Uh, the idea was give matching grants to enable families who live in affordable housing that I was developing through a nonprofit to be able to buy a home. And if I have $5,000 matching grant at the time, they could make their down payment, buy a home, and create a new empty unit for someone else, where it costs at that point 80000 to actually build a new unit. So you got two. <laughs> you got a twofer. You got a family that didn't need affordable housing, and for $5,000, you got a new empty unit. And, uh, but, and, of course, the numbers have changed. That was a while ago. Uh, but uh, the, the, the point is finding, and by the way, that IDA program, it was looking at the three biggest pathways from poverty into the middle class. One being education, one being home ownership, and one being small business. And you could choose the matching grant to go to whichever area you wanted. That used to be a bipartisan idea, had bipartisan support, uh, and it had that nationally as well as in, in my home state. Now Republicans are like, we don't, you know, we don't really want to reauthorize IDAs, and we don't really like them. And I'm like, what happened? That, that we don't have partners on both sides of the aisle wanting to create pathways to empower families to move out of poverty and into the middle class. So um, that's a couple yeah. points. Great. Uh, I think we know what happened, uh, actually. <laughs> but, uh, but I appreciate the question. Um, Professor Stevenson, you have uh, written extensively and contributed uh, really important research on the connection to between women's labor force participation and economic growth overall. When you look at our country, when you look at other countries, women's labor force participation can be a significant fuel of growth. And yet, we have a series of policies in our country, or I should say lack thereof, which hurt that, uh, which actually stifle, stifled that level of growth. Could you walk through just a few of your ideas in that space? Because I think one of the challenges is we often lose sight of how in ensuring more people participate in the economy fully actually drives economic growth over the long term. So a large share of our economic growth in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s was due to women's rising labor force participation. In each decade, women started participating at a lower rate and by the end were participating at a higher rate. And that bringing more people into the workforce um, contributed overall to GDP growth. It also contributed to the growth in family incomes. The end of the 1990s, that growth in women's labor force participation stopped. It really uh, hit a point of stagnation. Now, one thing that's really important to realize that is that male labor force participation has been declining since the 1950s, a really pretty steady decline. So a lot of people are aware that we have a problem with male labor force participation today. That's not a brand new problem. We're not just waking up to that problem. We've been seeing that decline over many, many, many decades. So what's new? What's making us wake up to this problem? Families used to be able to paper over the wage losses that the, from husbands not seeing a growth in their wages, not seeing growth in their participation with the fact that the wives were bringing in more. So almost all of the growth in family income was coming from growth in women's, uh, women's income. So they made sure that family income continued to grow, felt like we were doing a little bit better than we were a, were a decade before. Well, when women's labor force participation stopped rising, when the wage stagnation hit women as well, that I feel like pulled a Band-Aid off the problem of male wage stagnation, male labor force decline, and we're really seeing the kinds of problems. So 
there's you know, a couple of things there. One, we need to address what's going on with men. But let's turn to yeah. the women. Um, the women, why, are, why did labor force participation stagnate when it continued to grow throughout the rest of the world? We used to lead the world in women's labor force participation. Now we're very far below many other OECD mm -hmm. countries. Why? Well, over the last two decades, those OECD countries have realized that in order for families to continue to do two things, uh, have women work and continue to have children, they've got to be able to make it work. So they've added family leave policies, paid maternity leave, paid paternity leave, paid sick days. Um, they have added uh, workplace flexibility laws, the right to make a request for flexibility at work. They've added policies that have made it easier for families to combine working um, and having a family. What we've seen in the US is a stagnation in female labor force participation because we have failed to add those policies. But we're also seeing something else happening right now, which is women are not having babies anymore at the same rates that they mm -hmm. used to. We have fertility at an all-time low at a time when we're nine years into an economic boom. That's highly unusual. And it's a response to the fact that our government refuses to make it easy for women to do both. When you don't make it easy for them to do both, they choose. And when they choose, you get fewer children and you get lower female labor force participation. So that's the situation we're in right now. And that's why we see countries like Japan is desperate to get women into the labor force. Their labor, female labor force participation rate is higher than ours. And they've been doing this because they want to see higher fertility rates as well as to see their growth um, accelerate. So we know that these policies do both things. And I, the, the last thing I'll say on this is, you know, there has been something that's been happening with women um, since we hit that peak of their labor force participation. We have continued to narrow the gender wage gap, which means that a growing number of families rely equally or exclusively or primarily on women's wages in order to support the family. So uh, there are lots of female-headed households. Obviously, they're relying on women's wages. But there are women, married women who work are bringing home 45% of household income now. They're not some secondary earner. They're not bringing home the extra money so we can do some extra things. They're paying the mortgage. And so they really care that they're being treated fairly, that they can take the time off that they need, um, and that the policies are supporting them. From our economy's perspective, one thing we need to be really well aware of is that women are responding at much higher rates than men to the incentives to invest in their uh, employable skills. They're going to college at higher rates. They're not just going, they're graduating at higher rates. They're not just graduating at higher rates, they're at the top of the class at higher rates. They're graduating with honors, they're going on to graduate school, they're getting PhDs, they're getting tons of skills, they're staying in the workforce. So is anybody surprised that they're hitting their 30s right now and saying, you want me to have a baby and see all, throw all that out the window? Because do you know what happens to women's wages when they have a baby? Yeah. They stop growing for pretty much ever. And that's a real problem we have to address. Thank you. So Professor Hamilton, Professor Stevenson makes uh, a compelling argument about how uh, the lack of policy uh, related to paid leave and a child care, a whole range of policies is actually uh, hurting our economic growth over the long term. And I think uh, you uh, just referenced uh, the differentials on assets. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge Cap released two reports that focused on the wealth gap between white families and families of color. Uh, it stated, uh, those, it, the data stated that white families possess about 10 times the wealth of black families and about seven times the wealth of Latinx families while also finding a persistent wage, uh, wealth gap between white families and those in the AAPI communities. I think uh, uh, you referenced education, home, home ownership, access to capital. Um, what I would love uh, for you to talk about is the policies we've touched on, jobs guarantee, baby bonds, but also talk about similarly, how does a lack of, how does, a, how does that uh, racial wealth gap uh, actually ensure that we have less economic growth than we otherwise would have if we had policies that ensured African American families, Latino families were able to uh, have wealth at the same rate as, as, as white families? 
So I'm going to answer the question with a slightly different angle than perhaps it was um, asked. And, and I'm going to uh, make the claim that we should do it because it's the right thing to do. I think the growth I is important. I would agree. I, I know you don't disagree, <laughs> right? So I think that is reason enough. I think that, it, right, we... we yeah, that's, yeah. that's totally right. It's yeah. a morally right thing to do, so we should do it. I totally agree. Right, yeah. So, you know, obviously growth is important. If population grows and the economy's not growing, we, we will end up in a dismal, uh, cyclical decline in terms of people not having enough. Uh, so obviously we should, we should have growth in our calculus, um, but perhaps even more important, we should have human capabilities as our main measure of how well-functioning our society is. We need to change narratives altogether. So um, part of the reason that we're in this place that we are in, where we have this concentration at the, co at the top of both economic power and political power, is because we use divisiveness like race as a mechanism to maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. So, so I'll elaborate a little more and say, for instance, um, how do we get, how was Donald Trump able to win with a message of make America great again? That, that's the one people commonly heard, but then he also said one other thing that he highlighted. I'm your last chance. And yeah. what he was arguing was yeah. the pending demographic change when whites are no longer expected to be a numerical minor majority, by the way, the definition of white changes throughout history, so demography's not going to save us. Um, but nonetheless, he was trying to hone in on that message of however you are in terms of your vertical status, as we grow in inequality, I will restore the, 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 primary, the primariness of whiteness yeah, and primacy of whiteness mm -hmm. so that you will be, your status will be unchallenged by immigrants, by blacks, and whoever. So I think we need to get beyond this, this notion of, of elevating horizontal equity as a criteria by which people care about. And therefore, we need to start, and young people are doing this, yeah. defining our economy in terms of humanity, sustainability. Martin Luther King, when he started to get leverage, he started talking about our common humanity. I like William Barber's phrasing that economic justice is a moral imperative. So to me, we should care about, uh, ec we should care about growth, but at the end of the day, the primary thing that our nation should care about is human capabilities in a universal way that's both race and gender conscious. And that, that is an evolution that I believe we can get to. And I think that an economic bill of rights, so we've talked about housing, we've talked about medical care, we've talked about wealth, we've talked about jobs. We can talk about the essential goods that people need in their lives so that they can really have choice and agency. And we need a public purpose to ensure that those goods are not just distributed by a for-profit sector whose primary goal is to make profit, not necessarily the primary goal of offering human dignity to everyone or social welfare to everyone. That's where we need to go, at least from a theoretical perspective. So I, I, I agree with much of what you said, but let me, let me give you a, a contrary idea um, that animated my question, which is I think one of the challenges we're dealing with with Trump and Trumpism yeah. in the economic sphere is that he is making a very clear argument that there is a zero-sum game, yeah. that the advance of one group comes at the expense of another group. And that's why I push on this idea, which is I think uh, progressive politics has to, or progressive ideas have to demonstrate that that is false, and you may, that is a false choice, and that actually you can have policies that, uh, that redress uh, hist inequalities, not just historic, but cons right now, current inequalities that do not, uh, are not a zero-sum game, do not make you lose because someone else's gain. So that's why I asked the question, which is, these policies that, uh, that can actually reduce inequality, uh, addressing the issues of concern uh, to ensuring women can join the labor force, or build assets for groups that have uh, historically low assets can actually produce economic growth. Because I do think the challenge we have in the moment we're in is not you know, what we all think, but there is a, another narrative, which is uh, everything we say means some group gets hurt.
you and I don't disagree. Yeah. Um, but but I, would, I think we need to break that framing altogether. Mm -hmm. Look, we all seen Game of, Game of Thrones break the wheel. So we need to break that whole framing. I'm for breaking the wheel, but it didn't work out so well <laughs> at the didn't. end there for her. But uh, I'm definitely but, for breaking it. <laughs> but but I, I think the, the point I'm trying to make is the terms of the debate have been defined for us, and we need to yeah, break, them, break rid of them all together. So whether it's zero sum or whatever, what we will not accept as a society is one where we don't offer economic agency to everybody. Yeah. I think that's the frame and the narrative yeah. we need to operate in. Yes. And, right, that, and, and I'll say this last point. The, the neoliberal norms that have been um, put upon us is one of self-interested economic gains that knows no bounds um, and that it is all associated with accumulation, accumulation, me against someone else. I think that the framing that young people are starting to put together and that is leading to this momentum that we're having is one of humanity, is one of sustainability, and mm -hmm. one of collectiveness. And that's the frame we need to operate in. Great. Do you want to say something, Sarah Merkley, to answer that? I just, that? I just we'll want to questions. jump into the, into the, the, the great contradictions in Trump on this because he campaigned as, I'm going to be a, a champion for you struggling families yeah. who have lost jobs. Well, so in my community, in my blue collar community, you sit down with the family and you ask, what are you worried about? They'll, they'll talk about one of four things within 30 seconds. And it will be as we've discussed here, healthcare, housing, education, a good paying job. But what do we see with Trump? What do we see on housing? He guts all the housing programs in his budget, doesn't advocate for them, doesn't have a secretary of housing who advocates for ordinary families, whether it be affordable, decent rentals or it be a home empowerment through home ownership. What do we see on health care? He tries to strip down health care for millions of American families and sabotage the exchange for middle class uh, families. What do we see on education, undermining public schools? Uh, we don't see any effort uh, to, to take on class size uh, or, or stop the brain drain from, from schools in low income areas to high income areas, which we see all the, all the time. Uh, we, we don't see affordability for college being something he cares about or not even investment in career technical education. I mean, none of that. And then on the job side, we could have had a massive infrastructure bill in 2017, but what did he choose to do? not to address the fundamental issues, these four fundamental issues that matter to families that are trying to get onto a solid foundation. No, he gives a trillion and a half or two trillion with interest to the wealthiest people in America. We need to call out this, the fundamental uh, lie he campaigned on and is, is governing on. He's governing by and for a small circle of rich and powerful, including the Koch brothers. He's destroying our planet on, on carbon. Uh, he's increasing hate and division. And as we were talking about the pieces there, I just want to say we have to treat children and adults at the border fleeing persecution with decency and respect when they ask for asylum. Thank you. All right. I think we have time for just a few questions. Any questions from the audience? If there aren't, I will ask another one. Okay. And I'll speak loudly without it. Uh, it's what's coming. It's coming. Just her. She'll be over there quickly. Thank you so much. So one issue that cuts across what this panel has said and uh, the previous panel on environmental justice and infrastructure is that the federal minimum wage has not been increased in 32 years. And uh, one of the bills, we keep applauding what the Congress has done and we keep blasting the people on the other side, but one of the things we haven't done is pass the Raise the Wage Act. And it may well be that although the press focuses on progressives mm -hmm. who are too mm -hmm. progressive, maybe there's a number of progressives who are not, prog not progressive enough. And the heart of a lot of what this panel has talked about is raising the minimum wage and making sure that businesses don't either use the subminimum wage or expand the use of the subminimum wage to the gig economy and elsewhere. Great. Uh, anyone on the panel want to talk about the Raise the Wage Act? I, 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 since Cap works on this problem uh, very closely, I will say that uh, 
we are optimistic that the uh, Raise the Wage Act will pass the House, but uh, love others to. So I was just going to say that, you know, if you take a look at the income distribution, what we see is that, you know, all the gains for many, many decades have been going to the top. So there's been this fight between Republicans and Democrats about whether we've won or not won the war on poverty. And that's because the share of people bef below the official poverty line has been really stagnant for the last four decades. Well, the trick is that the official poverty line pretty much captures market wages and doesn't capture our things like the EITC or some of the programs. But that does tell us something important, which is that despite the fact that average incomes have doubled over those four decades, we haven't done anything to really help out the bottom. And so we have to think about, the market's not gonna do it on its own, right. and we need to do it through passing a higher minimum wage and making sure that if we're going to be talking about people working and the importance of bringing, you know, the importance of people doing these things on their own, then we have to make sure that the wages are there for them. I mean, we do things like require drug testing to receive benefits as a mechanism to discipline poor people. I think we need mechanisms to discipline the market. So a federal job guarantee de facto instills a minimum wage. Yeah. A federal job guarantee de facto puts working conditions on the private sector by which if they want to hire workers, they have to offer at least what the federal government is, mm -hmm. is willing to offer. And the last thing is it eliminates unemployment altogether, because I guess the conservative talking point is that the true minimum wage is zero. But with a federal job guarantee, those people that aren't even working would not only get the minimum wage, they'd also get a job. Mm -hmm. And you think about $7.25 federal minimum wage. In Oregon, the minimum wage is now almost double that, so the disparity is becoming yeah. greater. And if you include for a, a single parent doing child care, paying for for child care, mm -hmm. it's basically you get paid nothing. I mm -hmm. mean, you mean you it child yeah. care eats up all of your your wages. So we make it back to the point, make it incredibly hard uh, for women to re-enter the workforce in a in a product or men, single parent uh, fathers. Uh, but um, this, uh, I can't even imagine the fact that not only is it 7.25 federally, if you're in a tipped position, uh, it's. Two dollars and thirty-five cents. Two dollars and thirteen cents. I mean, it, and no, no guarantee you're going to get tips to make up uh, that difference at all. In Oregon, we index the minimum wage. We're raising it towards the fifteen-dollar mark. Uh, we do not provide a tipped wage. That is, if you are waiting tables, you get your full minimum wage plus your tips, and that's what the customers want you to get when they think they're tipping you. They aren't trying to make up for the pay you're not being paid by your, your establishment. But we also did, we tried a little twist that, that is, uh, I, I don't know if it's unique, I think it might be, which is we did a variation on the minimum wage in rural areas where the cost of living is much lower than the, than the cities. And that tended to bring the state together uh, more powerfully than we had been before behind the minimum wage. Uh, we, we have time for one question, last question, and we'll, we'll try to take it quickly. Thanks very much, and thanks very much to the panel. On the minimum wage, uh, it was notable in the earlier panel today and in Stacey Abrams' speech how low the minimum wage can be in some states. I think she mentioned $5 an hour in, in Georgia. Uh, I wanted to raise a macro issue. We talk a lot, people get worried on the Democratic side about the debt and so on, but the economic consensus, the macroeconomic consensus has moved to dramatically mm -hmm. in the past year or two away from concerns about United States uh, debt to GDP ratio and in favor of thinking that it's worth investing and it's worth mm -hmm. taking on debt in order to invest. So I want to encourage us not to be scared to lay out important spending plans <laughs> uh, because of the fear of, of debt. Thank this you. Is a former member of the Obama <laughs> NEC, so that's a great. Uh, do, Betsy, do you want to? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I'm still a bit of a debt conservative, but when it comes to making investments, I'm all for debt because nobody decides that they're not going to make an investment until they've saved up all the money, right? When we don't, when we buy a house, we put a small down payment, we pay mm -hmm. it off over 30 years. There's lots of ways in which we, you know, businesses 
put a small down payment and pay things back over years. That's how we invest. That's not how we should do tax cuts, right? We shouldn't borrow from our children and our grandchildren in order to give a bunch of rich people today a lot of money. So the question about the debt has to be what are we spending the money on and why are we engaging in the debt, not debt is good or debt is bad. Excellent. Uh, I think that's a great ending to this panel. I want to thank our three panelists. Uh, and uh, I'm going to, we're saving the best for last for our last speaker. I'm going to head over to the podium. Uh, but let's give a round of applause to these three great economic thinkers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we're going to head out this way. Head out this way. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So we have saved, I shouldn't say the best for last because then everyone else will get mad at me, but uh, one, one of the greats for last. Uh, I, it's really my privilege to welcome to our stage the final speaker of today, Mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti. As the head of America's second largest city, Mayor Garcetti is standing at the forefront of amazing leaders who are driving progress at the local level. He's championed progressive issues such as expanding infrastructure, providing free community college, and combating climate change. And he's here today to share how his city is helping to spearhead the movement to enact real and meaningful change across the board. So please help me give a warm welcome to Mayor Eric Garcetti. Thank you, Neera. And, and can we just pause for a moment and imagine a Washington that was run by Neera Tandon, like a Washington that would actually work? Why don't you give her and all of the Center for American Progress a round of applause for what's been an extraordinary day. I, I'm very conscious that I'm the last speaker of the day and all that's standing between you and happy hour. Um, but I want to thank Cap for what has been an amazing day of hope and ideas of what I feel is forward momentum in this nation that so badly needs it. And it's been wonderful to be with so many inspiring leaders who, as we look at 2020 and a new path forward for the American people that has been charted out here. I think we heard here from the very beginning from Stacey Abrams and throughout the day that that victory starts with defeating Donald Trump. But while that is necessary, it is not sufficient. And what the American people need as we look forward is much, much more than that. You see, the American people, my friends, want the good life. Not the kind of good life we see in a commercial, a beer commercial, or, but something deep and profound. They want a chance to fulfill the instinct that lives inside each one of us. And what I'd put before you today as we close out this time, the pursuit of happiness. You know, if Thomas Hobbes described life as nasty, brutish, and short, if the Greeks said, call no man happy until he is dead, our American philosophy, our American experiment, called for something radically different. Our founding documents, we defined ourselves through three inalienable rights that we know so well, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We often get caught up in those first two. We define ourselves by those first two and our battles over life itself and liberty. But our founders agreed that Americans must be afforded the right to happiness, and life and liberty exist as the precursors to the most important of those three, to live a happy and fulfilling life. When Jefferson wrote those immortal words, he was writing specifically that happiness, though, relies on good government, government that's rooted in our care for each other, in our shared commitment to a future where our children can thrive. And yet, despite that foundation, despite our vast wealth and power, America is ranked 18th in the world in terms of happiness. Why? Well, you've heard about it today. A healthcare crisis, a barbell economy, soaring student debt, unattainable housing, and more than anything, I believe that our unhappiness comes from the disconnection that Americans are feeling right now, that we don't have a sense of belonging. Americans are asking, where do we belong anymore in our country? And where does America belong in the world? Unfortunately, our leaders in Washington, especially at the White House, have very few answers. This president who divides us and remains the subject of a counterintelligence investigation, an attorney general in contempt of Congress, state by state men are deciding that they should legislate what women do with their bodies, 
And the great American promise that if you work hard, if you play by the rules, that you'll do better by your parents or better than your parents, that is broken. In just three years, our moral and our political authority in the world has been diminished by our withdrawal from our Paris Accords, the Iran nuclear deal, our waffling on Article 5 of NATO, and on the incarceration of children at our border. Simply put, Americans don't feel like they belong, and they don't trust our institutions. You know, Gallup does a poll every year asking Americans a simple question about whether they trust 15 different institutions. Only three of those are above 50%. Police, the military, and small businesses. Americans have lost faith in the news that they read, in places that they put their savings, and especially in the people that they elect, and that goes for both parties. Trust and faith. Think about those lessons we hear from the pulpits and our temples and our churches. Think of the teachings that are enshrined in just about every holy book. Yes, we are taught to reject evil, of course, but true faith comes from something more than rejecting evil. It comes from a positive faith, a belief in knowing where your God wants to take you and trusting in that power. So you see, our vision must be as strong as that, not just a rejection of Donald Trump, not just restoring the status quo of three years ago. Now, I don't know what'll make everybody happy. I read recently that there's 1.5 million Americans who would be happier if the eighth season of Game of Thrones were redone. But there are a few basics that I know we do believe on, believe, agree on, excuse me. One, that work must have meaning. Two, that your children deserve a good public education. And three, that the future should, full, sorry, the future should feel full of beginnings and not of endings. We should be full of beginnings and not endings. So our party and this room and our allies as progressives, we have to carve a path to happiness for the American people. Remind Americans that they do belong. You see, from belonging comes trust, from trust comes commitment, and from commitment comes progress. I'm here today because as broken as our federal system feels, as a mayor of the second biggest city in America, and traveling the country with my fellow mayors, I see a great America in America's cities and towns. And today I want to share with you what America's cities can maybe teach our nation's capital to contribute to that vision of belonging and progress for our party and our country. It was said in the past that states are the laboratories of democracy. I would offer now it is America's cities. We are centers for progress and how we as Democrats can restore confidence and happiness as an achievable pursuit by looking at what's happening in our urban areas. Now, let us not also forget that America from its very founding has always been about how power has come from our communities to our nation's capital and not vice versa. In Los Angeles, we're not waiting on Washington to deliver on infrastructure. The same day Donald Trump was elected, we joined with other cities around the country to approve $230 billion of infrastructure. In Los Angeles, it was $120 billion to put 15 transit lines in the most trafficked city in America and put 787,000 Americans to work. And now through a nonprofit called Accelerator for America, which I've helped found, we're working with cities all across this nation to generate their own local infrastructure funding, creating national change from the bottom up. While Washington demonizes immigrants, denies climate change, and wages a trade war, what's happening locally? Well, in Los Angeles, our libraries, every single one of them has a citizenship center to integrate the next generation of Americans. We're creating jobs while we're reducing our carbon emissions. We're breaking records for our international trade and travel at our ports and airports. And over the last five years, we have passed a wide-reaching agenda for progress through key investments in our city. In a state, and I think some of you know this, in California, where you have to pass any revenue measure by a two-thirds vote, listen to this. Not only did voters approve infrastructure measures, we passed measures to build affordable housing, end homelessness, clean our water, create open spaces and parks, and to support our community colleges. At the same time, we raised our minimum wage, cut our city's business tax, made community college free, and we're outpacing the nation on job growth and wealth, cre wealth creation. We created 35,000 green jobs, making up for all the coal jobs left in America in a town with just over 1% of the nation's population. And we also convinced the world in the face of the Muslim ban and family separations that they should believe in America and were awarded the 2028 Olympic Games. That's a damn good American story. And it's a progressive story that lays the groundwork for a stronger tomorrow. 
It's the story of a nation where everybody belongs. I know a lot of people talk about inclusion and diversity. I like the word belonging better, because diversity can mean many things. Hometown buffet has a diverse buffet. And inclusion implies I'm more powerful than you in including you. But belonging gets to our hearts. It gets to our aspirations. It gets to who we are as Americans. And this story I'm sharing from LA doesn't amplify the device of politics spewing from the White House or Twitter or cable news. It's just the story of people pulling together and getting stuff done. I think Cap understands that mandate better than anyone else. Born in the wilderness of the Bush administration, this center showed us not only how to push back on bad policy, but how to push forward when we would regain power with smart ideas. So when we took Congress back in, 20, in 2006, when Barack Obama won the White House, we had a substantive agenda, substantive agenda, excuse me, on day one. That's the kind of foresight that we need today. Our farmers need much more than an end to the trade war. They need a path forward in a confusing global economy and a changing climate. Yes, we must, of course, end the incarceration of children, like my grandfather who crossed over the border in his mother's, my great-grandmother's arms. But more than ending family separation, we need pathways for citizenship. We need to defend immigrants. We need to craft a foreign policy that's centered on aid and investment and diplomacy to stabilize our hemisphere. And while we must restore our frayed social safety net and help people earn higher wages and access basic services, it's not enough to help people tread water. It isn't enough to help people stay afloat. We need an agenda to lift America back up. We must create opportunities for people to pursue paths. So as we dive into the throes of the presidential election, let's remember our cause is not just to defeat Donald Trump. Our cause is to pursue happiness for the American people, to set a vision and a plan, and to seize it for America. So I'd like to touch on three lessons to show how we get there. First, we need to build an America by taking a generational approach to infrastructure. Second, we need to protect our homes and our communities and our families by winning the war on climate change. And third, we have to help all of our children advance through inclusive investment. It's time for new beginnings, not just keeping people's head above water, but helping them see a future for themselves and their children and this country. So first, infrastructure. I didn't time today to be this way, but our in, uh, in case you didn't know while you were here, our president walked away from the table. He walked away from this country's crumbling communities, and he walked away from the American people. After ambitions of billions and then trillions of dollars to help Americans win the future, Donald Trump showed that he still can't get construction projects done. But remember, the same night that we elected him, as I mentioned, voters from Ohio to Washington approved a quarter of a trillion dollars in infrastructure investments. Almost half of that was in my town, as I mentioned. The $120 billion of Measure M, the largest local infrastructure initiative in American history times two, one that never sunsets, and one that is creating 787,000 middle class jobs that can't be exported, that are recession proof. These are jobs that can help pay for a home, send kids to college. And that success inspired us to found Accelerator for America, which launched exactly one year after the 2016 election. We didn't know it would be a big deal at the time, but with some fellow mayors, one of whom was from South Bend, Indiana. We held our first meeting in the Studebaker factory there in that town, in the same spot where my friend Pete Buttigieg would then launch his campaign for president. Accelerator put together a bipartisan poll, and after healthcare, it was the second biggest issue for Americans that they want both parties to work together on. Nearly 80% of Americans say infrastructure is important. And we can't talk about infrastructure as dollars and miles and programs. It's about people. It's about whether you get to see your child on time because the commute is lessened. It's about your dating pool because where you can live and how far you can go out on a date. It's about the human experience that infrastructure enables. Even though the president walked away from his duty to the country today, we need to do more than deliver funding for a short-term fix. And as we see other countries, other nations around the world map out infrastructure plans for a century, they watch our country limp through two and five year band-aids. So today I am calling on us to create a national infrastructure strategy, a plan for the next 50 years, and yes, you heard that right, 50 years of American prosperity. 
to build the transportation and communications and energy and water projects to move America forward and to position us to win the future. And when we do so, it will be the largest expansion of the middle class in our lifetimes. It will tell Americans who are repairing our bridges, who are laying down cables, who are building our turbines, that they belong and that they can see themselves and their children in the America of tomorrow. Second, climate change. While Americans are worried about whether their jobs will survive the future economy, climate change has Americans worried about whether their children will be able to survive at all. I was talking recently to a teenager, and I was sharing with her that when I was her age, we used to think the world would come to an end because of nuclear war. She said, we have the same feeling today as teenagers because of climate change. It's visceral. It's real. For mayors, we feel it in fires on the sidelines of our cities, in floods through the streets of our towns. And we cannot build the country that our children deserve unless we protect the planet that they will inherit. It's been very exciting for me to hear Washington talk about a Green New Deal. But I've said, don't just look across the aisle or across Congress to find it. Look across the country. Because this generational battle against climate change is a moral imperative. It's an environmental emergency and a massive economic opportunity. Cities across the country are rising to meet this moment. And if enough of us take a stand, we can create national change despite this president. Because most of America will already be moving on to a low carbon, green energy future. In LA, we kicked off our Green New Deal five years ago. We created a model that I hope the nation will follow. I just testified the select committee today on Capitol Hill about this. In 2015, we said work on the environment needed to go hand in hand with work on our economy and equity. And people said we were a little crazy. But last month, we took that plan even further, pledging that Los Angeles will be a carbon neutral city by 2050, a place where every building will be emissions free, a place where 100% of our vehicles will be zero emissions, a place where we won't sing a, send a single piece of trash to a landfill, where we will recycle 100% of our water and power all of our homes and businesses with 100% clean energy. And just because we're leaving pollution behind doesn't mean that we'll leave workers behind. My Green New Deal will put 300,000 people to work in new jobs, building on those 35,000 jobs I mentioned, in water, solar panels, retrofitting buildings with cool roofs. And we're making sure that these good middle class jobs will go to Angelinos from low income communities and communities of color that have often borne the brunt of climate change. And working with our sisters and brothers in the building trades will create those jobs of the future to ensure they're not just any jobs, but fulfilling careers. The Carpenters Union, for example, that we're working very closely with, spends about $250 million a year on training, without any public subsidy, by the way. And as we talk about green jobs, about the future of work, we have the opportunity to create this smart transition for workers, maybe even a guarantee of workers in old polluting energy jobs of yesterday to have those jobs guaranteed for them tomorrow. That's critical because the pursuit of happiness requires the dignity of work. And Americans should be able to earn a living wage on a livable planet. Finally, inclusive investment. Whether I'm in Birmingham or Boston, everyone is wondering the same thing. Is there a place for me in the future economy? Will my children, will, be met, will they be met with opportunities or will they be met with obstacles? And for too many, our nation's middle class just seems out of reach. We keep averaging our prosperity. We hear how well this country is doing because our peaks are higher than ever, but our valleys sometimes feel even lower and you can't average out one's prosperity. A secure retirement has become a hope and a prayer. People are working fewer shifts, getting less overtime. Automation is no longer a distant threat. It is here on the factory floor now. I say this is an exciting time to live and an anxious time to live. I've combined those words into a new word called anxiety. You know that feeling like right before you give a speech or Wow, it's amazing, I can tuck my daughter into bed with FaceTime, but will that technology put us out of a job? New cures to diseases we never thought were curable, but at the same time, I can't make my, my health care payment. That anxiety is at qu making us question where we and our children and grandchildren belong in the 21st century. But we know that that path to success begins long before you submit a resume for your first job. It is a pre-K to 14 with our community colleges undertaking at every age, now, I'm not here to point out what has already been made clear by my friends who are running for president, that massive student debt, a college education that costs twice as much adjusted for inflation as when I went to college today, 
And the pursuit of happiness stops in its tracks when a recent graduate finds their dreams shackled to 25 years of monthly payments. But also after 65, uh, almost 65 years to the day after Brown versus Board of Education, we can't say that separate but equal is relegated to the ashes of history. If we are honest about our nation's education system, the reality is that eight out of every 10 students in my hometown's public schools live in poverty. Our public schools have become where we warehouse our trauma and our poverty. In New York, only seven black and Latino students were admitted to Stuyvesant this year in a class of 900. 91% of the students at LA Unified School District, and you can go to Boston to find similar, statist similar statistics, are Latino or African American. It's time to stop pretending that our current school system is the great equalizer. So let's stop paying lip service to the ideas that schools should be gateways to opportunity and actually do something about it. Because really what we are doing, what all of our work is for, what is all of our work for, excuse me, if young people can't even imagine a happy life, let alone pursue it. So let me tell you what's working in LA. We are training 2,500 new early childhood educators by 2025. Seeing cities like New York and others, like with, in California, who are expanding pre-K, that should be something universal across this country. We made history at the upper end of that pre-K through 14 by making community college free, the largest city in America. And listen to this, after just one and a half years, we boosted by 56% the number of kids going from our public school system into full-time community college. And we're fighting now to pass a measure called Measure EE in LA, which will help us lower class sizes, make sure that there's libraries that are reopened, a nurse there for more than one day a week in our schools because kids don't plan when they're gonna be injured or sick. When voters trust that government is invested in raising communities up and helping young people succeed, that's what, pos what is possible when government gets back into the business of boosting happiness. Just imagine how things might look if representatives in DC from uh, one party spent less time on cable news and more times on people's commutes, on housing, on schools, on environment, on the things the senator was talking about. My conversations are always about jobs, healthcare, housing, and education. Folks might start to believe that Washington cares about them again, and in turn might start to trust government again. And they might start seeing a future for themselves, not just in their communities or in their cities, but in the American story. That is why we are here today. I've learned so much in nearly two decades at the local level. I knock on doors on the weekends with strangers, not when I'm campaigning, in between elections. And the look of surprise on the face of an American who never thinks government will ever show up and say, how are we doing and what can we do for you, is everything this revolution demands. I've always heard in the Trump era and long before, that people are looking for something more than survival. They're looking for meaning. No matter where they live or how they vote, Americans will always do what it takes to better their communities. But when they are listened to, not just tolerated, when they feel that government is investing in them, in their happiness, not just exercising or overreaching their power, when they're given the opportunity to live with dignity and to find a sense of self-worth, the promise of America is within reach. Our guiding philosophy in Los Angeles and in cities nationwide should come from Aristotle's words that are etched in my city hall on the top floor, named after our greatest mayor, Tom Bradley. It's from Aristotle's politics, and it says that the city came into being to preserve life, but it exists for the good life. In other words, we formed government to be safe, but that's not the end goal. It's not life and liberty. It is the pursuit of happiness, to fall in love, to go to a concert that moves us, to have those connections with different cultures, to have ideas and thoughts that we never thought possible, and to make a life full of meaning. Let me close with a quote by Robert Browning in a poem that I recently read about the uh, artist Andrea del Sarto. One of the lines Robert Browning says that a man's reach must always exceed his grasp. Our reach should always exceed our grasp. In other words, think about the book of American history, the slave that reached out for her freedom, even though she died in shackles. The woman who said all people should be able to vote, including women, even though she never was able to fill out a ballot. The GI who fought for freedom but came back in a body bag. The farm worker who thought that her children shouldn't die from pesticides. Or folks who decided to reach out so they could marry their loved one but died before that Supreme Court decision came down. You see, we as Americans always reach beyond our grasp so that even if we can't hold it, our children or our children's children will. Because that's what the pursuit of happiness is about. 
And I want to close this conference out by letting you know that ideas are alive and well across America. But more than ideas, so is action. So spend five minutes watching cable TV or responding to Twitter, but then let's get to work. Let's see America being born in every good idea in a small town and a big city across America. Feel that hope in the investments that we are making. And let's do more than throw out the inhabitant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Let us help America be reborn with the progress that we here feel and the happiness that when we close our eyes, we imagine. And if we do that, our work will be done and our reach will have exceeded our grasp. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. I cannot think of a better ending to the 2019 CAP Ideas Conference. I want to thank Mayor Garcetti for his remarks and really his leadership in demonstrating that progress is happening all around us, despite what we hear from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and reminding us that we have to have a, a focus on making progress where we are. So uh, I really want to thank all of you for being here. I have one announcement. We, we do have a reception down the hall, and we welcome everyone to it. Uh, uh, this event is only possible because our, our friends, our thought partners, everyone here, but most importantly, for the fantastic staff of the Center for American Progress, all my colleagues. Uh, I want to thank particularly the entire CAP event staff, but three people in particular who made this day possible and definitely juggled with a lot of changes on the Hill today. Uh, Aaron Cohen, uh, my chief of staff, Marlene Vasilik, who runs our events program, and finally, Billy Flanagan uh, as well. So I want to thank all the CAP staff, but those three have really been struggling. And let's go have some drinks. See you. See you later.